All right, great. Today is Tuesday, November 29th, 2018. Welcome. It's the Picking County Board of County Commissioners work session. On today's agenda, we are starting with budget. So Connie, please introduce yourself for the public. Good morning. I'm Connie Baker, Picking County Budget Director, and this is the third uh, long budget meeting that we're having. Uh, we break our budget presentations up according to our strategic plan. And that way we can group the different departments and funds that relate to kind of a particular service area or particular goals of our strategic plan. <coughs> Uh, so today it's focused on prosperous economy. Uh, a few quick notes organizationally. In your budget binders, you will find the presentation uh, behind the 10th tab that says prosperous economy. There are also all of the budget profiles associated with the funds and departments today, and that's behind the third tab in the last section, pages 155 to 207. Special revenue funds and enterprise funds that we present today will have a decision point at the end of the presentation uh, to indicate your agreement to move forward with the budget as presented. General fund departments, however, will just show an expenditure comparison table, but no decision point. And then next week on December 4th, we'll bring back the general fund as a whole for a decision point. Uh, today's presentation does include a few extra decision points. One is on the 2019 holiday schedule. One is on a, a new addition to the budget, a reappropriation of a portion of savings from the construction of this building uh, that will be used for some different projects. We'll go into that in a slide. And then also on the Picking County Table of Organization, which shows the FTEs, uh, the full-time equivalent positions for the county by each department and includes all of the 2019 changes. So as always, we do start with the strategic plan, uh, letting this guide our direction. Uh, it shows what we would like to accomplish for the community, overall providing a high quality of life for citizens of the county. Uh, the prosperous economy section of the strategic plan contains four success factors, sustainable economy and employment, affordable and quality health care options, high performing county leaders, teams and employees, and responsible and accountable stewardship of county assets. Excuse me, Connie. Hmm? Uh, uh, can you turn on our... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to do that. <laughs> Don't have the slides to follow along. Sorry, it wasn't, wasn't catch on your either. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay. Uh, today we will touch base on all of these uh, four success factors as we go through our presentation. Departments that you will see during the presentation today include the clerk and recorder, elections, internal services, uh, community relations, information technology, finance, treasurer, facilities, human resources, county administration, board of county commissioners, assessor, county attorney, and then the risk fund, uh, some information on health care initiatives, our health insurance fund, the Picking County Table of Organization, and then and we'll end the presentation with the airport fund. This section of our 2019 proposed budget is a little over $48 million, and it is a third of the total county budget. As you can see from the pie chart, uh, well over half of that is for the airport, uh, with health insurance being the second largest section and then internal services after that. This table presents expenditure comparisons with 2017 actual expenditures, 2018 original budget, and then the proposed 2019 budget. Uh, some changes that I would like to just point out quickly here on this slide. Uh, towards the bottom of the general fund section, there's a line that says contras and budgeted savings. Uh, we used to budget our uh, cost allocation plan reimbursements as a negative expenditure, as a contra. 
Uh, but with 2019, we are moving to a better accounting practice, and we will be booking that as a revenue rather than a negative expenditure. So that makes a big difference in the total for the general fund. Uh, when in 2018 we had $3.3 million subtracted from our expenditures, and well over $3 million of that is no longer there, uh, it's the same effect on the overall budget, but it's showing up as a revenue. And so our expenditures have a big jump because of that change. Uh, in the BITS department and the facilities departments, uh, we have moved some projects that were previously budgeted in the capital fund and are now putting them into the general fund. Uh, we are following a more strict separation of putting only items that are actually capitalized and depreciated into our capital fund. And other maintenance projects, even large ones, have been moved over into operations. Uh, so that's part of the increase that you see there for bits and facilities. And then airport is the largest increase by far in the other funds uh, with an increase in operations as they're gearing up for a public process on uh, potential projects out at the airport. Can I ask a question? Um, and looking at the numbers for 2019 versus 18, um, thank you for the explanation of the bumps and especially the airport because it's significant. Um, what about the one in um, human resources from 880,000 to a million two six? Yeah, we'll get into that a little more during specific, the human okay. resources presentation. Um, we are adding one FTE in the human resources department. That's part of our proposal, but we're also shifting some costs. Okay. Uh, a number of county positions get allocated uh, not just to one single department, but to a few different areas. And uh, we're shifting around where some of those allocations are happening. And so that results in the HR budget increasing more than before. But part of that is also um, refunding our our EHOP down payment loan program, that's $100,000. Comes through that department. And then also a one-time $45,000 uh, succession planning uh, expense. So, so part is on the salary side and part is on these other projects. So we'll get into that deeper when we get, okay, yes, thank you. Any other questions before we get going? I think we Okay, so our first department is Kirk and Election. <laughs> Would you like to drive this? I have you drive. I've only got four. I'm going to put county to work. So I'm the Picking County Clerk and Recorder, Janice Voss Caudill, and what I'd like to uh, review with you today uh, regarding the budget is I want to touch base on our 2018 accomplishments and then go over the Clerk and Recorder budget as well as the election budget, what's happening in the departments, and then our goals for 2019 so the community knows what we're up to, what we've done and what we're up to. So the accomplishments in 2018, like all departments we moved, we have three different departments, um, customer service facing departments that we moved in from two different locations. We closed one day on Friday. It took us three full days to move, Friday, Saturday, and Monday, but we were up and running in our new location on Monday morning. So that was a great feat. The other thing we accomplished last year was we had a retreat. We closed our office half a day. Um, thank you to the community for their patience. And we talked about our staff's um, operating and management styles because we were pulling our staff together in one environment. And we talked through that and brainstormed on what that would like look like. So I, that helped us with the change and addressing the move as well. In the elections department, we implemented House Bill 1454, which was the primary election where all unaffiliated voters received both the Democrat and Republican ballot, which um, addressed all our processes, computer changes, et cetera. And in addition, I want to let you know that we had the um, highest outcome this last um, month's election. We superseded the last highest outcome by 20, almost 28%, which is huge. We had over 10,013 voters vote in this gubernatorial. Um, we had estimated the last highest was 7,865. We estimated maybe 8,000 based on trends. We prepared for 9,000. We had over 10. So um, our community did well, and I compliment all our judges for their help. 
In the motor vehicle department, um, we had a huge conversion on August um, 6th statewide. Shelly Popish, our, our manager, spent six weeks in Denver helping test the programming, and she learned, which helped us with our conversion, which ultimately helped with our customer service at the front desk. We spent two weeks in training during July, and again had the conversion in August, and we continued to work through um, reports and distribution and programming. And what we accomplished in the recording department this last year is Linda Gustafson, who has been working on a project over three years, has put together a strategic plan and workflow process to assure that we have one media format for all land use records from 1881 to present. So anyone can go online anywhere in the world and conduct research. So it'll take us another several years to complete that, but we have a strategic plan in place and we'll continue to work on that. So this year, what's going on this year, 2019, motor vehicle, what we've experienced since the recession, that motor vehicle revenues have incrementally increased each year. It's been steady. This, this year, we probably will bring in over $9 million worth of revenues through our department. In the recording department, we watch the recording fees and doc fees. It's interesting, over the last five years, they fluctuate between forty-five dollars and $50,000, but they remain constant. So that's our world of recording. Legislation affects our department because we're all about legislation, technology, and our staff, of course, serves the public. Um, what we're looking at is we routinely have between 75 and 95 bills that we address that affect the clerk's department each year during um, legislation season. One of the um, highlights, I don't know if I want to call it a highlight, well, one of the um, bills that we anticipate coming around this year again is privatization of D DMV titling and registration. Um, they're looking at, we are looking at a bill that would privatize registration, focusing on interstate commercial vehicles, basically fleets, and if that does go through this year, we probably will see that in the metro area. Um, the others in the recording department legislation, title industry wants to um, set predictable fees. Right now we charge $13 for the first page record at $5 thereafter. They want to set a set fee. It will affect different counties. Um, it will affect them negatively, some counties, other counties positive. So we'll take a look at that. For you at the county level, what we'll be bringing forward next month is House Bill 129 was passed in 17. What we would like to review with you and approve is for plats. Right now we record plats and retain them. That is the official record that the clerk retains within their office. Senate Bill 129 um, allows you to approve that the recorded image will be the official document. So therefore, like we do with land use records, we would receive the document, scan it, and return the document back. All right. So we'll bring that forward to you early next year. The other thing I'm looking at is um, securing a grant so we can I index um, images from 1950 to 1960, which are are on back post, so we can push them out, expedite that. And then have staff work from 50, 1950 backwards. Technology in our department, of course, we just had the conversion. This next year, what we'll be looking at is um, acclimating to the new system and working through programming upgrades with the drive system and motor vehicle. We just converted the recording system in 2017. We used this last year to um, Work through all the kinks, as every conversion has kinks, and um, I think we're on our way with technology. We upgraded the motor vehicle, we've upgraded the recording, and we're upgraded with elections, so we're in good shape. Staffing, I conducted a needs assessment along with the motor vehicle manager, and in 2016, our assessment showed that we were 1.5 FTE short in the motor vehicle department. Now, with the new drive system, we'll have better reporting, because better data in, is better data out, and we can do an assessment and do strategic planning as far as staffing. So I'll take a look at that in 2021 and 23 to look at where we're at again and do a needs assessment. As far as recording staff, um, we're staffed adequately and we plug away. Okay. Um, this is a visual of the recording department's motor vehicle clerk's office budget. We'll be, we're 
have a reduction of 5%, about $60,000 from last year. Uh, what's happening in our department is we're losing a quarter FTE, that's Linda, who was 0.75. But, we, but if approved, we are retaining a half FTE. And what that will provide for our community is three full-time motor vehicle staff on the front line for our community. We experience lines, um, and it will be um, a better, better operational for you because we'll have more cohesiveness in the department. Okay. The other thing is the reason why the budget's down in 2019 is we secured $50,000 from a dedicated fund of $10,000 to help us through last year's drives conversion. And the other thing that I'm asking for in 2019 is I will, as of today, I will be appointed the president of the Colorado County Clerks Association 2019. That may change in a couple of weeks where I may be the president in 2020. But what I'm asking for is additional funds with travel and training. Um, that comes with making presentations. That comes with addressing um, various organizations throughout the United States and representing the state. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, Thank are gonna, you. Are we going to celebrate this? I, I think we should celebrate when I'm done with it. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Thank you. When you've survived it. <laughs> we survived it. Yeah. I think John can concur. He's been president of the CCI. Okay. Um, in our elections 2019 budget, what's going on in elections is our revenues will decrease by 50% next year, and that's because we only have one election to coordinate it. The legislation we look at next year, the focus will probably be on a cleanup bill and we'll focus on primary. Now, that's because in 2020, we're going to have two primaries. Mm -hmm. We'll have three elections. Nationally, what's going on is we're looking at cybersecurity, voting equipment, audits after um, before and after the elections and paper ballots. We do have quite a few new legislators, in them, and we will be spending time at the Capitol reviewing elections um, for them, how we process them. I think um, Colorado should be proud, and Picking County community should be proud, because Colorado is the state the nation looks at for how elections are done. So we lead that, um, and we've worked hard the last 10 years to get there. So the presidential primary is separate from the Colorado <laughs> primary? Yeah. So the governor will appoint the date next September, and we will know it's, it'll be late February, early March, the presidential primary. The state will reimburse us for that. Wow. The Colorado primary will be the third um, Tuesday of June. In June. And then we'll have the presidential. So we'll have three elections wow. in 2000, 2020. Okay. It won't triple the budget. It'll double it. Um, a little more than double, but we will be reimbursed okay. for the presidential. As far as technology, we continue to be astute regarding um, security and surveillance. I think it's very important, um, especially to protect our judges. In addition, I would like you to note that we run nine different softwares to run elections. When I walked in the door, it was two. So it's very complicated. The laws are complicated, and um, we have a great community that helps us. As far as staffing, we're set. They're going through certification training. And this next year, we will be very busy. It's all about planning, planning, planning for 2020. So that's what, that's what next year is all about for elections. As far as budget, you'll see us um, get 50% down next year. It's because we don't have a primary. And to coordinate it, the, the outcomes, um, usually the lower turnout. We don't have two weeks of VSPCs. We have one week. So it's reduced judges. Um, but that, you know, but the turnout could change. We don't know what state issues or if there are state. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and we set a budget now, but we don't know what's going to happen until next August. <laughs> and again, just a reminder that the 2020 primaries is around the corner, and next year is all about planning for that. Okay. As far as our 2019 goals, what we will do is a retreat again. What I'd like <laughs> to do is um, celebrate our accomplishments and, our, and review what we um, our outcomes were in 2014, 15, and 18. Um, we'll review our department values and working agreements, and we'll continue to brainstorm how we can um, implement better processes in order to serve our customers better. Elections, again, we'll be reviewing statute rules, procedures, and process in preparation for 2020. Motor vehicle, what we'll do is use this next year to better train, work through the upgrades and drives, and do educational outreach with our new services. Okay, so that's all about um, getting acclimated to the new system this next year. 
In recording, I had mentioned we want to come back to you and see if you will approve um, Senate Bill 129 to make an image the official record for Platts. In addition to um, the grant I'm securing, which we'll try to secure um, for indexing. Um, my goal next year is to support our managers to be successful, and I will be the president of the CCCA. So that's what the clerk's world is all about next year. Good Do you job. have any questions? Any questions? No, that was great. Okay, you thank answered you. my questions. Okay. During your presentations. <laughs> Good job. Okay. So, um, I almost got away with it. <laughs> and during all the time at CCI meetings when we're talking about legislation, somebody is always saying the my county clerk says this and that and the other and the county clerks association is taking a certain position or supporting or opposing certain legislation and um, since you'll be in the position you are this year would be an ideal time for you and me to communicate on on bills that are important to the county clerks I appreciate either for supporting or opposing and then I could carry that message to CCI okay. thank at, you at our meetings thank you I look forward to it thank yeah. you great that wasn't a question that no. was just providing help thank you thank you thanks okay thank you Janice now we have internal services Good morning, board. Thank you for the opportunity to get in front of you. Rich Englehart, Chief Operations Officer. Um, we're going to take a little different approach this year in how we're presenting. We aren't going to look back to 18. Uh, we're going to just focus on what the 19 brings. Um, whenever we do our, our first update to you in 19, we'll take an opportunity then to update you on a lot of those accomplishments. So this really is focused on uh, the coming year here. Whoa. You don't want to hear the clerk and recorder again, do you? <laughs> All right, here's our organizational chart. Um, one of the, we have a couple of things to bring to your attention here is that uh, Pat Bingham is playing a much more um, embedded role within uh, internal services on a communication side, uh, both uh, for our, our organization and then externally how we communicate. And uh, so she's included in our presentation today and will follow me. And then you'll see right in the center, uh, Tom Oaken uh, is gonna be retiring. Yeah, this coming year so that'll be a change in 19 for us as well so uh, we have a retirement celebration coming up so whenever we do that presentation both Ann and Tom will will still present uh, together for that okay again we certainly focus on the strategic plan uh, and part of our uh, our core focus is prosperous economy we have the four success factors and you'll see as we go through this each of the departments will put up uh, their success factors. Not all of them have all four, some do, and so that's where their main focus is. And then each of us have purpose statements for our departments, and our internal service provides a wide range of support services for different operations of county government, with a focus on promoting best practices aligned with the county's value of stewardship, ethics, excellence, collaboration, open communication, and positive work environment. This came out of a retreat we had last year. Uh, we really were trying to define what we do and what our role is. So. Uh, we were able to come up with our overall purpose statement. So our emerging trends, what we found in 2018, we did a big rock tour. Uh, we went to all the departments and talked to them about where their challenges were, uh, where we could help in assisting. So we get a better handle on trying to provide a service. So some of the changes that are taking place in 19 are based on those conversations we had with the different departments. Uh, one that came out was a more robust risk management approach. And in 2019, we talked earlier in a budget presentation about uh, risk manager position, evaluating that opportunity and seeing if uh, we can save some through our worker comp claims, maybe through deductible payments, but we're gonna take a real uh, deep dive into seeing what we can do from our risk management and be more proactive instead of really just kind of claims processing. Uh, from that standpoint, we heard that from the organization. Um, standardizing templates uh, to try to help uh, with workflow. And uh, both the Enterprise Fund, which is the ERP, and the PATS are going to do some of that just inherently within those processes. Uh, but we've also done some stuff with uh, procurement and finance, have done a lot uh, 
with uh, the internet and doing some standardization with our templates uh, facilities, uh, continues to work on their work order processes from templates. HR now has developed an on and offboarding process uh, with a template checkoff there for those managers. And then BITS continues to work on records management. Another area uh, was improvement, uh, improving our policy and procedure manual. And internal services really is a clearinghouse for any policy changes that come through from an organizational request. Uh, but through uh, CARA's direction, Alex, our intern, uh, has now revised what our uh, policy and procedure uh, manual is going to look like. Uh, it's much more uh, user-friendly and uh, search capabilities. And we rolled that out yesterday with the E-team. We're looking at December 3rd from our standpoint of introducing that into the organization. So it'll be a much friendlier approach to trying to find our policies. Uh, and again, it's a reaction to what we heard within the organization. Uh, our organizational pace, uh, I think uh, after we got through this building, some of it has slowed down, but uh, from others, uh, it's still uh, at warp speed. So, but we have the ability to kind of manage that. And I like referring to John's uh, keeping your foot on the pedal or off the pedal kind of approach to this. And so internal services has to really uh, kind of manage that and how we work with our departments and make sure we just aren't putting too much out there and overloading people. So we, uh, we pay attention to the pace of the organization. Uh, we also heard that there were shortages of uh, resources uh, this past year, and I think uh, you all have supported the new staff uh, changes, increases this year, at least have been proposed thus far. Uh, those were ran through internal services, and we, we supported all of those increases um, because we saw the need out there. And then you'll hear a little bit about uh, our reorganization with HR um, and how we're going to be uh, better serving our departments. And one of those new positions is a, what's called a business partner, and Danette can talk a little bit about that. Uh, developing anticipatory managers. This is part of our uh, plan of succession planning, uh, looking for people that can anticipate uh, rather than just react. So uh, through training and growth opportunities and encouraging professional growth within the organization is an area that we'll, we'll focus on. Uh, employee housing, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, well, you already heard about our deed restricted program. Uh, Connie mentioned earlier that the EHOP phase two program is within Danette's um, budget. Um, Mary Kate uh, helps us oversee that with the contract with funding partners, which I believe there is changed now. They were bought out, but uh, the people stayed the same. So we're still uh, working <laughs> with them. Uh, and then more assistance uh, from internal services um, uh, with our overall housing initiatives. There's, there's a lot, uh, as you were aware, uh, happening out there from the housing side. And then internal communications, and I mentioned Pat earlier, uh, we'll continue to do our best to communicate internally um, with all the impacts of, that we have within the organization. So those were what we heard from the, uh, the organization itself, and that's what our budget is based on. But we have two decision points here. Uh, this first one uh, is just the leave program implementation. And these are, uh, this was all headed up through AIM. Um, through a subcommittee of AIM that was brought to you early on in the year. So our whole leave program has changed. We uh, have got the policy dialed in. That went to the E-team yesterday for uh, final review. So it's ready to implement based on your approval of the budget. But uh, we do have 10 county recognized holidays in 2019. Uh, historically, you've also approved the early closures uh, for uh, both Christmas and New Year's. Uh, results in 86 holiday hours per employee, and then the schedule is as follows. So with this, I think we just need a formal nod that these are the holidays that you recognize. Um, no real changes at all in this. We didn't throw in any new ones. <laughs> I didn't see my birthday on there. <laughs> that one we tried, but it got yeah, kicked out early. Yeah, I just couldn't fit yeah. it in there. The page was running out of space. Okay. It's on the next page. <laughs> <laughs> Does the board have any issues with the holidays? I think we've talked about it, and I think we're good. I think I'm seeing nods. Okay, good. Uh, the second one, uh, Connie hit on a little bit. Uh, we are really uh, proud to say that we ended up getting through this process on the construction of this building with some savings. Um, we were, I guess John told me early on, we need to be on time and uh, under or in budget, in budget. So I'm proud to say we were under budget. So what we're asking uh, for consideration, and this is a change because we are just now closing things out. Um, is requesting the opportunity to take 100000 of that and put it towards this administration building uh, in case we have some changes that need to take place here. We had asked the staff to consider kind of a six-month period, live with what you have right now, see what works and what doesn't. And so 
we've asked them to hold off and if there are some any improvements that need to take place we can do those this coming year so with some of this savings we'd like to allocate a hundred thousand towards that and, and for the board this is pretty typical when you have a, a new project and and a, you know against the total project cost is a pretty reasonable amount question Just, uh, it, I'm assuming something like this is anticipated anytime you build anything right you have your break-in period and you have some money in your original budget for this so was this a budget line item beforehand? Is there not a contingency fund or something? We, yeah, we had contingencies. Um, and so some of this is carryover right. or, or savings from that. We don't think we need to use all of those savings, obviously, uh, or contingency funds at, at this point. So um, this, this is what we think is reasonable just to have in to address those little things if a space isn't working quite like we had anticipated on design to do some realignments and that sort of thing. Upholstery colors. No. <laughs> that will not be fun. <laughs> John has to live with his star chairs now. Huh? Yeah, George. So, um, the, um, the balance of the contingency fund that, that perhaps is not being used, you say you're, you're transferring to the capital fund or the budget transfer. Um, <clears throat> does that... Do we use, utilize that at all to help offset our debt? No. Um, <clears throat> the, the COPs have a call. I'm really loud today. I don't know why. But uh, the COPs have a call provision uh, in them. And so, you know, we, we don't have the ability to pay off early until that call provision. I'm trying to remember. I don't see Tom or Ann, do you, I think it's usually 10 years out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, this wouldn't be enough to really take advantage of those call provisions anyway. Mm -hmm. And so um, our proposal is we have some additional facility needs, um, particularly in the uh, human services building as we're doing some realignments there. We'd like to repurpose funds um, from this project to that project so that we don't have to basically add more to the bottom line of the budget. So, and, and then didn't we also just, was it last year, year before, didn't we uh, allocate dollars for the human services building for some remodeling over there? It was, uh, yeah, mostly for the design and planning, I believe. Right. And so this would be to... I think you're remembering with the the addition of economic assistance. Oh, okay. Economic assistance we used to be outsourced to Eagle County, but when we brought that in, we did have to do a, a remodel to create the space for those new employees. Uh, so that was done, um, and then with the growth of public health, so there have been a lot of changes going on in that building. And so, for example, with the move of Alpine Legal Services to the building next door mm -hmm. that opens that space to address some of the the public health we see an opportunity to align the space so that health and human services has a, a, a better um, space and, and working relationship uh, together on the first floor of the building and so that's what we're proposing yeah, to fund I guess with this. My, my question is um, do we anticipate any further changes so we're not constantly having to do ongoing remodels over there to accommodate office moves and, and things like that? Do you want to well about? yeah I can I can speak to that. Um, I think we are going to continue to have changes, but the approach we're taking now is that we're taking out permanent walls and we're using these system furniture type um, setups so that if we do have expansion, we have flexibility within those. We did a study last year. Uh, Chamberlain uh, Associates came in and took a look at this, and they presented us a plan that would show that if we really start needing to expand, we have an idea now of what it would take to build on to that building itself if we had to. Otherwise, we're just uh, working with Nan and Karen, uh, how we fit people in and trying to do our best to keep our, uh, our renovations to a minimum. But we are growing with staff there, and, and the goal is um, it, not so much growing, it's just trying to get them all together in, in their work areas. And so we're kind of moving pieces around, and that constitutes a little bit of this reconstruction. So, but, so you're taking down some... Uh permanent walls yes. and utilizing sort of uh, systems systems and mm -hmm. i know we'll hear from it but they, they want to go in the opposite direction yeah now. so yeah so do we learn any lessons that perhaps you need to have some permanent walls or yeah uh we are and that's a that's a great question because what has come out of that is both nan and karen who've seen up here had these conversations now they were thinking about the open but now they've gone back to the more the system full walls but they are system walls 
um, which makes them a lot more uh, flexible in how we can move them around. But so we have learned lessons. Uh, some it works well. Others are now taking their advice and doing things a little bit different because they, they have a lot of need for privacy, um, as you can imagine there. So, but yeah, it's it's a great question. I think that's the luxury of this building now is having that opportunity to talk those through. And then just just for the board, um, the there's going to be further discussions coming about um, space needs, uh, particularly for the public health, human services, the, the nonprofits. We think, though, we need to be looking at opportunities and basalt also with the uh, facilities that, that we've purchased down there, uh, both the south side facility that – um, the board recently purchased uh, really for the purposes of translator. It has some additional office space that can be used for touchdown, meeting space, those sorts of things. Um, we'll also have some space opportunities coming up in the 123 Emma Road. And so we want to be sure we're taking a look at those and seeing um, which facilities provide the best balance of, as Rich is saying, economic efficiency, but also um, service delivery, you know, are there service delivery advantages. So we'll probably be coming back. So that's that's why we're, we're doing the comprehensive planning in HHS now to understand what the opportunities are there, George. But we're trying to take on the smallest increment of project to meet our immediate needs until we have that bigger discussion about all and those facilities. That, that reminds me, in terms of our uh, space that we're leasing out to uh, Mount Family, mm -hmm. uh, we lease the entire space out at this point? or Yes, um, the, the available space. So the space that the county was occupying um, while we were building this building, that space has been leased out. Um, so there are some leases that will be coming due. Uh, there may be some tenants that, you know, look to, to move on because they're – organizations are changing or growing and as those opportunities come up i think we need to look at the balance of do we go back out for a lease or is that an opportunity for us to look at filling a, a service need that may be better provided there? Oh, good thanks steve yeah i was wondering if the the fifty thousand for the new cameras for which i think are for this room are they included in this hundred thousand or no. are they in a separate, in a separate, separate, separate. budget yep. in fact pat will talk that that's in her her uh, capital fund under communications so, so this this hundred thousand is like money in reserve for yeah changes yeah. that we don't know necessarily yep. yet what yeah. the changes yeah. will be we may not, and they we may not, not touch it. I don't know. Maybe everybody's going to be happy and we can move yeah. forward. But it's just kind of a contingency there that we can address okay. those. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll touch some of it. I'm <laughs> is, sure we will. is there a possibility of any of this other money, the other 250, going towards the, the courthouse? Because we're going to have some expenses incurred there, and I'm not sure how we're yeah. funding that. Of this 400000 150000 of it will just go to capital fund balance. So we can and, always and draw so, from there yes. for the courthouse. That's okay. Great. I know we're looking at what, how we're going to fund that one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. I just, I just love to chime in that we don't have to look for ways to spend the money if we've done such a good job saving it. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that you know, we've got some ideas here already, but there are more. This isn't a complete list of ways we could, you know, spend this additional fund. So um, I'd just like to point out that if it goes back into the capital fund doesn't get spent. Mm -hmm. That's a plus. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do I see direction here on this to move forward? No, I'm seeing nods. We're good. Okay, thank you, board. All right. I'll ask Pat to come forward. Yeah. Hi, please give me your name for the public uh, record. Being a community relations administrator is who I am. And um, we are at the new approach is not to go over all the things that I've done in 2018, but I just can't resist to say that we had some <laughs> highly visible uh, public outreach campaigns, including the airport's 70th anniversary and the human services uh, look at the whole department. And um, they were a lot of fun. Um, I also went to a change management um, internal communications training recently um, because my, my role seems to be evolving into more internal communications, as Rich mentioned. So um, I rub shoulders with 
people that work for Kaiser Permanente that have 10,000 employees and they have to break news to them on a regular basis. I thought if they can do it, I can do it here. <laughs> um, but I did learn some things there. Um, but I'm really proud to say that um, if, while we're talking about saving money, um, rather than we could go to the next slide because yeah. we've gone over what the, what the um, you know, our, our usual stuff. But um, <laughs> I was able to uh, find money in my advertising budget that I've had a very generous budget for community outreach for many years um, and take some of the dollars that I haven't been spending from year to year because departments are, are better funded to do their own outreach and their own budget, so that money was, was in there. We were able to gather up that money and put it into the fund to, to fund the cameras that we really needed. When we did this new building, we only had, we had one camera breakdown from the library, so that left us with two or three that were borderline, and really with the new facility and the new equipment, we wanted to have the best equipment going forward that would be sturdy and last a long time. So we were able to take the money that was saved um, from my outreach budget and put it into this capital budget for cameras, which is, is answering that question. Um, you know, some of the emerging issues and trends are um, that I'm, I'm working with the PR firm that's been hired to do um, the uh, PR for the airport, just, just as a, a, a role of, of seeing what they're putting out there as it goes out, along with a huge committee of other people, but just to make sure that it feels like Pitkin County. And I think my role there is to say, yeah, that, that feels like us. That's how we talk. That's what we want to look like. And so that hasn't taken a tremendous amount of my time yet, but um, has been a really interesting project. Um, I'm sure I'll be doing a lot more work uh, raising awareness about our new public health department. Um, it took uh, Karen you know, a full year just to get her feet on the ground and get that department built and running, and now we want to let the public know that we have a public health department and some of the things that they do. So you'll be seeing a lot more uh, outreach uh, about public health. Um, I find myself uh, in a role of overseeing the TV operation here. It's something that I kind of created for myself. I don't know that anybody ever told me that was my job, but I just found that I, I, I was getting more and more involved. I have a TV in my office. I can't help, I don't watch TV all day, but, um, <laughs> but if something is wrong on the television, it sits behind my head, and if something is wrong, I hear about it, because people walk by and go, oh look, we're off the air, or, oh look, there's what's that doing on there? So I find myself very much high touch in, in the grassroots operation, the TV operation. Um, and that's in my budget, so I keep an eye on that. Um, I already talked about the cameras. Uh, we did uh, an audit of our Pitkin County website, and I'm hoping to implement some of the changes that, that we um, found would be necessary. We, we aren't in a position, and we haven't budgeted for a new county website yet. Um, our website, I think, is about five years old, and that seems not that old, but in the world of websites, it's ancient. So we probably, in future years, will be having to redo the website, and they make them so much easier to manage these days that, that that'll come down the road. But this year, we're going to just implement some things that'll make it a little bit better. Um, and then I spend a lot of time training and preparing for emergencies. Um, the Catherine, I mean, the uh, Lake Christine fire was, was a wake-up call, and we were so thankful that it wasn't in Picton County, but even though it was, you know, it was right on the border of Picton County, we were involved in thinking about, oh, what would we do if we had a power outage, things like that. So it, it really um, reignited um, the need for me to be on my toes as the uh, ESF 15 lead, which is the PIO, Public Information Officer. If something should happen in our county, I want to make sure that I've got a good team and am ready to rock and roll. So um, a lot of us, not just me, but the entire county, became way more alert about um, preparing for the possibility of an, of an incident. And uh, Oops, I, think, sorry. I think that's about Especially the power outage. How do we get you on mic if we yeah. don't have power? <laughs> <laughs> the power outages, that was crazy. It's all about communication. You think, well, if we don't have power, how are we going to communicate? If we don't have email, if we don't have a tel Well, you have uh, landlines, but nobody has landlines anymore. Yeah. So you start to really think about, well, <laughs> knock on doors, boots on the ground. Yep. Flyover. Somebody um, suggested that we fly over and drop leaflets. <laughs> I mean, really. I can just imagine. Then we were worried about the garbage and the impact on the environment. Um, okay. And I think Greg has a question, and then George. A couple uh, regarding your preparation training for the emergencies. Critically important. Communication critically important. 
And when I, whenever we talk to Valerie, it always comes back to preemptive work we can do to mitigate some of these risks. And at the recent news about uh, three, almost 2.9 million Coloradans live at risk of wildfire. Mm -hmm. You know, we're living in the WUI, the wild urban interface, and so much of Pitkin County has that issue. I think to push for fire mitigation here, uh, working with Valerie would be a probably very important public service that you're going to be a big part of, and I'm, I'm hoping that that's on your list. Uh, the other thing is, regarding the new HD cameras, are we talking about the ones that are already here, or are we talking about filling these? About these We're going to replace like all, of them. all of them. They're not HD. These aren't yeah. HD, yeah. Okay. Oh, we can't wait. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering. <laughs> I honestly have Make to ask. Up. I have to ask how necessary that is. I think the money could be better spent elsewhere. I'm I don't, I'm not convinced it's a good spend or a necessary spend, and I'm opened up to the conversation on it. But Well, you haven't even seen away, the budget for me. the makeup artists that would be required. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah the HD isn't necessarily, it, it isn't necessary, in my own opinion, for information like this. And it, and, and it wasn't just the fact that they were HD, it was the fact that we're down to, let's see, what have we got? Yeah, two. Four. Yeah, we, two. Yeah. Three. It, four in the room. We have right? three. Oh. They're not all hooked up. So we lost a camera in the move. Before the move, it was it failed. The one on we the had the one on the podium on the on the cart, and so we were down cameras in terms of camera angles. And again, you may that may sound like it's an unnecessary thing to have all the angles, but um, it it is it, our ability to to best portray the meetings. Um, we like to see who's in the audience. We like to see who's speaking. We like to home in on each and one of you when we can, when you're speaking. Um, we're just trying to do a quality job of, of being transparent in the meetings. And so we're thinking moving to four cameras from three. At right, uh, yeah, and, and these are on their last legs, we're told, from um, grassroots. We, we, so these bought, we didn't buy the fancy cameras when we did mm -hmm. the move to the library. We just got by, and as a result, one failed already, <coughs> and these are supposedly could fail. Um, so that's why we thought it was important to kind of get it set up, get it right, and let it... Uh, and just one correction, it's five cameras, not, oh, sorry. not four. And on the other side, on the HD, uh, Greg, there was an investment, about 25000 that was invested into grassroots who is going to HD um, just generally. Right. I and so for that. us to be able to be compatible with the, re the direction they're going... We just made them HD, but most cameras nowadays are HD. It wasn't most like an extra would, expense. These cameras are just can. expensive. Yeah. I mean, they really are. But it's all pre-wired. <laughs> all we got to do is plug and go. So, hopefully, it it is a uh, it is though, Greg. To your point, it, it's a discussion for the board. We could choose to replace, you know, the the cameras as they fail. Um, we had received some comments from the board in the past about the the quality um, of our picture versus some other jurisdictions and such and so um, this is up to you guys at, at the end of the day right. yeah. well thanks for telling informing me about it it's good to know I thought these were new so these no. these are the ones that came out of the library so yeah. this is old equipment already so it's it replacement is. rather than a necessary <laughs> increase of something okay I'd, I'd prefer to go with replace as necessary, but. Well, then we fail and have to scramble, so. Yeah. We'll have to see we how wouldn't be do. able to mix them, I don't think, the HD and the non Good question, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay, George? Yeah, thanks. So, Pat, you talked about um, other uh, departments who are doing some of their own um, outreach, and then you also talked about um, you using the airport as an example, making sure that the message that is coming out is it's sort of our goes along with our culture and our values. So, so my question is, so how do you assure and coordinate between the other departments who are doing their own messaging to ensure that we have a, that sort of consistent uh, type of message coming out from Pickens County? Well, I guess I, I would clarify that they have budgets to do their own outreach. Um, I see myself as working, still working closely with all the departments on their outreach. It just doesn't come out of my budget, okay. um, which is kind of how I've done things to date with most departments. There are a couple that are a little more independent, um, but I always um, try to see to it that the departments are, if, you know, are doing a, a brand or doing a message that, that Picton County is front row center 
and that you know I just mm -hmm. I can add that kind of input and I do work very closely usually they come to me mm -hmm. and we talk about plans and we come up with a plan and I have a, a high touch um, as there are some independent departments that are a little more uh, do their own thing but um, yeah, I, I just think that would be important that that um, all the communication sort of feeds through uh, you, Pat, to just to ensure that we're we're not sort of getting out uh, in left field with one department without having understanding how it may impact the entire organization. I couldn't that's agree great more. Comment. <clears throat> couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's a good point, George. Steve, are you good? Mm -hmm. Okay, Pat. Thank you. All right, Thank you very much. Uh, very much. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to slide over and let them drive because it's they're their slides and I'm not sure when they want to change them so I'm just going to slip over here John all right John come on up please introduce yourself for the public thank you very much I'm John Lloyd the information technology director it's a down arrow whenever you're ready to move forward <laughs> gotta get the microphones adjusted here and ready to go and we're having not exactly an abbreviated review session but a quick and succinct review session and we, we are part of the prosperous e economy core focus and our success factors are responsible and accountable stewardship of county assets the purpose statement of bids hasn't really changed over the, the the years but through the targeted use of information technology we help the rest of the county get their job done we also make the access to public records from a technology perspective entirely transparent they, they are uh, they're available 24 hours a day every day of the year emerging trends for 2019 is cybercrime absolutely expect more and cybersecurity responses on our part expect more it's a continuous never-ending battle and we're just lucky that we don't have a lot of money to steal or they would have gotten it already. So we have to be very, very careful dealing with the entire, the, the entire access to anything IT related. Anytime you go online, anytime you, you go to Google and do a search, it's dangerous. The issue being, of course, that there's, there's greater value that overrides the risk of loss. So we will, we will continue to fight that battle. Another thing we'll be doing is we will in increase our records management activity. There are overlapping laws at the state and federal level, and we have to reconcile those. And then the county modernization push is, is looking for enterprise applications to solve multiple departments' needs with one, with one tool, and we are still continuing and doing that. Did you want to go to the, the well, second I, I bullet? Was, I was going to say, Connie, or, did, 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 that, did we get the link put in? Yes. Okay. Um, what we didn't do we talk about unmanned? Yeah, he's going to go there now. Um, what we're going to do is show you an example of a relationship between Public Works and the Bits Department using uh, one of the uh, the aircraft that, that we have available to us. So. Okay. We think we're going to. This is a technology guy doing this I presentation. Know, like, you realize that? Like, <laughs> it just seems a little odd, got doesn't it? In there. <laughs> <laughs> John's okay. pretending he's not in the room. Why is this in Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> it's in, encoded. Just kidding. Yes. <laughs> but we'll pull this up. I, and I'm, I will say that uh, the uh, Public Works Department, I believe, has talked to this. If they hadn't, they didn't want to uh, pat their own back. But they received award, an award over this. Uh, this is a road project they did. Um, uh, what's the name of the? Thompson Creek. Thompson, Thompson Creek. Creek. That, uh, there we go. There we go. It's only three minutes. It's three minutes, yes. Yeah. Pitkin County Road and Bridge engineered a cost-effective plan for returning Thompson Creek Road back to gravel based on excessive maintenance and the winter cross-country ski and snowmobile usage. Can't hear it. The four-mile section of paved road leads to a recently closed coal mine and now serves less than 20 cars per day. Because the road is remote, deploying resources and hauling asphalt to the pothole repair is challenging. To cut trucking costs, we rented a reclaimer to mill the road and mix it with the existing road base. <laughs> we then sprayed the fluffed aggregate with mag chloride, slated, and that. finally rolled okay, it's, it's high as it can while be. keeping yeah. it open to traffic. It's all done with them. With the drone? Yeah. 
purpose of all this is to show how we can use technologies to help operating the farmers get things done. I the opinion that they would not have received the awards they hadn't done such a good job on there. So then is this on our website? On the website, and also, I believe, as it's been on, uh, on grassroots, also. Right? Yeah, good. The potential for this technology. For instance, Road Bridge, this is up by Spring Gulch, it's up by the Cross Country Center up above Carbondale, and to see it from the air and to see what improvements they're doing to the parking lot, that's the Spring Gulch parking lot right there. It has needed improvements for years. This is um, to be able to, to sh showcase a department like this and what they're doing and show the public what Road and Bridge is doing there out in the field is amazing. And when you think of what we could do with this as far as open space and trails, um, showing off some of our properties that we're conserving, um, it's limitless. I just get super excited. It's an inexpensive, as far as once we've uh, made the capital, but you know the the purchase, uh, we have people on staff that can operate these drones that are qualified and have the licenses to operate the drones, and we can use it for all kinds of things to tell the story of Pickens County. Crews reclaimed the pavement to a dust-controlled gravel road in just three weeks, a full week ahead of schedule. Feedback from the local cattlemen and ranch owners has been nothing but positive. It was a great way to team build and instill pride and ownership for staff in this remote county asset. Road dam. Road and Bridge looks forward to biannual dust abatement and regrading to maintain. I don't. Okay. Yeah, it's fighting with the video. Okay. So anyway, you can see what it would do for situational awareness uh, in, in the case of an event where possibly you have road damage or blockage or that sort of thing to help us plan a response. Yeah, does, does the um, Sheriff's Department have one of these to utilize for when you talk about accidents and roads to, to know if 82 is shut down or alternatives and things like that? Yes, they, they also have this capability and they have it for search and rescue also, mm -hmm. um, which is a, another good use. Stephen, then Greg. Uh, I'm intrigued by the possibility of using the unmanned aircraft systems for site visits because we're always having struggling to, you know, figure out when people can go to some location. And if we could just sit here and see something like this, we could probably see everything we need to have and have commentary from the community development staff on, on what we're seeing. and and I think it would be much more efficient use of our time and the staff's time. Yep. The only concern I have there is to, to be careful when you start flying them over neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I don't want the county to get a reputation of, yep. you know, Big Brother is spying from us from the air. Yeah. So if we were, for example, to fly it over Mountain Valley, um, it might raise some eyebrows and some causes of concern. So um, it's just down in California. Laguna Beach has signs posted now, no... Um, no drones over county or city parks or city hmm. technically open space. So, so they've had issues along the beaches where people are flying over. Right. You have to be really careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're also very annoying. Mm -hmm. Sounds like little lawnmowers running around in the sky. <laughs> Greg. Um, I was just thinking that you were going to show us uh, some GIS work that was done because I know you can do a very accurate surveying and assessment, you know, surface assessment, things like that. Because uh, this looked like really just to show that the work was being done, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering, were, was part of the design or the the planning for repair of the road done using the technology? Was it? So I, I I know people who have uh, in in the business of doing very accurate aerial mapping mm -hmm. and and surveying in, in advance, just so it helps speed up the process. So I was kind of thinking that's where this was going, but it's a little different to go that direction. But that's certainly something we can come back and do, give you a, a 15 to 20 minute overview of how we're integrating all the, all the current technologies with future technologies. At some point. We could roll that into that update. I'd, yeah. Whether we all want to hear it or not, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd sit there and listen. But. Well, during the, uh, you know, the Lake Christine fire, I think it would be a good example to bring back what the GIS role was in that. It was really mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, so we could, we could certainly do that for you. Right. You know, it's, it's nice to get that, that bird's eye view. Mm-hmm. Okay, 
And here's the, the, the standard budget numbers. And then the big changes, as, as Connie mentioned, is that moving, moving things from the capital fund to the BITS operating fund. That's why we have an increase in the amount of money. Leave it there. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I have a question. Yours is the only one of these pages I've seen with an arrow that goes, the budget's going up. Nobody else has the budget's going up with arrows up or down. I thought that just... I think they should. I think they're... Yeah, I was going to say it's a good idea. It jumps right out. Oh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In our presentation, that was... Yeah, I think, the other ones... I think that was one of Anne's suggestions uh, yeah. that we could... I figured the techno guys would know how to put the arrow on the page. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I have to teach everybody. Can you everybody teach had everybody the, else how yeah. to do that? <laughs> yeah. Everybody had the arrow going up or is a little nervous about the arrows. Yeah. Can imagine. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we need to see them going down, too. We don't yeah. mind the arrows going down. All right. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. All righty. I'm going to have Ann and Tom. Uh, is Tom... Yeah, he is. Tom's okay. here. We, we still have him on board. We still have him on board. Yeah, he's on the Not hook for still. long. <laughs> uh, Tom Oaken, county treasurer, retiring county <laughs> treasurer. How's that? Not yet. <laughs> A couple more days. And Andregas, finance director. This is their, uh, their org chart. And one of the changes that we did go ahead and make is showing for 2019 is that Sid would uh, slide underneath Ann, uh, and you'll see in this presentation that Ann is going to become uh, not only the finance director, but she takes on the treasurer and public trustee, a role I think that Tom played years ago, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I started as all three. Yeah. As so, finance director. Yeah. So things come full circle, apparently. So uh, we're back to that now. But we showed uh, Sid uh, would be underneath Ann, direct report. So with that, it's a down arrow. There you go. All right. Um, this is the, the finance piece of it. Um, this is no changes here. And in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just uh, flick through and talk about what our plans are for the next year. But um, oh, now you get to talk. Mm -hmm. Already? Uh, <laughs> it was quick. Same thing, no changes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so for 2019, um, these are our big um, areas that we're working on. Obviously, uh, merging the Treasurer, Public Trustee, and Finance Departments, <coughs> which um, Tom and I have been working uh, closely together over the last um, year or so, well, ever since I came on board, because we knew this was going to happen. So um, a big piece of that is um, a lot of Tom's uh, work was involved in the management of the investments, and um, which he is an expert in, and which I am not. And so we have uh, decided to hire a professional investment advisor, which I think we mentioned to you before. Um, that professional investment advisor is on board already, and we're working through um, revisions in our investment policy, which we'll be bringing forward to you um, December 18th. I think so. Uh, for your review, and then final approval, approval on January 8th, I believe. Um, so that's a, a big change for the, the treasurer function. And, and do you want to add will, anything? They will be here on the uh, 18th of December, so we can introduce yeah, so the new investment team to you. Correct. And they'll talk about their strategy for investments. Um, and there will be some changes to the investment policy um, to align with that, but all within state statute. And I believe that we will see an increase in investment um, interest income, um, in part because of the uh, environment. It lends itself to um, rising interest rates will enable us to earn more money from our investments. So, um, will they? They'll be. Um, this firm will be looking at the counties. Uh, finance for investments, but uh, will they also be helping out with the uh, individual employees, IRAs, when, when you have op opportunities to, to look at different uh, investments? Uh, no, that's actually another consulting firm that we have on for the retirement uh, plan investing. Um, that group is called InnoVest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they're available um, by phone, and they come up periodically mm -hmm. and, and okay. can meet with you individually as so well. Two different firms. Two different firms, yeah, okay. right. 
uh, retirement investing versus the county's investing is very short term cash management. Uh, you know, we don't invest uh, the county's daily operating funds in the stock market, for mm -hmm. instance. <laughs> but we do with retirement funds. Yeah, right. So. Right. Okay, thanks. yeah the maximum uh, term that you can invest the county funds in is five years per state statute. And obviously for retirement, it's mm -hmm. decades. So it's very different kind of investing. There was the question about whether we could use the same firm, but they don't even mm -hmm. sort of operate in the same world. So, um, And then another really big piece of what finance is currently working on and um, will be working on for the next two years, um, 2019 and 2020, is uh, the implementation of the ERP called the Operation Enterprise. Um, obviously, managing the changes related to that um, is a big piece of it. And uh, I think we're all very excited for the future. So um, all of the changes in the finance budget relate to um, the ERP implementation. So um, we brought this to you previously and you approved it, but we moved, uh, or we moved some of our budget from the capital fund to finance operations to um, supply um, or give resources within the finance department um, in terms of human uh, capital to help us um, as we go through the next couple of years. So um, that change is just um, moving funds from the capital to operations for finance. Uh, and then one small increase was um, in overtime. We recognize that in 2019, we may have uh, finance department employees that will be working overtime in order to um, meet the needs of the ERP implementation and continue to provide good customer service for all of our customers. So that's why we have a little up arrow. I know the next one has a down arrow. Right, <laughs> and they net out. <laughs> there you go, down uh, arrow. Yeah. Uh, First down arrow. For treasurer, that's because of uh, my retirement. Um, I've only been working three days a week, so you only get a 0.6 FTE reduction there, not a full one. Can we deny that retirement? Pardon me? Can we deny that retirement? <laughs> that retirement? Um, if you want that to be an up arrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just keep it even. Okay, questions? Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jody was unable to attend uh, today. She is out of town. So we've got Mike Flegel, uh, who is the operations manager, as you can see in this flow chart here. Uh, so, Mike, if you could introduce yourself and then take it away. Good morning, uh, Chair Clapper, Commissioners, County Manager Peacock. Um, I'm pleased to sit in for Jody, who sends her regards that uh, she wasn't able to attend today, but um, has trusted in me to go ahead and address our presentation to you. And with that, I'd like to move forward. As you can see, our facilities org chart. Um, we have, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have uh, operations, uh, custodial management, and also our uh, office manager, Wendy Elkin. Our core, fo core focus is, of course, prosperous economy. That's why we're here, responsible and accountable stewardship of county assets. And we've been working with our statements a little bit to kind of come come forward to the modern times a bit. And so this is a, a bit reworked since you've seen it last. And uh, so I'll read it. This is the, the, it says the facilities department is responsible for delivering property and project management to the county's assets from historic to emerging new assets. This is done through routine preventative and demand maintenance of its buildings, grounds, and sites. Collectively, this department plays key roles of leadership and support to provide a safe and environmental, or comfortable environment, excuse me. Uh, emerging trends and issues focus on employee and occupant wellness while monitoring all the workplace's comfort, standardization of office furniture and ordering processes. And um, we're looking at this new building that we're occupying now. It's, it, it's a it's a conglomerate of an old building plus a new addition. And so we're looking forward to having a year of operations 
to figure out what it's going to cost to maintain and, and run this building. And so that's why we put up put that up there at the administration and sheriff's office is kind of a wild card we have kind we have some guesstimates to what it's going to cost in the future but uh, we'd like to get some about a year of operational behind us before we can nail down the budget numbers in the future and also we we are bringing on the new office building down in in basalt the south side building you've heard about earlier and um you know, also just want to touch on the uh, basalt building that we all departed, uh, which is being converted to the Mountain Family Health Center. Uh, there will be additional maintenance costs associated with that facility, even though we've moved out. Uh, we still own the building. We still owe an obligation to our tenants there for heat, water, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be all factored in into the future. Um, we're looking at automating our building systems more and more in the future and hiring the appropriate personnel to oversee those automations and you'll you'll see in your uh, upcoming budget year uh, some requests to upgrade to uh, uh, more modern building automated systems it's not it's not in this budget request but it just give you a heads up um, again just trying to look forward to coming into the uh, 21st century on some of our technology and terminology here and i might add um the climate action plan uh that you all are uh, approving or taking a look at here um uh, it, facilities really is impacted by that i mean from a positive standpoint we have really started looking at what we can do to try to hit some of those marks within that so I know the board has talked about uh, how we take a look at that, and how we do our projects. So uh, that plan, just just know that we uh, refer to it, and any chance that we have to try to help with our utilities, that's why you see these modernization requests that are starting to come through of how we can best serve that plan as well. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate that um, clarification, but that that that's true. You know, we're trying to be as efficient as we can, you know, with county resources, with our heating and lighting and everything like, like that. To, to address the budget increase, and you do see the green arrow there, and it looks like a pretty substantial green arrow, um, what we're looking at, like I mentioned earlier, is bringing this new building and its occupancy online and just getting a better idea of how this is going to impact our, our utilities budget and maintenance budget in the future. Uh, so this kind of our test year. We built it a little high just uh, – just in case, you know, contingency. We do not know exactly what it's going to take to operate this facility. You'll see also a, a drop in cost associated with a full year of in-kind rent from the Mountain Family Health Center, which is um, is, is seen as a revenue. And uh, additional maintenance for the UPS, the uninterrupted power supplies for the jail in the north 40 these landed in facilities lap this year to that uh, as our responsibility to provide annual maintenance and and um, support on these and it was had not been budgeted for in the past that's where that number comes from and uh, security at health and human services has increased uh, the patrols have uh, uh, doubled out there and we split that cost with the aspen valley hospital campus but our share is a substantial increase. And this is just to cover, you know, um, outward intrusions and that sort of thing. We do have a, a secure building. This is just monitoring the parking lots and making sure that there's uh, not a lot of activities going on down there that shouldn't. And like other departments have stated before, uh, the biggest increase in our budget is the transfer of maintenance projects from the capital to the general fund, and you can see those listed there on the on the sheet for you. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. Steve, um, first of all, on the upper part, what does UPS stand for? Is that the name of the company? Uh, no, it's not a company. Or it's whatever it's, it is. it's a it's a machine, and many of you have them attached to your computers at home or in your workspace, and it's uninterruptible power supply. So we have huge ones here to, to keep the data centers running in case of uh, power outages. We have one here, and we have one up at the North 40 data center. 
So it's a, a battery backup. Exactly. So speak. Right. Thank I knew you. it wasn't United Parcel Service. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're bringing them on board, too. Yeah. Okay. You guys have to um, lay off the Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> so on the jail, the 175000 for the jail remodel planning and design, is that with reference to what Joey asked us for in terms of trying to develop a plan for separating the men's and women's section and adding a mental health section to the jail? Yes, that is. Yeah, you'd ask about that, and uh, I think John responded that we did have that built into the budget, so this is where it's located. If I'm not mistaken, I think it also covers uh, the sheriff's office wants a new um, secure vehicle evidence storage facility, and that's going to be built inside of the jail in, in the lower level garage right now. And it's just a matter of throwing up a few secure walls, but uh, I'm pretty sure that that's included in this as well. I think that piece that's of in it actually maybe capital. in the capital. Yeah, that's in the capital. Six hundred seventy-five thousand is in the general fund. Right, just okay. the planning uh, side. Okay, it's thanks for the clarification. It's a little more confusing because we were splitting things between the two funds. Right. But part of the part of the scope of that is not just design. It's really looking at the programming of the um, space. So Joe Joey had raised some options that he'd like looked at. We also need to look at what our uh, mandates are and, and legal requirements and what's happening with our jail population. So we don't know exactly what that space wants to, to be yet. So part of it is what makes most sense to program that space for for the next 20 years. And then after we've answered that question, look at what are our design options and, and what would they cost. It should be noted for the board, this does not – this does not include construction um, costs. This is really just the programming and then the architectural work to plan it. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, thank you for this. This is it's great. And I appreciate your mention of the Climate Action Plan. I, th I think it's important that everybody's thinking about that. Um, and it, it goes beyond just monitoring building operation and all that. But I think acquisition, uh, office furniture and ordering process, there, there could be elements you know, from that, that that could be affected by a climate action plan or just a focus as, as one of the decision elements. Um, and th that'll require more conversation. But mm -hmm. uh, it's something that kind of runs throughout everything we do, I think. And, and yes. sometimes it's hard to perceive that and even get a grip on it. Um, I, I always wonder, as we add more automation, all this technology, are we actually becoming more efficient or are we just becoming more embroiled and, you know, are we going to need more people to keep it all running? And I, I worry about, uh, you know, there's, we, when we always bring something on, we create something new, we're thinking it's going to be more efficient and be cost savings. But it would be great to know, is, does it, is it actually working? Maybe not always with the facilities, but in, in all departments, you know, if we're, we're creating this new digital system, is this going to make life easier or just more complicated? Mm -hmm. and, and good question for all of us. Didn't mean to ask it to you. <laughs> no, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, you know, we, we, we have similar concerns here in-house. Uh, this building here we're sitting in now is using a completely new style of heating system that we've not had before. And, you know, it has two big rooftop doas. That's a direct outside air system um, that provide air that moves the heat and cooling around in here but each one of these spaces has a unit or several that that actually transfers heat and cold and uh, it, it it's a complicated system but it's supposed to be way more efficient but we do hear your concerns and uh, we're good we're you know we're coming up to speed on the, on the operations of those it's, it's exciting it's and uh, yeah hoping hoping that it's it's getting us where we want really want to go where it looks like we're going to be monitoring it exactly uh, so that that's great thanks thank you okay. any other questions thank you thanks thank you Mike. thanks for filling in okay and then uh our last department within internal services is uh is hr so danette is here uh, with her flow chart good uh, morning <laughs> danette logan human resources director <clears throat> Or to my current staff, I'm, I'm not going to go over. Uh, I do the, have a question, though. Yes, ma'am. Can you define talent management? Because it sounds like we're like a movie studio. 
it's those it's HD cameras. Yeah, yeah. See, we're, like, we're really getting there. that hair and makeup? <laughs> yeah. Talent management is a relatively new job title for human resources as the field continues to evolve, Patty. It really is a comprehensive job title that uh, encompasses employee onboarding, the talent acquisition, talent management during the employment life cycle, and then ultimately talent offboarding, and that's through secession initiatives and things like that. So it's a, it's a comprehensive job title that covers m many important sub-disciplines in human resources to ensure that we attract and retain our key talent. Okay. Yeah. And this is the... This is with the new um, secession planning person will be assisting this position. Is that correct? We're we doing a contract. We're going out yeah, for I'll be special. talking about okay. that okay. with I just you. Just to make sure that we were yep. fitting it into this yep. graph. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, our core focus and success factors haven't changed over the years, so this should be familiar to you. I do want to point out, though, that our purpose statement, there's such a key sentence in that statement that's near and dear to our staff's heart, and that is uh, developing and delivering programs, policies, and plans that add value and unleash the possibilities of our people. So that is our overarching commitment, that employees love their lives at work and they find this place to be a, a place that their contributions are acknowledged. 2019 emerging issues and trends. Patty, you mentioned secession planning. <laughs> so we will uh, introduce secession planning initiatives. This is something that uh, the organization absolutely needs to look at with reference to its bench strength, future bench strength, as our workforce continues to age, okay, and replacement strategies for key leadership uh, and other key positions within the organization. We did add 45000 to our budget in 2019 to address this initiative. We'll be outsourcing uh, the planning stages of this program to the Majorana Group. They are a uh, organization in Tucson, Arizona, I believe, in Arizona, uh, that specializes in public sector secession planning initiatives. Okay. Closely tied to secession, almost a complement, is the opportunity to look at early retirement incentive programs. That's always an option that's tied to succession initiatives, so we'll be looking at that opportunity too in 2019. Another complement to the overarching process of succession planning is management and leadership development because as you introduce, first identify and then introduce your high potential replacement candidates for key positions, you're going to want to identify any skill gaps that those individuals may need to close as a result of being identified as a potential replacement candidate. Okay, so training is important. Um, and mentioned Operation Enterprise. This will be a big initiative for HR also in 2019 with re respect to replacement of the Ascentis Human Resource Information System. So we'll be doing a full implementation again with a, the new ERP. And then finally, restructuring uh, our department to deliver generalized dedicated support. I'll talk about that more in just a minute, but that's the introduction of a uh, business partner. So, can I ask you a question, Danette? As you said, the, the uh, succession planning and early retirement incentive program, is, it's kind of like two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my question is, um, I understand s sort of the goal for early retirement, at least one of the goals, is you want to uh, uh, reduce your, your overhead compensation costs when someone reaches a, a peak mm -hmm. in their salary and then to bring someone in uh, at a lower salary. but maybe that's not correct or not but but as a follow-up my other question is um, knowing that how hard it is to recruit here in the county because of the high cost of living and housing and things like that uh, are we sort of working against ourselves in, in a way the, the, the latter question is a great question but I'm going to address the first part of your question first George the overarching intent of a secession plan is for an organization to look at its bench strength. If we were to have a, I'll just use the word mass exodus, for example, of key talent in this organization, we have to have a um, bench, bench, bench strength prepared to move into those roles 
quickly so there's no disruption in county services. So that is the primary intent of secession initiatives. Okay. Um, and the latter part of your question was? Well, um, I understand it's the, uh, the uh, succession planning, the early retirement incentive, uh, because again, uh, we're, we're, we've got some people hopefully that have institutional knowledge and expertise, um, and then we have to try to recruit and replace them, uh, which is always a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the goal would be to um, not necessarily recruit and replace them. Secession planning looks at internal talent, and it's an opportunity for promotions for our employees to develop our talent. There may be some positions that are identified that may not have a high potential replacement candidate, but I, I'm not anticipating that that's going to be great. So we'll be developing internal talent to meet the, these roles. And, and George, early retirement, maybe earlier, is the uh, better oh, better here, thing yeah. to, to use because uh, a lot of times, um, <clears throat> even though somebody may be at a point in their life where they're ready to make that transition and they've trained their replacement, they may not be um, in, in a position to make that transition, and it's, it's better for the individual and better for the organization if we can help bridge that gap, particularly if, if we have somebody. So I think it's more along those lines about how do we make those transitions more predictable? How do we make them work better for our long-term employees? And how do we make them work better um, for, uh, for our organization? And right now, sometimes um, that we don't have any tools available to us that we've brought to you guys um, or budgeted for that that would help us make those transitions more predictable and and work for everyone in that case make it a win-win so i don't think we're looking this is not a situation we're not trying to build a program um, like some organizations have to where they're trying to push folks um, out of an organization. Right. What we're trying to do is build a program that creates a triple win and, and makes it better for the organization, better for our long-term employees, and better for our folks expecting um, some some succession planning. Because yeah. you see, so you see that you see doing. that more in the private yeah. sector where you've <clears> got correct. early uh, retirement incentives, again, to, uh, to uh, compensate for the high salaries and be able to exactly. uh, save some dollars in, the, in that. Sport. And that's not really what we're talking <laughs> yeah. about here, although that will probably play in and into how it's financed in the in the long run for whatever we do. What we're trying to do is have some tools and options available so that we can make these transitions work well for, for everyone. So we may need to rename that because I, I think we're trying to <coughs> yeah, accomplish great. something different yeah, okay, great. Than, Thanks. than that. Yeah. Thank you. Steve, please. Um, trying to think of an example with Tom Oaken retiring. He sort of semi-retired mm -hmm. um, as part of the process, but he didn't completely retire. And so that was sort of part of the transition in his case. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's kind of what more along the line of what you're talking about here. And and we've done that with, with other departments. Uh, you may recall in the clerk's office, we moved a longtime employee into a contract position to have overlap and training and to have a you know, a, a glide path um, to, to, you know, benefit the organization and benefit the individual. This may be something like that. It may be something else. I think we have not taken a comprehensive look at those tools and options to um, create a portfolio of, of options for our employees and the organization. I think it's important to do now because the demographics of our workforce have, have shifted and we're gonna ha we're gonna be faced with more of these transitions coming up and we want to make them work for everyone as best as possible you know it's interesting on the public sector side you see this a lot in the public safety side of things with officers or firemen um, you know they they're aging through and, and the demands on those so some of this is uh, also having some conversations with the sheriff and and kind of their how they're looking at their future as well okay, okay. we can keep going okay 
All right, well, I got a, a green arrow myself in the uh, human resources budget. Uh, I did mention earlier that we're introducing an HR business partner. We're also seeing an in increase in bus passes. I do have a breakdown for you if you're interested because I was a little shocked by that, but it's great news because our employees are using our regional transportation system. Uh, the increase is... Uh, because of we decreased the number of stored value passes so these used to be the old punch passes if you remember those we have less employees asking for them but we have more employees asking for zone passes which is a cost savings to this organization but they are a little more expensive so through an auditing practice we just simply acknowledge that to promote the zone passes is far better for usage than the stored value passes so those went down and our zone passes went up and employee utilization is up we're also uh, in reintroducing an increase in organizational training. We decreased this in 2018 budget by uh, 15,000. We're reintroducing that uh, amount into the 19 budget, and that's intended to help um, offset the training and development plans tied to succession initiatives. You want to speak to EHOP? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, the EHOP 2 program is our loan program. and. Uh, the deed restricted falls into the housing side, uh, housing budget, and then HR uh, actually manages this through Mary Kate's office, and we talked about that earlier, that, that relationship, so uh, we're replenishing that fund. Uh, Connie, just to inform me, we have another employee uh, that's coming forward, um, so this is really starting to yeah, get popular. Next week, you'll be seeing a supplemental request for 2018 for the EHOP, and yeah. then... Uh, this hundred thousand is for twenty nineteen, right. and that's the hundred thousand is included with the hundred with the forty five thousand under one time projects, which that was a little confusing to me that's because correct. they seem so different than a one time right. project yeah. to do the housing. But that's where you put it in the budget. Where does the increase for the fifteen thousand in organizational training fit in under in services, services and, supplies. and supplies? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Steve. Um, for the employee bus passes increase is. Is that due to us having to pay RAFTA more per bus pass, or is it because there are more employees riding the bus, so yes. we had to have an increase? There are more. There are more employees riding the bus, so we saw an increase of 172 zone passes to 210 in the new budget year. And they went from the punch passes to the zone, so there, that's mm -hmm. part of the increase. And, and I suspect a lot of that has to do also with the our move. move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we were in Basalt, um, we were probably closer to a lot more, about 60% of our workforce still pass. is. Yeah, so I, I think we're going to see increased utilization um, by being located back in Aspen. So, so again, my question is, and I'm sorry that I just can't understand this, I, the terminology business partner, mm -hmm. this is an employee, correct? Why are we calling them a business? It sounds like we're contracting out. Mm. It does. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like what? what is this really? I, I'd be happy to speak that, to that, Patty. So, again, this is an evolution in the HR profession. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, an HR business partner – may have been referred to as a generalist. A HR generalist is one who has command of all of the sub-disciplines involved in an HR function, compensation, benefits, recruiting, retention, et cetera, everything. They're resident experts. As the prof profession has evolved, HR um, has fought long and hard for the proverbial f uh, seat at the table. How that translates into action is that they are they are now becoming are embedded in the organization as strategic partners. So we elected, and the new job title, like talent management, in the function is business partner. And what that's doing is it's taking the HR generalist role, that kind of uh, the someone that can do everything in HR at a very high level and bringing in that strategic perspective. So these HR business partners acting in a generalist capacity will be engaging in their respective business units, the divisions, public works, airport, et cetera, as strategic partners. They're going to be embedded in that business. They're going to understand that business's budget expenditures, revenue generation. They're going to understand um, the uh, 
long-term five-year plans of these departments, any evolving headcount <coughs> needs, de uh, needs higher, lower, and restructures that may be needed. So they'll be embedded, again, not just as a generalist, but as a strategic partner with their respective business units and keeping a pulse on those uh, units as it relates to not only human resource management practices, but the management of that business. So, wait, wait, so should that position be funded out not just through human resources, but through the other departments like we do with fleet or anything else? We, yeah. we, do, uh, we do actually charge out to all county funds through our cost allocation. Plan. Right. So that would be part of paying for this new FTE. All right. Here, here we, we actually have some, a combined uh, methodology for charging out. 60% uh, of the position will be directly charged to the airport, right. whereas the remaining 40% and then all of the human resources department, as well as finance and bits and facilities, um, they are all charged out through the cost allocation plan with one year in arrears. So uh, when we conclude our 2018 right. books, we'll uh, work through the cost allocation process determining what part of HR would go to each and every department and fund in the county. Right. That covers the point four and the point six is in the airport budget. But where's the other one? We have another one FTE in yeah, there. And, and that has to do with realigning resources between the human resources department and the risk fund. And uh, I, I probably didn't reflect that very well on this chart. Uh, but uh, we are, sh I should have just put it as, as a five. But uh, we are shifting, uh, as Danette is shifting the responsibilities of her staff, we are shifting what percentage is going to the risk right. fund. So bottom line in laypersons, how many bodies are we talking? One. Are we talking one. just one, not 1.2, one. 4, 6, or 8? One. Just one. one. Okay. The, the way I did the chart is a little <clears throat> misleading. So and this one is split out between general departments and the airport. That's correct. correct. Got it. And then, you know, just, just to build on that, when, when I came in, we realigned a little bit of HR to have specialties within the HR department. So like risk management, um, benefits and pay, which we're actually keeping specialized, mm -hmm. you know, and, and talent acquisition and, and what have you. And what we've heard from departments is that they need – generalist basically to come back in and that's the the business partner that really understands their business and can act as a liaison on various hr issues and so we're we're going back a little bit we're keeping specialization in a few areas and then reintroducing this generalist function and so what that did was it changed how the ftes were spread between right the so if closing yeah. my eyes and walking through your office we've got Danette, we've got one, two, three, four. We already so there's five people plus in it makes six, but there's only four here for FTEs. We, we count one as being in the health insurance fund. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that so brings us general. down to five, and then one in the risk fund. So it, it's a shift okay. in yeah. <laughs> in where the. So now is. that you've totally confused me, <laughs> we can move forward. But it's one person. It's one FTE. One new net one, to one the new person. So. Then right. the total, but we've got one who's in insurance over here and one who's in risk over here and a body in a chair over and here. And if it makes you feel any better, it took us a couple meetings to, I to feel so sort much this better. out, too. <laughs> George, please. So, so, Danette, based on our earlier conversation about succession planning, so we had a generalist. That would have been perhaps you in the past, or we did not have a generalist. In the past? Who's been our generalist in your department? Have we had a generalist? But currently. Yeah, we all have operated as generalists in some capacity. What these generalist business partners will afford the organization and the business units they're tied to is that employees will have a direct line of sight in those day-to-day -day HR disciplines rather than having, to John's point, go to a, 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 a compensation and benefits administrator to ask a simple uh, benefit question they can I go never have those questions <laughs> yeah. they can they'll have a, a clear line of sight to a generalist that will be able to answer and address all of the day-to-day -day operational type of situations and allow those 
uh, specialty mm -hmm. subdisciplines to focus on these higher level projects uh, that we've been working on. So we're bringing in someone new from outside the organization? Yes. Correct. I guess that's my question, coming back to that early discussion about succession planning and moving people up mm -hmm. through early retirement or... Mm -hmm. In this uh, in this case, it would it would be a recruitment, yeah, George. Okay. And so can we see a restructuring chart like we saw? You know, we've always been involved in them, say at the airport. I know there was a mm -hmm. timing issue here, but and I know there's some things the board of commissioners does not have purview mm -hmm. over some personnel mm -hmm. issues and that. But we've always seen the restructuring of departments, and we never got the opportunity to see how yeah. this department is being restructured. But we see restructuring coming through mm -hmm. this information mm -hmm. before us today. Yeah. So I think that would be helpful for it. us to understand what's going on. Sure. In the department, that would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so uh, wellness. Now that we all completed our 10,000 points, <laughs> I did. Good for you. You did? Good for you. I think you're <laughs> <laughs> short, actually. <laughs> All right, so uh, we kicked off a, a new health and well-being program year in October. Um, it, the program was aligned very carefully with the strategic direction of the health care plan transitioning from two to one, to the high from the OAP to the high deductible plan. So the result of, of these efforts, final migration into that plan, uh, we introduced a premium reduction opportunity to our employees, uh, what you were just talking about. Um, in order if they participated in our well-being program. So in 2018-19 plan year, we saw 62% uh, completion of county insured employees completing the health and well-being program initiatives and 51% of our uh, insured spouses completing that program. So we think those numbers are pretty fabulous compared to industry standards. 57 employee new hires were grandfathered into the wellness rate and a total of 234 employees qualified to enroll in the premium reduction in 2019. So that's great <coughs> news. We did, for those that did elect not to participate, this is a voluntary program. Uh, they did recognize a $2.50 increase in their premiums in 2019. Joanna did an excellent job with this $2 program. $2.50 increase in the premium? $52.50. It, yeah. It's associated with what I'll talk about in a minute. That's okay. the uh, five percent that was. Um, okay, because I'm seeing, I don't see a. That's see fifty dollars. Looks like fifty. It, it, oh. it went from <laughs> like it went from fifty dollars in oh. 2018. It'll be fifty two fifty in okay. 2019. And any explanation of the 38 percent that chose not to or did not for whatever reason complete the health and wellness program? Do we I have think any? that is a personal matter because it is a voluntary program. Um, we've not heard uh, through employee feedback or just engagement conversations that we may have with our employees any real um, line of sight as to reasoning. We do look at that as a personal option and voluntary right, option. I understand that, but I think it'd be worth, since this is a program that mm -hmm. with John's help we've been encouraging to survey to find out what the issues are so maybe we can fix some of those problems yeah, and have so better participation. A, that, so from that perspective, Patty, it's a great question because in 2019, very early, early Q1, we're going to be conducting our second employee engagement survey and that question will be asked. 2019? Yeah, yeah I want, I'd like to see that because if there's something, if there's issues that we can address, we should be addressing them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because the Plus. bottom line is we want our employees and my, to And my well. guess is what we're going to see is um, we required, like, spouses and such to participate, and I, I think that's probably where we saw some I mean, like trying off. to get your husband to go to the dentist? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I just wanted to point out I, I sent our Board of Health an article that I saw recently on incentivizing and uh, there's something called the nudge, which is a new term. And I'm, I just forwarded you the doc. Okay. The, it is, it's a news article about how you create an incentive program where you reward uh, you, you reward a certain behavior. Like mm -hmm. you know, with this group, they did it with Apple watches. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you fall off the program, you fall out of that, you end up having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's it's kind of almost like a oh, penalty. Of you know, so you know what the reward is, and you know what the just, just a different <laughs> psychology, and and they're studying that as a as an incentive program. Oh, good, I'll read and that. It might just be fun to see. So I'm I'm sending that along to okay, you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, moving on to the risk fund. The risk fund includes workers' compensation and also casualty and property insurance. Uh, as mentioned before, a portion of human resources salaries are charged to the risk fund. 
And uh, one of the bigger increases in 2019 is about $67,000 casualty and property insurance premium increase for this New building, building as it is a much larger facility. Uh, you will also see the claims budgets uh, in the next chart and those are based on actuarial amounts. You can go to the next slide. So this is a, the first time that we've presented the, t the budget and five-year plan for the risk fund to the board. Yes, I've never seen this as a new one. That's right, mm -hmm. and, and health insurance, the same thing. Uh, we have been realigning how we are tracking our different funds. Uh, some of these uh, at, in the past were wrapped up into the general fund. Um, so we are setting out the risk fund and treating it just like any other fund now. Uh, so you see the budget, the main revenue are the service charges to county departments. So each different county department and fund pays a piece of this, both through charges for workers' compensation and for casualty and property insurance. And that's about $1.3 million. Uh, as we were uh, developing this fund, there were some changes that happened after we had already set the allocation amounts. Uh, some of the wages actually shifted out of the risk fund, but in budgeting I elected to go ahead and keep the original placeholder for salaries in the risk fund. Uh, so instead of seeing a decrease, you're actually seeing an increase. Um, I did not want to reset budgets that were already given to each county fund and department. Uh, and we wanted to also keep a little room available in this fund for a potential look in the future at a risk manager. That was one of our pending FTE requests for 2019. Uh, so it does not have the full salary built in, but I just did not eliminate um, where I, I could have. So I, I held on to some of the budget. So that would not be spent unless you approved a future right. FTA. Right. That's correct. At some time it's in just the a pla it's just mm -hmm. a placeholder right, right now. Um, you'll see that uh, premiums are about six hundred thousand dollars, about three hundred thousand for workers comp claims and a little over a hundred thousand budgeted for casualty and property claims. Any questions on the risk fund? Seeing none do we have non self approval to move this forward? Yeah. Okay. We're good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are um, a little behind. Mm -hmm. I think we can catch it back Thank up you here. So good job. I've heard that Thanks. before. I know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, Health care. We really have uh, two things to talk about here. One, the, the main portion, as Connie said, um, our health insurance has moved into a separate fund. Uh, we think this will make the um, financial impacts and changes uh, that, that we make with health insurance more transparent to the board and, and the community. Um, and, and we also have our efforts in the community, uh, for example, through, through the VHA. Um, nationally, some things that we're keeping track of, the individual mandate will be eliminated in January of 2019. We believe that that's more likely to drive costs up in communities than to drive costs down. We think uh, charity care will increase again and um, our providers will need to increase their charges to, to cover it. Um, we continue to see medical and prescription inflation at about three times the rate of the consumer price index, uh, and that's just nationally what's happening, um, and that is certainly reflected in what we're seeing in our, our own plans, as I'll talk about in a second. Top drivers, there's a little graph to the right, and I just wanted to highlight um, top drivers of these increased health costs, specialty pharmacy, high cost claimants, and that's where some of the focus of the Valley Health Alliance is gonna to shift to uh, this year, and specific uh, disease conditions. This is what's really pushing costs. This is what's pushing um, on one side the, the higher utilization of medical services, and then on the other side, the inflation particularly through specialty uh, pharmacy and such. Statewide, uh, what we saw in the exchanges what the, was that the preliminary average filed for 2019 was a 5.94% increase. 
We have not received county level data, but I suspect what we're going to see is that there were very small increases on the front range where most of the population and most of the policies exist. Um, and what we'll see in our mountain districts and the western slope is much higher percentages. And that's reflected in our experience as an organization um, that our own underwriting and claims underwriting experience, our fixed cost of renewal increased by 15%. I'm going to go ahead and flip that, Connie. Uh, what is built into the budget, um, and, and this was reflected in earlier meetings, but the county's port, what's proposed in the budget is the county's portion goes up 12%. Um, the employee's portion, um, where they have dependent coverage, or as we saw, those who didn't participate in the um, wellness and well-being programs, those would go up 5%. So the employee's portion goes up 5%. We also made a few changes um, to the, the benefits plan. Uh, we eliminated uh, county paid accident and critical illness benefit. Um, basically what we looked at this year is where were our employees getting value and where were we hearing demand for more service? We had absolutely zero utilization of the critical illness benefit uh, over the past couple years. Uh, additionally, on the accident insurance, we've made that a buy-up option for employees, but we found that we were actually paying more in in premiums than employees were drawing out in benefits, so we figured that's a low value. What we did hear from employees is that they were really struggling particularly when they needed behavioral health services, that our network uh, didn't match our EAP providers, for example. And so they may start with EAP, and then when they got to the end of their free visits, they would um, have be faced with either switching providers because our insurance wouldn't cover it um, or um, paying that out of pocket. And so we took the savings from like the critical incident or the accident insurance and critical illness insurance. And we put that into uh, expanding our behavioral health coverage so that we cover whether the provider is in network or out of network. So our employees don't have to make those uncomfortable choices. And obviously that's a relationship piece uh, once you've found a provider. Uh, similarly, we've increased the number of free EAP visits for our employees because that's where we've heard employees uh, really really have a need. And so we made some of those uh, changes. Probably the biggest change that we made is we've gone from having two plan options to one plan option. Um, we did we, we had a higher cost open access plan option. Actually, on an actuarial basis, it showed as a lower value plan. Um, it paid out less overall, but it paid for different things. Um, we, we did eliminate that. We have one high deductible plan, um, and you know that will come with HSA contributions to help fund first dollar uh, care and, and cover deductibles. We also, by the way, did make slight adjustments to our deductibles to lower the maximum out of pockets um, for those deductibles to the lowest level we could and still have a high deductible uh, health plan. Um, so that's what we did internally. We are staying with uh, the same third party administrator and we, we tried to make as, as few changes as possible. Um, we are continuing uh, to have support for the Valley Health Alliance. That is the uh, five large self-insured employers who have come together to try and have some uh, common efforts around controlling health care costs. Um, initially, those efforts were around coordinating our well-being and wellness programs. Uh, each organization has really built capacity and, and are working together. The VHA is now shifting its focus. And going back to that uh, chart on the last slide that say, you know, it's, it's really that critical illness. It's those high cost folks that tend to drive 80 to 90% of your overall health care costs. Um, what's been shown to work is to have case managers or care managers that are 
have a, a trusted relationship and follow up to make sure that folks are following through in those situations with the treatment plans that their doctors have provided, that they're navigating what can be a really complicated medical system um, successfully and to the lowest cost uh, um, routes that, that work. Um, but what we found is in our valley, our practices, particularly our pri- what's been shown to work is to have that kind of navigation built into your primary care practices. But our primary care practices aren't large enough to each provide that on their own. And so the VHA this year shifted its focus to working with our primary care providers in the valley um, to provide a common infrastructure for care managers. Um, So we're hoping to be able to stand that up in 2019, as well as common data so that um, the primary care physicians, when somebody goes to a specialist and such, is getting data back on who is high risk and potentially high cost so that they can get into those structures. So more to come on that. George? So so I'm just curious because when we first, um, the the concept of the Valley Health Alliance was to capitalize on on, uh, utilizing data from all the different organizations Mm -hmm. to help lower those costs. And so it's we got away from we didn't get away from it, but no, no, it's a reemphasis on it. In fact, that's uh, yeah, we're we're continuing to work on it. The real um, magic is when you can bring medical records data and claims data together, and because of privacy laws, there's typically been a wall between those. What we've been able to do through the VHA is combine our claims data. So we've been doing work on that, and we've done some joint contracting together, which has actually saved us money, um, uh, quite a bit of money, for, say, pharmaceutical benefits. We're, we're doing that with the hospital and with the city of Aspen and the county uh, bidding out together. So on the data side, what's happening now is we are uh, working with the Western Healthcare Alliance to bring the, the data on the medical side together with our claims data so that we can do real risk stratification that identifies patients, not to us as employers. We'll never see that information, but what, what their doctors will be able to see is what's happening on our cost side as well as what's happening with the medical records. And they, the population then will be stratified based on risk, health risk and cost risk. That will go to the primary care doctor. So let's say you fell into that high-risk category, George. That would go to your provider to say, hey, red flag, we need to probably spend a little bit more time with George um, helping manage whatever is driving that risk. And that's where the care coordinators come in to help employees navigate or their families navigate the medical system um, as well as uh, navigate the cost-conscious choices. Yeah. And so the Valley, uh, this may be another conversation sure. at some point, but the Valley Health Alliance, that's been in, in place for about five, six years yeah. or so. And, and I thought that it's and there's still just the uh, the same five organizations that are all self insured. No, I'll uh, switch. And I thought sort of a long range goal was to be able to allow some of the smaller businesses uh, in in the valley to be able to participate and yeah. be able to help lower their costs as well. And, and we think that like with the care management and such, that will be a benefit. Um, throughout uh, once we get that in place. And there has been a few changes. Um, Valley View Hospitals recently joined, which has really helped us create a network for for the whole valley. Uh, Mountain Family Health has also joined. I guess we're six organizations And didn't the school step out? The school has stepped out. um, But we also have primary care practices at the table now, which we didn't have before. So I, I think it'd be good maybe to get Chris McDowell, the executive director, yeah. in, in next year to come in and do a workshop with you while. guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we are um, at 11.59. Okay. Uh, so I'd we like need to, to move through this yeah, five-year plan. Let's get this one done, and then we and can And then we can take uh, a few of the other slides that we were going to do before lunch and move them to after the airport presentation. I, I think we may have some extra time. Okay. That we, we'll be able to That's do that. That's what I was just going to ask you. Okay. Uh, so a health insurance budget and five-year plan. Again, first time that you were seeing a five-year plan for the health insurance fund. 
Um, in the revenue part, uh, $7.1 million are service charges and employee contributions. So this is what is charged out through payroll to each and every department and fund in the county, plus what employees contribute through their paychecks to their uh, dependent health coverage. Uh, there's also $1 million showing as a revenue for stop-loss reimbursement. Since we are self-funded with our health insurance, we buy stop-loss insurance uh, so that any individual claim that is over $125,000 in a year above and beyond the $125,000 gets covered through stop-loss. Uh, the stop-loss, we do pay out the claims, but then we get reimbursed, so we need to show that as both a revenue and an expenditure. Uh, so if you look down a little further down under expenditures, medical and dental claims are showing as $5.8 million. That includes $1 million for that stop-loss piece. So the actual claims budget is $4.8 million. The $1 million is that net stop-loss. And uh, premiums, about $2.1 million. Uh, of course, being self-insured, our claims can have large swings. Uh, we can have good years where we're spending a lot less and building up fund balance and other years where we're drawing down. So this five-year plan is really just an estimate or a guess at where we might be. And we do have a healthy fund balance for this fund. Any questions? Seeing none, do we have nods to move this because this is a decision point? I'm going to say that we got nods. Okay. And if the board is okay, I would like to, after lunch, start with the assessor as planned okay. and move through assessor, attorney, and the airport. And then after the airport presentation, we can go back for the county admin budget, BOCC, and then the FTEs Got and it. place that at the end just for time's sake. Perfect. Okay. Is that good with the board? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. You. So anything Come. else? We can wrap for lunch and be back at 1 o'clock. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Grassroots. We'll see you in an hour.
is today is Thursday. It's hard to not say Tuesday. Thursday, November the 29th, 2018. This is a Board of County Commissioners work session. And we are on our afternoon agenda and we are talking budget. So please introduce yourselves for the public record. Uh, I'm Larry Fite, the Chief Appraiser for the Assessor's Office, and with me is uh, Deb Bamesberger, who is the uh, Assessor-Elect, uh, who will take office in uh, January of 2019. Okay, we're ready to roll. Okay. Um, ours is uh, pretty short and sweet. Uh, we are mostly a, uh, a staff that has uh, the, the primary uh, extent of our budget is uh, salary, so we don't have a whole lot of uh, moving parts. Uh, but a couple of uh, highlights uh, to hit. Uh, as far as 2018 highlights, uh, 2018 was a non-reappraisal year. Um, so uh, there were no value changes. Uh, protests were, by and large, uh, you know, pretty low, uh, and there were minimal changes to the overall uh, tax base. Uh, my guess is the mill levy uh, is going to be uh, fairly well uh, uh, stable as far as the mill levy uh, from the prior year. Uh, we did, however, uh, kick off the next reappraisal. Uh, the valuation date for the next reappraisal cycle is June 30th of 2018, uh, with new values uh, being mailed out in May of uh, 2019. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect of uh, 2018 in the assessor's uh, office was uh, we had the first uh, contested election uh, in the assessor's office in uh, 28 years. Uh, so uh, Deb represents uh, the changing of the guard. Uh, Tom Isaac uh, uh, is, uh, uh, I think he's ready to retire. So I think. Uh, uh, well, can I comment real quickly? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, one of the commissioners at CCI in the last couple of days told me in their county, and I think it was Jefferson County, I can't remember, one of the Front Range counties, elected an assessor who has zero experience on property evaluation assessment. Um, they didn't even know what a mill was. Wow. wow. And they got elected to be the assessor. So wow. I think that we are really fortunate to have the uh, assessor elect that we got with all the experience she has. Well, and the other thing that I have to say over the last uh, 28 years that we've been fortunate for is just the stability, uh, you know, that we've had uh, uh, not having, uh, uh, you know, I look at uh, Eagle County, for example, and it seems like in the same time that I've been here, uh, you know, they've had four different assessors. Uh, and so uh, the fact that, you know, that we've had the stability that we've had, uh, you know, has been, uh, has, has been a big thing. Uh, and hopefully you will have that sort of stability uh, going forward as well. Um, the last note that I have for 2018 is, uh, uh, fortunately, we are uh, going into the reappraisal. Uh, we are, uh, we have all hands on deck, uh, and uh, as as of today, uh, the appraisal is moving along, and uh, you know I think we're we're pretty much where we need to be. Um, Deb uh, is basically inheriting this budget uh, since she was just elected. She didn't have a whole lot of uh, input as far as uh, the, the nuts and bolts. And so uh, we didn't make any uh, major uh, changes uh, since 2019 as a reappraisal year. I think we bumped up uh, some of our expenses for mailing. Uh, I think we added uh, an expense for potential uh, overtime in the worst case scenario that uh, we have a really strong uh, protest period. Uh, but for the most part, uh, as I said earlier, uh, our budget is primarily uh, salaries, and so we're at the, kind of at the mercy of uh, you know what happens uh, you know, with the overall uh, county salary. Um, talked about uh, new values going out in uh, 2019. Uh, an interesting thing that we're seeing with the valuations this year uh, is that uh, uh, values are going up, I think, for the county as a whole, uh, but they're not absolutely uh, uniform uh, as far as uh, the, the rates that they're going in, in different parts of the county. I think the strength of the real estate market is still at the Aspen end of the valley. Uh, there are pockets outside of Aspen uh, where we're actually seeing weakness. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Starwood uh, used to be the place to be, and, and uh, for whatever reason, it's just far enough away. Uh, the homes are just old enough uh, that, uh, that that market uh, has struggled over the last uh, you know, couple of years. Uh, so 
the increases that we're seeing are not uniform, but I would say that uh, that overall we're, we're due to see uh, an increase. Uh, the one thing that we'll have to keep an eye on is uh, as part of the revaluation cycle, you guys are probably all familiar with uh, the Gallagher Amendment that changes the residential assessment rate. Uh, that maintains a level of value, uh, of assessed value, between all residential and non-residential uh, properties throughout the state at a 45%, 55% uh, level. What's happened over the years is uh, as growth in the front range has, has really exploded, uh, the residential side of the equation has grown exponentially relative to the non-residential side, and so they have to adjust that assessment rate to a lower and lower point. Uh, they're, they're projecting, uh, I've heard numbers, uh, we're, we're currently at 7.2 with the residential assessment rate uh, now, and I believe the, the estimates that I've heard is that that may get adjusted down as low as 6.1%. That's about a 15% drop uh, in the residential assessment rate. So where it gets a little bit sticky is if you have a, uh, for example, if you have a, uh, a taxing district that is primarily uh, residential properties uh, and their value doesn't increase by that 15% drop in the assessment rate, they could be looking at a decrease in their actual tax base. And so we don't know what that final number is going to be, but it's going to be something, uh, something to keep an eye on uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean, that's why we saw so many uh, Gallagher uh, ballots on uh, this year, whether the fire district or the or CMC, uh, specifically for that, for, for those concerns. Right, right. To uh, because I think what happened in, in uh, the last valuation cycle is some of those smaller districts uh, didn't see an, a large enough increase in their tax base uh, to offset the decrease in the assessment rate, and so they ended up, uh, you know, with a budget uh, shortfall. Uh, yeah. The other question I'll ask you, and you know, you can come back to us at some point, is when you talked about you're seeing some. Uh, <coughs> Uh, valuations drop in, in, in certain areas like Starwood. Um, you know, we're looking at, uh, through ComDev, looking at uh, the issue of, of home sizes. And, and I, I would be curious to know if you're seeing uh, values drop in homes over 12,000 square feet. Uh, well, in the areas where 12,000 square foot homes are primarily located, I would say fall into that in and around Aspen location. Uh, and I would say home values on Red Mountain are, uh, are, are leading the charge. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that, that I have not seen any appreciable decrease in, in values of homes uh, in excess of 12,000. Because I've heard anecdotally that um, through realtors that large homes are not really selling because, you know, when they were originally built, the idea was they were going to be utilized by families who would come together during the holidays. And so it's an opportunity to gather. Now, the way everyone is sort of scattered around the country and, and doing their own things, that there's not a, a demand for these large homes any longer because the families are are not able to gather at certain times together. So I just, I'm just curious. And I would say that it's more locational uh, than the actual size of the homes. Another example would be uh, Wildcat Ranch, uh, you know, where they, it was improved with, uh, you know, uh, big, houses. big homes. They were approved, uh, I think they were approved with uh, uh, 15,000 square feet by right. Uh, and so those homes were built, in, and I think that's an example where, uh, again, whether it's uh, the size of the homes or, or proximity distance from town, um, Wildcat is another area uh, that has uh, that has struggled over the last uh, you know four or five years. Yeah. Uh, so, so is that home size or is that uh, you know location? It's it's a little hard to say. What we're hearing at, at Acra at the Acra meetings, there's a really astute real estate guy who's there, and he always gives us the latest you know numbers and what's going what's going where. He said this the the core focus for real estate purchases right now is in the downtown core. People want to be downtown in those big penthouses, big. Or, or expensive sh penthouses. short drive as opposed to, yeah. I mean, the idea They don't that, want the large yeah, properties the for maintenance that issues drive with the large houses. Is too that 10 minute yeah, to yeah, your 15,000 square foot house on 10 acres. A lot of people don't want to have to maintain that 10 acres either, right. so. Yeah. That's yeah. part of it. So there's uh, so there's some yeah. of that. Um, so so that that I think speaks to uh, future valuations. And one the, the one point that I would make too is uh, so much of our market is dependent upon 
what happens nationally, uh, just because so much of the money that, that comes into our valley uh, is is from sources uh, that uh, such as the stock market. And, and so kind of how the national economy goes, I think, will be a bellwether uh, as far as, uh, you know, how the local economy goes. All right. Um, we haven't had a recession in uh, in seven or eight years at this point, uh, and everybody's, uh, you know, kind of looking over their shoulder uh, right as to when, it. It, uh, when that may be coming, but... Uh, no signs of it, uh, you know, just yet. Um, talked about the additional expenses related to the uh, reappraisal year. Uh, the, the, the second to the last bullet point there is, is just speaking to uh, the fact that uh, our office, uh, like a lot of uh, in those in the county, are getting... Uh, 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 More senior? <laughs> senior or uh, you know, a little long in the tooth or I'm not sure how you'd want to uh, describe it but uh, I, I think it's something to keep an eye on uh, from the standpoint uh, that that there may be we're getting to the point that people are that people are going to be uh, leaving uh, and it's a good news bad news thing uh, Steve Miller in our office uh, retired uh, last year uh, and so on the good news side uh, you know we're replacing a, a senior level appraiser salary with an entry level right. uh, salary but the bad news is all of Steve's experience walked right out the door uh, you know with him and yeah. I think uh, you know they're they're kind of offsetting uh, uh, factors there uh, in terms of the climate action plan uh, didn't have a whole lot to add in that regard uh, other than to say that um, you know, we do our best. Uh, we have to do a lot of field work as far as inspecting new construction and sales. Uh, and we do our best uh, to minimize those trips so that uh, we can get as many properties uh, as we can. Uh, and we, you know, don't uh, uh, try to use uh, the resources, uh, you know, that we have frivolously uh, in a way that, uh, that would waste, uh, you know, those resources. Okay. Uh, and I would say that is about what we've got. Yeah, George, so please. does the assessor's office, do you guys have uh, departmental vehicles just for the assessors? We do. We do, yeah. And for the most part, uh, you know, one vehicle is sufficient. Uh, during new construction season, uh, when we're all out, you know, looking at new construction at the same time, we'll util utilize a, a, a secondary pool vehicle, uh, you know, as necessary. But uh, for the most part, uh, you know, the one vehicle that we have is, is sufficient. So the other question I have is uh, for Deb uh, as it relates to the budget because uh, I, you noted that you'll be going to do some additional coursework and trainings. So will that be covered in this budget? Will you have to come back for a supplemental? At this point, I would... <laughs> they may have enough in their budget to, to cover it, but we can track it as the year goes on. Yeah. And if it seems like we may be going over and there aren't any other savings to cover it, we can come back for a second. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. That was short and sweet. We appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next, we have the county attorney's office. Would you please give your name for the public record, sir? My name is John Ely, and I am the Pickin County Attorney. And uh, none of us are long in the tooth up in, uh, <laughs> in our office, not at all. All those young faces in your office. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the increases that you see are in keeping with basic percent, uh, minimal percentage increase that follows the county general budget. Um, we have... Uh, we have made many cuts that the, the county has seen the last few years. Uh, I'd say the office is pretty much exactly where I wanted it uh, at about four years ago. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of external spending and internalized operations. Um, you never know what might come up on the horizon that will rock the, uh, the little ship of, uh, of the office, so to speak. But um, I think we're at a point where we are nimble enough to accommodate anything that might come at the county. Um, if there are no questions. Does anybody have any questions? That's all I have to say. No, I'm just curious, uh, the cost centers are up quite a bit. Is that because of the new building? No, it's because of our new method of accounting. Yeah, you know, if you look at the dollar amounts, it's not a very large dollar amount, even though the percentage mm, okay. is, is larger. And um, that just has to do with their share, mainly of uh, insurance allocation. 
No, oh, okay. All right. Well, that was really short and sweet. <laughs> so if no more, if no further questions. But I'm sure that if something came up, say you have con contracted services at fifty thousand. So if something came up, like with Thompson Divide or some some new snag came our way, we could something come back comes in. up. We are covered to deal with it. If it's uh, if it's uh, incredibly unusual or, or unexpected, then we may have to deal with it. Um, not only in a in a real sense, but from a, a budget appropriation sense, right. but not anticipating anything like that for 2019. Okay, perfect. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thanks. No problems. <laughs> but we can do whatever we want, right, John? I think so. <laughs> okay, next we have the airport presentation. <clears throat> Hi, please introduce yourselves for the public. Chris Padilla, the airport uh, controller. Good afternoon, I wasn't sure if it was morning. Good afternoon, John Kinney, airport director at, uh, at the airport. I don't think our presentation will be as long as the attorney's office, <laughs> but uh, we do have quite a bit to cover. <laughs> no, it's the airport. A lot yeah. of exciting things happening. Some, we just moved some slides. Uh, yeah, they got the more for us. We just moved them. There we go. <coughs> we prepared. We're taking off. Okay, well, we want to talk to you about, uh, about five or six things today, specifically outlined here in terms of accomplishments in 2018, along with initiatives and challenges that we'll be facing in 2019. Uh, there's also a climate action plan discussion. I'd like to share some things with you and then get into some of the budget overviews as well as the staffing and really what the bottom line is, including our CIP. So having said that, uh, 2018 accomplishments. Uh, first is the FONSI, the finding of no significant impact on the uh, ASC, the three-letter three -letter identifier for the airport <clears throat> on its, excuse me, environmental assessment. And that began back in 2015, when it, throughout 2016, throughout 2017, and most of 2018. So a very, very comprehensive, very actively engaged community process that we uh, have gone through. And so that has uh, come to its conclusion. Uh, we then, uh, our next step is we went into a program manager uh, RFQ and selection. And that's a pretty cumbersome, very federally uh, scripted process. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's based on qualifications and not necessarily finances. So uh, we uh, went through that. We chose a group by the name of Kimberly Horn, which is a national fully disciplined planning and engineering uh, company. They also uh, have a specialization of program management which they will be doing to help us kind of manage all the different moving pieces if we move forward with this program. Uh, another RFQ that we put out on the street was the financial consultants and Recondo and Associates was the selected vendor. They're also a national uh, planning firm, but also uh, financially is really their, their specialty. So they're gonna be taking a look at our rates and fees and kind of where we are in the industry and what opportunities we have to, to uh, modernize our rate and fees, and then just check the affordability of the, of the project in its entirety. Uh, we also signed in 2018 in terms of accomplishments a $6.6 .6 million grant. Thank you to the Board of County Commissioners. That took place back in September. And then the uh, state matched it with a $150,000 grant. So that's for uh, design, and we'll get a little bit more into that if you so choose to uh, move ahead with, with this project. But the dollars are in place, at least for phase one. 
community outreach was very, very robust throughout the environmental assessment and has now started with the visioning process, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. We also did the triannual uh, disaster drill uh, for the FAA that's required every three years, and so that gives us an opportunity to train and collaborate with our emergency management partners, and so we did from Carbondale Basalt to the Wildcat Canyon to Aspen as well as the Aspen uh, Ambulance. So it gives everybody an opportunity to kind of work out uh, any potential issues and especially with turnover in those different divisions and agencies, it's great to get together at least on every three-year basis and have a, a exercise with things moving. In terms of 2019, you know, you're, you're going to see some similar thing, themes in here that you did back in 2018. And the reason is some of these are pretty doggone big initiatives, and they're also ongoing. Because several of these, when you get into safety and security, are also commensurate to the complexity of your operation. So as more flights or more passengers or more direction from the TSA comes down, it requires you to continue to um, fund and, and grow these programs. So you will see uh, operational growth issues. You can see we had 15% employment growth during that period of time in 2018. Uh, which uh, makes some challenges for a constrained facility. You can see what the national average was. We definitely ex exceeded that. Uh, aging infrastructure is also another issue for us. Uh, facility maintenance, which really comes down to cost of our existing terminal and uh, facilities, as well as the passenger experience. It really kind of comes down to the comfort and how we are in sync or out of sync with the brand of the community. And then pending airport developments. Um, We'll get into that in a little bit, but it really is the preamble to the to the visioning process that that uh, we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, also, following up on the 2019, uh, what are some of our initiatives and challenges? Will be the community engagement, specifically the visioning process. Those applications are out right now until December 7th. We're always encouraging the community to participate as much as they would like into those three different committees, and we're getting some great responses. We'll be bringing back that list to you uh, for those three different working groups and one um, committee. Uh, at the uh, beginning of uh, January, end of December time frame. Also, some of the things we'll be working on in 2019 are the request for professional services. Some of this will be post-visioning process, but some of it could also take place before the visioning process concludes because we just do have the operational need of maintaining the airport out there, and these contracts have, for the most part, expired. So uh, in total, we have a runway design team that will need to be uh, let for RFQ, on-call planning and environmental consultants, as well as on-call engineering consultants, uh, regardless of to what extent we move forward with this project, we will need those two that are in the middle. And then uh, terminal design team is if we move ahead with that particular project. Uh, also in 2019, FA and state grants, you'll have more grants coming our way. Uh, the first one was for program management, public involvement, as well as financial planning, uh, the initial design of, uh, of the runway. Uh, grants for construction will also continue for just maintaining the facility. Our air carrier ramp is in pretty rough shape. So we've been in a little bit of a tug of war of do we spend the two, two and a half million dollars to rehab that or is the new terminal building coming in time? So we've been in that dialogue since about 2014 and 15 and it looks like we're going to have to spend some significant monies on that ramp uh, next year that we'll talk a little bit more about when we dig into the budget for next year. <clears throat> Safety and security, always synonymous with an airport. Uh, so it's always looking at our preparedness and our ability to respond and recover. Uh, we'll have initiatives on that as well as our safety programs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Security is also going to uh, not be a uh, project or <coughs> chapter that comes to conclusion in 2019. In fact, there are some pretty new stiff requirements coming out that we're going to be uh, really changing how you see vehicles approach and uh, for passenger drop-off and pickup in front of the airport terminal building. The FAA is requiring us to, excuse me, the TSA is requiring us to change that up quite a bit. So instead of uh, the immediate loading and unloading of passengers uh, in the uh, white curb area, uh, that is really what's coming to Aspen as opposed to back your vehicle in and go into the terminal, disappear and leave the vehicle there for an extended period of time. So that is uh, pretty clear that the uh, TSA wants us to get in line with the rest of airports. So you'll be hearing more about that in the very near future. And uh, 
closing up on the initiatives and challenges for 2019. Uh, really looking at our business strategies, huge, huge capital investment programs if we proceed with this in the coming years, <coughs> really uh, coming upon us to take a look at are we uh, charging the right amount of fees, are we charging fees where we need to. So uh, you'll be seeing us come back to you this year in 2019 on parking, on TNCs, which is the transportation networks, uh, which is the Ubers and the Lyfts. Uh, we have... Uh, framework in place that everybody's treated the same in terms of ground transportation but there's going to be more opportunities there as well as rental cars fuel flowage fees but we're going to roll this up into a holistic rate and fee analysis and bring that back to you so it's just not a piecemeal how does this fit into the greater context of what we're doing at the airport in terms of rates and fees Climate action plan initiatives. Uh, the terminal is really a dominant source for opportunity for us. So as we get into the terminal design phase, that's going to be a great opportunity for us. We definitely are tracking it over last year, had an increase in electricity as well as gas uh, on the terminal building. The air side LED going to that type of lighting system will uh, significantly reduce our electrical costs, but also uh, get us in, in more of a line of a mitigating measure for the climate action plan. And then we have about 10 additional items in there that would also include uh, electrical APUs on those APUs, auxiliary power units. They're basically little generators in the back of aircraft before they start the main engines, but to get the aircraft prepped and either cooled down or heated and all the calibration of the instrumentation inside the cockpit. So that's been a real issue for the folks across the street in the North 40. So those are some of the things that we can uh, uh, mitigate, as well as going to, instead of fossil fuel ground uh, support vehicles, uh, go to electric. So there's a variety of things that we're pretty excited about that we can start rolling into this whole terminal project that can really uh, make, a, uh, I think, a measurable difference in our greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to turn it over to Chris for the pretty <coughs> pictures and the uh, uh, dissection of these particular categories, and you can see the trends of where we're going, and, and um, Chris. All right, so what I've made for you here is a pie chart uh, kind of showing you the, our operating expenses breakdown. Uh, you can see that our largest expense is personnel. Our next largest would be uh, uh, internal services and county cost centers, or cost just cost centers. Um, and then followed up closely by the terminal expenses. On the operating budget side, the increases from those pie charts from last year are a $662,000 increase in personnel. And then there's a $500,000 increase for the air service study. And the cost center increase was $480,000. That's internal services and cost centers uh, together. And then on the capital, so those are the big three. Uh, on the capital budget side, you can see that our biggest hitter is the runway project design. Uh, and then we have a ramp and runway repair uh, because of aging infrastructure that was mentioned earlier. And then uh, an $800,000 repair or maintenance for an aging infrastructure on the terminal and uh, roadway. On our revenue side, you can see that uh, two-thirds of our revenue is coming from the uh, airlines, or the general aviation and the airlines. Uh, that's uh, our biggest contributor to our uh, revenue stream. And uh, parking, I know last year we had talked about uh, LAS coming in. I just want to give you an update that LAS actually has an increased capture rate of about 20%, um, and it, definitely an increased passenger experience. Uh, people are much happier. And Laz is the contract person that we did for the parking, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, they've also brought in a lot of expertise uh, for the industry uh, on uh, technology that we just didn't have before so that we can e increase, even, increase even more the capture rate and have a better understanding of um, parking and ground transportation. Can you give me some idea as to what the million two and other is? Because that's a significant other number. Yes, so the majority of that is actually state excise and fuel taxes. Okay. Um, I knew that you were going to ask that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another 120000 is for, uh, we have a uh, wireless antenna in the AOC okay. rent. Um, and then we have an investment income of about 190000 and that's from the treasurer. George, please. Uh, I've got a couple questions. On the operating budget, when you have uh, 191000 for security, 
is, is that boots on the ground and, and or what, what is that so that's an increase uh, there are two drivers on that one and those two main drivers are the an IET upgrade and that's the computer system training for uh, the CIDA badges uh, and other security uh, type of uh, tracking uh, and so you know they want to monitor. Uh, they want it's an upgrade to the security system, basically. So you monitor card swipes and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. it's, it's not an increase in personnel. No, the person, all the personnel increase is in line number one. Right. So not an increase in personnel, just technology upgrades. Yes, and the, this security one is not a non-reoccurring. So, uh, one hundred and fifty thousand is just the upgrade that happens whenever the. I can't remember off the top of my head what the company's name is, but uh, whenever they come out with the up, with the updates and, and the new badging uh, systems, new yeah. oh new badging systems, um, multi uh, multi language training modules, and um, that sort of thing. I mean, I really can't. And then under expenses, and you alluded to this, John, uh, to begin your uh, presentation, the ramp and runway repair, aging infrastructure, almost three million dollars. So. The timing, it was sort of the dilemma, is, is can we wait a few years, does this have to be done now, and um, is there any impacts to air service, why this is happening as well? Yeah, we sure, we're trying to put that off for a couple years. We did an emergency repair this year to accommodate. We were having actual pavement failures and actually tow bars hooked to the nose of the aircraft when they were being pushed back, snapping it at points that were uh, <clears throat> designed to snap if you were get, before you caused damage to the aircraft, but those were being <clears throat> snapped. So it was it was rippling where the aircraft were being parked. So we did the cutout of those areas and poured uh, concrete in there. Uh, but the overall condition of the uh, ter of the terminal ramp, uh, we just really don't think it should wait another year. Uh, so we're going to uh, propose a two and a half inch uh, grind mill overlay. Uh, for the following year, and that's going to be about two to two pi estimate at this point, and is an estimate 2.2 million. Um, so we were hoping it could last a few more years to get into the new terminal type construction if that was going to move forward, but uh, I just can't wait. And so, uh, what's the lifespan of, of this repair? Of this particular pavement, I don't five years. That's uh, we we just actually found that I, I had just asked our project manager about that, and he said somewhere between four to five years. Okay, and then you included uh, runway repair as well, so will that impact uh, service at all? Um, we'll do it uh, during the off hours as much as possible and during the non-peaks, so we'll try to minimize it as much as, as, much as we can. So, uh, But that's more of patching as opposed to um, closures for multiple days. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Most of that's for the air carrier ramp of, the, of that budgeted amount. <clears throat> okay, next uh, go to our org chart. So in terms of the uh, staffing chart, uh, here's what we have for 2019 that we're requesting for the Board of County Commissioners. The uh, green boxes are the addition, the grays are the, ex are the existing uh, positions that we have to the far right uh, as you're looking at the TV screens and as well as your page there, uh, there's one, two, three, five or six boxes, and those are the consulting uh, teams. The gray ones, Kimberly Horn for the program management and Ricondo for the on-call, they're in place. So the other four blue boxes are pending. But that was just to kind of give you an idea of where that fits in terms of the scope of, of staff. In terms of actual FTE items, the additional ones are shown in green boxes. So going from left to right, one would be a financial analyst uh, to bring that person in to really help out with getting our leases and some of our other contractuals. We're up to how many contracts and leases at this point? 126. 126 different ones so there's quite a few in there would be an understatement and just over the years it has not been as punctual as the procurement process will uh, as we would like so we definitely got some catching up to do in that category and that's what that person will be coming on to help help with as well as uh, some of the projects uh, with Eden and um, and other aspects uh, at the top there, we have an IT person, our computer access system. Thank you for your support. Last year's budget and capital project, we've 
addressed what the TSA has wanted us to address. I think it's a very responsive system out there, but it's complex, and we need the persons to be able to specially trained in it, uh, and it's beyond the capability of what we have in terms of existing contracts or existing internal resources. So we're bringing in an IT uh, person rated with those credentials to be able to uh, keep that system going in a very timely manner. The third item is the administrative assistant to help out with the three directors, the two directors, operations, safety, and security, the assistant aviation director, and the director of, of facilities itself. So that would be the third uh, request. The fourth is the director of facilities itself. The airfield is getting just complex enough where we really need that specialized type of people to come in and help us lead that group as opposed to have them as a subset under airport operations and a subset of airport security. The final position is the manager of airport security. Um, just continues to get uh, more demands and complexities and specialized training and subject matter expertise to, to run that program. So manager of airport security. Um, we always have someone on call 24-7, 365 on an annualized basis, specific to security, independent of the other aspects of the airport. And that's required not only for the airlines, the cargo operators, but as well as the airport to respond to the TSA. And they do call in the evenings, weekends, and holidays and ask us what is happening. So um, getting to be more and more of a workload for that, for that category. I have a question. You have two boxes above airport security that say the same thing. So do we have two directors of airport operations, security, and safety? Because there's two boxes. One of them is under recruitment. The other one is a filled position is my – but there's two boxes that have the same position listed. Correct. So the director of airport operations, safety, and security, presently uh, we cover about six out of the 14 shifts uh, that take place on a daily basis in terms of having some there in a decision-making uh, ability. Uh, that person at those levels also – participate in winter operations. So weekends, holidays, and evenings are so vacant. So we have two full-time positions with the same title? Overseeing uh, all security operations and, yeah. Okay. I'm just, you know, concerned about redundancies. I know you guys are busy, and I know you have different hours than 8 to 5, but we still need to be careful with those FTEs. George and then Steve. Uh, Got my question. Oh, do, do we have a, a, a sheriff's presence out there, deputy's presence all the time? And it just that because, you know, when you talk about TSA requirements in terms of new uh, security, in terms of access for arrivals and departures, um, usually in most airports, uh, I'll see um, local police who will be there monitoring. Uh, to, to, to ensure that cars are, are not just sitting vacant and, and recycling through. So how, how will that will that get addressed through the manager airport security or how will that? In this format, it's not addressed in a full-time LEO law enforcement officer presence. We're right on the cusp of going into the next category of aircraft, uh, or excuse me, airport classification in the eyes of the TSA, where it would then require a full-time dedicated person, primarily at the checkpoint. Uh, the airlines would like it today. It very much has a calming effect. Uh, we have spoken with the uh, sheriff's co department, coordinated with them, and they've increased their presence, but it's more of a random presence uh, which the TSA is okay with because they have to meet certain response times, and they do. So they're all right with that. But um, probably until we hit that next level, uh, we're, we're pretty comfortable with the random presence. Actually, that was called the Aspen Amendment to the TSA legal requirements. It happened under Bob Broadus. Um, it was a 5-0 vote of the Board of County Commissioners to say no to the federal government and say, no, we will not have a round-the-clock, you know, um, presence of a sheriff's officer. Because if you look at DIA or LAX, for if you have a sheriff over here and the demand is over here, it's generally further distance from our sheriff's office to our airport, mileage-wise. So we were able to amend the federal law to not have to have our airport at that time anyway. That was probably that before 7-11, though, probably, wasn't it? No. It wasn't before 7-11? Huh. Mm -hmm. That'd be 9-11, right? 9-11, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 7-11's the place where you get gas and <laughs> the bars. Um, 
and lottery tickets. But yeah, no, it was it was an amendment, and it was literally called the Aspen Amendment because after Aspen led the way, and behind us were like forty small terminals or airports that were saying we can't we can't do this. So that's how it stood then, and apparently we're still allowed to do that. I don't know if the change of our airport classification, if we go that direction, if we'll have to go back and look at that amendment again because uh, it was a pretty interesting moment when all five of the Board of Commissioners said, no, we're not going to follow federal law, and the federal law, FAA, changed their minds. So sometimes you can make a difference. So anyway, that's a little history. Steve? Um, I want to find out more about the director of facilities. Well, you have a facilities manager, and you're putting one person in charge of them on the flow chart. Um, would it be possible or more cost effective just to give the facilities manager more responsibility and more salary and benefits uh, and accomplish the same thing without adding another person? We, we have some uh, long-term employees there who really bring some great skill sets and especially the institutional knowledge to it. But I think some of the challenges that we've got coming up and down the road, it's really going to be more of a metric-driven uh, administrative type functions to move some of these, these issues through, uh, especially with the construction and the volume of construction that we've had, because historically we really haven't had that much construction at the airport. So I think it's a little bit of a different uh, level of skill sets that we're trying to bring in for this position to put it more in um, uh, more of that type of a format. So uh, we did look at that and just didn't felt this was probably the best route to take. Okay. So part of that's driven by um, you know, the potential of a new terminal construction project and uh, needing uh, special current, skills for that? It's cur current need. Or that's, just the current that, needs for... Not so much a new terminal building, but uh, really looking at, at today's conditions primarily, but also the complexity of what level of construction is going to be coming at us from the runway, the airfield. Mm -hmm. But there's just, uh, as the facility also ages, there's some real challenges there, uh, even more difficult. I think if you had a new car, and you, it, it would be much more of a predictable operation as opposed to a 1950s vehicle, and that's kind of what we're operating under here is a 70s style facility. So I think it's just going to take more of metric-driven decisions and analysis and more of a paperwork um, quantitative approach to this position that uh, this is probably a better format to take than to continue with the old model. Okay. John, did you want to say something? Uh, Steve, if your <clears throat> question satisfies, I don't need to jump in. But you know, it, it's really just building on what John said. Is we have you know the the maintenance challenges of the existing facility, which is pretty much a full time kind of uh, mm -hmm. job. And what we've shown you each year is the growth in employment has put, in, has put more and more stress on the facility and the capacity of the facility to, to manage baggage, to manage the people, to manage the, the security requirements. And as John said, more and more we're trying to figure out how to stretch the life of this existing facility to meet this increased demand. And so... Um, that could be repurposing, um, that could be temporary, you know, kind of space options, additions, but we're needing a more strategic look to get us through the next, you know, whether it's five years until something new is coming along or if something new isn't coming along, how do we make this work the best way possible? And we, we don't have that capacity right now to do that. Yeah, and I can see that, you know, given the increased number of employments is helping to pay for adding new positions, but you have a lot more people coming through the airport, a lot more airplanes landing, to, and that's paying for the increased personnel to take care of the whole operation there. So due to my presence, my consistency with FTEs, my concern. Could we say after these positions are all fully staffed, um, six months after that, do an evaluation and see if there's, um, if we're doing anything that's redundant or a combination of positions to um, address the increase in FTEs. But, you know, it may work out. It may be proven that everybody was needed. It may be proven that we can look at 
not that we hesitate to restructure at the airport. So uh, maybe in about six months after everybody's staffed and we can see how things are going. I think that would be great. So memo or something that, you know, or you might be back to us asking for something else. Different. Okay. Anything else here? Uh, yeah. Along to the bottom line. So to the bottom line. So we moved that to after questions, that particular slide, because it was kind of uh, repetitive. So... <laughs> Going to the bottom line of the five-year plan, you can see that we don't dip below 10.6 million, um, and that these numbers are tied to our, C our current CIP that's with the FAA. And for the public, can you define CIP? Capital Improvement Plan. plan? Just so the public, they don't know, and they don't have an idea what we're talking about. And, and Patty, for the public, it's, it's important to note that obviously as we go through this visioning process and planning process right now, that CIP could, could change in the future. Correct. And yeah. so this is the best information we have today. Any other questions from the board? This is a decision-making point. Do I see us moving this forward? Yeah, and just one other quick comment more for the public, but uh, again, the airport is an enterprise fund, which means no property taxes or sales taxes are collected except for the sales taxes collected within the terminal. Correct. Yeah. Or within the airport itself. But, but those do not come back to the airport necessarily at, at this point. So the sales taxes. Yeah, the, the sales taxes in the terminal. Now the sales taxes collected on the airfield side are being held to be used for air, airport related um, As in fuel? Projects. Yeah. So sales taxes that are uh, collected at the gift shops, they come back to general fund. They come back to the general fund, not Correct. to the airport. Correct. Why is that? John keeps asking me the same question. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't ask him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the law. Um, oh. the, the sales taxes that you guys establish are to offset the general costs of providing services, whether that be roads or human services mm -hmm. or public health. Um, obviously, as people come into our community, they're impacting those services. If, if we didn't have the um, number of people coming through the airport and then needing to travel into Aspen or Snowmass, you know, our road capacity probably wouldn't need to be what it what it necessarily is and that sort of thing. And so it's to, to offset those impacts to the community. Plus, we don't have to offer a gift shop, right? We don't have to offer a restaurant. Correct. So that's now, different than we have to offer fuel. Now, the airport does enjoy revenues prop off of those in, in yes. terms of lease revenues and, mm -hmm. and those sorts of right. things. Those do stay on airport. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So we've got nods moving forward with this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, now we're backtracking just a wee bit. So we're going back up to, to slide number 52. <laughs> right. Page 52. Page 52. Same thing. Sorry. To some in there. Um, county administration and BOCC budget. Is that not? It's not showing what I'm showing. <coughs> oh, Hit the escape button and see if it. Hey. Our best and brightest Kara to the KDN. Oh, she did? Yeah. Kara's on the KDN keyboard. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Just read that. Okay, here we go. <coughs> Spare time. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now we're back to county administration, and uh, this is the uh, budget showing here. There is a bit of an increase in the manager's department. Uh, the budget does include the be best and brightest intern in the personnel costs. Uh, that was in uh, both 2018 and 2019. And there is a $20,000 grant that covers part of the cost uh, for the intern. Um, 
included within the budget, not an increase, but just included as a part of the budgeted cost, is 28000 altogether for employee recognition. That includes the holiday party uh, and um, various awards or, or programs to recognize employees. Um, under the one-time projects, uh, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, backing up, 50000 for strategic initiatives is included within uh, the services and supplies. And then in the one time, we have $150,000 for wildfire and emergency response. And if I, I could, oh. I have a question on that. Mm -hmm. Does it accrue? I mean, if we didn't spend it last year, the year, we don't roll it over. Have we thought about doing that? No, if we don't spend it, it ends up in fund balance. And so we just ask for permission. Now, in the past, this has been $100,000. And the genesis of it was to um, for wildfire response, because that was the immediate concern at the time. We are asking for um, two changes. One, we've increased it, um, just based on what we saw, particularly with the Lake Christine fire and how quickly an event can, can escalate. And second, um, we recently did, and I, uh, Greg and Patty had an opportunity to attend the EOC exercise. And one of the things that became clear within 10 minutes of getting into that exercise was that it would make a lot more sense to have that 150000 for any major emergency response, whether it be an electrical outage or mud and flood event or fire. You know, fire was the genesis when we originally put this in. And so we're asking for a pretty significant increase in that appropriation. It, it doesn't accrue in the sense of the, the appropriation doesn't grow, but if we don't spend the dollars, they're always yeah. still there in fund balance, and so that carries forward. Because this is um, money that can, <clears throat> without doesn't have to come back to the BOCC. We can spend it on emergency need because rather than wait for the signatures on dotted lines to get a helicopter in the air, we can Correct. just call the helicopter. And so, yeah, Joe and I have a, a working agreement, and, and I'm you know usually involved in, in the EOC process. And that was the other thing we learned is I'm going to be pulling out of the ESF 14 role and actually being the county manager in the event of an emergency so that I'm working with the emergency manager and, and responders as appropriate and having these resources available on the table for response. And that could be, like you said, maybe it's an initial drop to try and get a fire under control. It may be ordering up resources to shore up a bank or to protect um, a flood endangered area initially before we can get the board to respond. Because usually it can take sometimes a day to pull you guys together and notice and, and that sort of thing. And we want to be able to respond um, okay. within some agreed upon limits. I'm okay with that. Okay. Any other questions on this one? I don't see any. Okay. The next is uh, the Department for the Board of County Commissioners budget. And you will see that there is an increase in 2019 and a few different components of that. Um, by state statute, commissioners' salaries increase uh, uh, with new elections. Uh, so uh, for the two newly elected commissioners, there is a wage increase that will go into effect uh, upon swearing in in January. <laughs> Uh, other increases uh, include 52000 for the Board of Equalization. Uh, part of this is included in the personnel and part of it in services and supplies. Uh, it does include a temp position. And so with a reappraisal year, uh, we are anticipating that we will need more in that budget line. This is an area that tends to go up and down between the on years and the off years, reappraisal or non-reappraisal. Uh, then there is also an increase in some of the dues and memberships. Uh, CC4CA uh, is up $5,000, and the Northwest COG is up about 8500 And then a one-time project, and that's a $13,000 uh, partnership with the City of Aspen for census outreach. George? So we've talked about this in the past, John, but um, CCI, uh, we have mm -hmm. those dues are not uh due till february right so we could sort of watch and see if there's any going to be any substantial changes in the way cci is going to be governed 
whether we want to continue or not. That that's correct, and we usually hold uh, until February, and you know, give our our CCI reps. I will say um, that at the at this last winter meeting. There was uh, much more balanced, actually, uh, for Democrats, for Republicans elected to the executive board. So they're they're starting to get a little bit more, I think, um, balance that's more representative of um, the the population, um, not just the the number of counties. And so um, we'll keep an eye on that. We can bring it back. Uh, The dues are included uh, in in the budget to keep our membership going. Yeah, and in Northwest Cog, how much... Did they increase? They increased by uh, 8,568. Okay. A lot of that's based on the formula. Yeah. Increased population numbers. That's a percentage. There was some minor increase, but most of it's just based on the formula. Steve? Um, CCAT is not included on this list, and I know it, that they It are. is included in the budget. I only mentioned the ones that Have are two. increasing. Because in, in I know ones. that... Um, we talked about that at the CCAT meeting just a couple of weeks ago and anticipating that Pitkin would it is built pay more than we had been paying. Oh, an increase. Um, um, well, but that still, but I, I, I know that when we meet in January, we're going to have a broader yeah. discussion about all all our memberships, and this could all be adjusted then, I think. Yeah, and Steve, what um, we had actually over-budgeted for the CCAT dues, I, I believe, and so the, the, we had sent Connie the, the CCAT dues, and, and the budget didn't change, which is why okay. it's... Okay. Okay. Other questions? I think we're good. Okay, so we're moving on to FTEs, and this will be the last part of our budget presentation for today. Uh, This is a recap. Uh, Most of this is what you have seen uh, in our previous budget meetings. In the general fund, there is a net FTE increase proposed of 2.15. That has a few different components to it. Uh, There's one new detention officer, a community development planning technician, a half FTE increase for clerk motor vehicle specialist. This is taking a current uh, 50% (coughs) FTE and raising it up to a full time. Uh, At the same time, there is a decrease of 0.75 FTE uh, with the project manager's retirement earlier uh, this year. In HR, a one FTE increase uh, supported 60% by the airport for a human resource business partner, and then the decrease of 0.6 FTE for the treasurer's retirement. Uh, This next slide has a change um, from what's been presented, and that is Uh, for community development. And this is similar to what we did for the ERP implementation in the finance department, where we had budgeted a lump sum for the whole capital project of the ERP, but then repurposed part of that for term-limited FTEs to backup staff during the implementation. So community development would like to do the same with their PATS implementation. Uh, We had $750,000 in the capital fund for PATS. We're taking part of this and repurposing it for a one-year term limited time for 1.5 FTEs. Both would be senior administrative assistants in community development. And what this will do is give community development the backup support so that their staff can be more involved in the software implementation and spend less time on other tasks. And, and that's on top of the 1.0 community development planning tech. Yes, it this is. This is specific to the, the new path. Yes, so, the, so this is an addition to the previous slide. Then other county FTEs uh, position uh, shared between road and bridge and open space, a heavy equipment officer, and then two positions in open space, a natural resource planner and a ranger. Uh, Five positions in the airport, which were just mentioned uh, previously in the presentation. 
a fleet analyst, and then in public health, an administrative assistant, and then an uh, 0.25 increase for a current program administrator that's only three-quarter time at the moment. And again, what is the fleet analyst? So the, the fleet analyst is somebody that will help with the new technology. What we're finding that they had requested both a mechanic and an analyst. And the, the reason for the analyst was that the uh, twofold, one, there's so many computer systems now that the analyst will help keep up with the computer parts of the, the vehicles while the mechanics can focus on more traditional uh, mechanic. Uh, functions as well as they'll be able to do more what you'd call meta analysis where you're looking at data from the whole fleet like how much idle time is there on different types of equipment is there a way to consolidate them and be more efficient what's the fuel usage those sorts of things so they'll be able to analyze that kind of data too All right, pending. Okay, then pending, three positions are pending. They are not included in the 2019 budget, uh, but with further analysis, there's a possibility they could be brought back to the board in the course of the year. Uh, one is a code enforcement officer. Another is a recreation specialist. A community development put forth these requests, but they really are positions that would support a number of county departments. And then the third is a risk manager. There were some other positions proposed by departments, uh, which were, are simply not being recommended this year. Uh, two facilities custodians, one detention deputy, and a fleet mechanic. So that brings us to the table of organization for the whole county. Uh, you see a five-year time period from 2015 through the proposed 2019 budget listed by each department, and you can see the changes and the trends over that period. And so this is your last decision point of the day uh, to move forward with the FTEs as proposed in the budget. Do we have any questions on this table? I'll just again make my statement that I am continue to be concerned about increasing FTEs when the, we're all hearing the conversation about when's the recession going to hit us again. And um, having been here when we had to do layoffs before, it's brutal. And I think we need to be very careful when we increase our full-time positions, um, looking at where we're going to have to make cuts in the future. I um, hate to be the pessimist on that, but it's, it's maybe it's my emergency preparedness um, just because it was brutal. It was very, very, very difficult for me in, to be in this position and having to tell people that they no longer have jobs with us. So I'm always keeping that in mind as we move forward. Thank you. I hear you. Any other nods from um, this decision point? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. And we got it done Thank for you. today. <laughs> All right. We is there a need for some technological um, stuff here? So we need five. So grassroots, we're going to take a five-minute break. Thank you. Okay, Melissa. How do I do this?
just a second and we'll do a sound. Okay, could you do you mind counting off? One, two, three. We good? Uh, five, six. Can you do? Keep going. Five, six. Can you get the double digits? I know. Once I've run out of fingers. Could you count to three again? You can't keep them. Sure. Uh, one, two, three. How many can hear? Like three, Ryan. Thursday. I keep having to remember not to say Tuesday. Um, Thursday, November 29, 2018. This is a continuation of the Board of County Commissioners work session agenda. Please introduce yourselves for the public and we're ready to roll. Cindy Hubin, Community Development Director. Ellen Sassano, Long Range Planner. Brian Paul, Chief Building Official. Okay, take it away. Great. Thank you. This is a continuation of our work session. Um, dealing with a whole variety of issues, but at the last meeting we talked a lot about the energy side of uh, potential code uh, provisions that we're looking at in the future. But I wanted to back up a second and remind everybody that this started off with a research project that we've been doing looking at where we stand at build out with Pitkin County zoning as it relates to infrastructure in the community. And what we mean by that are, you know, how would we be doing um, if we were to build out to maximum zoning or any range thereof uh, in between now and the maximum potential? How would we be doing in terms of our capacity at the landfill? How would we be doing in terms of our um, capacity issues and maintenance issues on roadways. How would we be doing as far as our goals relative to the um, the climate action planning that um, we've been looking at? So the last meeting, along with this meeting, we we're focusing on energy and looking at energy codes. And just as a little side, um, we have been starting to get a lot of, uh, not a lot, but several emails from people. And I think that there's a misconception that we are going to take action anytime soon on anything other than some energy code provisions that are pretty standard provisions such as insulation or window packages, <coughs> that type of thing that we've gone over several times in meetings. Um, with the Board of County Commissioners. So that's the only thing that we're looking at in December. So I don't want to get everybody all excited about the fact that we're not looking at uh, immediate changes to the land use code or to ramp 
uh, those things we are the board has directed us and we're doing additional public outreach and we're doing additional research based on some of the comments that we've gotten so those are not on the immediate docket the only thing on the immediate docket are what Brian Paul has put together in what's called a matrix, which looks at our energy code addendum. So if you have specific questions about the energy code addendum, we can look at those, but today is not that day. Today is a continuation of further <coughs> research that we're doing, and one of the further research points that we were brought up last time at the meeting was um, to take a look at um, what net zero means and if we looked at a net zero provision in the future in our code how that would affect our current provisions and what that would look like so we're very fortunate to have on the phone with us today ron flack who is the chief building official for boulder county boulder county has had a net zero provision in their code since 2008 and we hope to learn from uh, ron a little bit about their program today just as part of our ongoing research um, and once again I also invite those of you who have not come in to sit down and talk with uh, me or with Brian Paul or with Ellen about um, any of this um, we really appreciate the people who have come to sit and talk with us several of you in the room have done that half of you in the room at least and we really appreciate that so um, we've learned a lot from you and we hope to continue to learn as we move forward so um, with that in mind I think we'll just move forward unless Ellen and Brian have other things to add um, so the the bulk of the meeting today we really want to spend some time with Ron on the phone about Boulder County and their experience and so Ron, could you, um, can you hear us? I can. All right, great. Well, thank you for spending the time and today. And we just want to ask you some questions about your program. And we tried to put these in the memo so as not to surprise anybody with any questions, but um, we don't have to stick to the script <laughs> um, as such with the board today if you have other questions. But uh, Ron, could you briefly just explain your overall um, program with us, your Build Smart program, and how long it's been in existence and what it applies to, and a little bit about it? Sure, happy to. Um, so, I guess first of all, just uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to participate in the conversation, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there uh, in person. Um, so, the, uh, the, the Build Smart code, that's really sort of a marketing name for the energy provisions uh, within the code that we've uh, amended and adopted locally. Uh, so it focuses on the uh, residential code. Um, we do have some additional provisions that deal with commercial, but most of our jurisdiction, uh, they, uh, the bulk of what we are struggling with uh, from an energy perspective is the residential sector, so that's where we put most of our energy. Um, so the, uh, the, build, the build Smart program regulates all the, all the um, single-family homes uh, within Boulder County. Um, it started in uh, 2008 uh, as uh, a response to the, the, the um, our commissioner's uh, climate action plan goal. Um, and uh, since that time, we've been uh, revising it approximately on a, on a three-year cycle. Um, and I guess uh, just, just to uh, correct the record, when it first rolled out in 2008, there really wasn't anything that was quite hitting uh, net zero. So we, at that point, had um, uh, a HERS requirement for homes that were 8,000 square feet and larger as having a, a HERS score of, of 10 or lower. So uh, while aggressive, it, it wasn't quite uh, down to the net zero level. And, and I guess just, just to also state the record, when we talk about uh, net zero for residential construction, we really are using um, the HERS rating as our primary tool for that. And we are thinking of any home that achieves uh, a HERS score of zero, we're, we're, we're thinking of that essentially as being a, a net zero score. Um, and uh, there, there are some, some definitely some nuances to that. So, for instance, uh, the HERS rating system uh, does not include in their rating any um, any heating uh, devices that are interior to the building envelope. So, for instance, if you have an interior pool or a hot tub, 
um, a snow melt system, all of the energy consumed by that, uh, that feature, uh, that wouldn't show up in the HERS rating. So we have, uh, we've had to address those features separately. Um, but uh, it, it's been a good program. It's been, it's been working pretty effectively uh, because, um, because we sort of rolled it out and then have been gradually ratcheting it down. Um, it has given the, the marketplace uh, time to, to uh, learn about uh, how you do this and to adapt. Uh, and at this point, uh, it's sort of become common practice in, in our region. Could you explain a little bit about the HERS rating real quickly, like yeah, how that works? Okay. Yeah, so the, the Hirsch rating system uh, is uh, primarily regulated by a group called ResNet, Res- Residential Energy Services Network. Um, although recently ResNet has uh, joined forces with uh, ANSI and ICC to create a, a, full, uh, a full standard that regulates it. So it's not just being run by ResNet at this point. But the basic uh, idea of the scale is that a home that was built to the energy provisions of the 2006 energy code would be considered a HERS 100. Um, And that's sort of a defined point in the scale. And then as you get more efficient, uh, it goes, the score goes down. Uh, If it's less efficient, the score would be up. So if you were rating, for instance, an existing older home, it might have a HERS score well above 100. Uh, and uh, as I said, if we're, if we're rating a, a home that is consuming as much energy on the annual basis as it's, as it's uh, producing on site, then that would be considered our HERS score of zero. Great. Thank you. So you said the program's been in place since 2008, but it's, take, it's evolved since then. And my understanding yeah. is now that you apply um, the the requirements to 5,000 square foot homes? Yes, so each, uh, each code cycle since 2008, the, uh, we've, be, we've gradually become more and more aggressive in terms of what those first markets are. Um, so whereas the, uh, the, the first version uh, had a first score of 10, 3,000 square feet or, or larger, uh, the, uh, the, right now we're at a point where any home that's over 5,000 square feet has to hit uh, our first score of zero. And we have sort of a sliding scale. So um, as homes get larger, they get more aggressive. So, so today in Boulder County, if you were building a new home that was really quite modest in size, let's say uh, a, a 1,500 square foot home, you would actually only need a first score of 60. Um, so it, it's a fairly steep, a steep curve that makes it so that as home gets larger and larger, the required efficiency get more and more stringent. Can I ask a question? Um, and, and actually, just to add to that, we've also um, been gradually reducing um, the, the number of homes that are eligible for some of the other pathways. So, um, for instance, you could, there, our code does have a prescriptive pathway, um, but we have been um, reducing the, 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 we've been putting greater, more and more limits on those prescriptive pathways to push more and more people for this performance uh, performance methodology. So uh, my question is just kind of more in general, and I'm not sure if anybody has the answer, but when we're looking at house size, because that's, you know, definitely always an issue on our radar here in Picking County, in compares, comparing Boulder County to Picking County, um, what, what, what kind of house sizes do you normally, what's your see in Boulder County compared to some of the larger house sizes we see here in Picking? So it's, it's been a very similar uh, problem, I think, in Boulder County. Um, we've we actually uh, been, you know, we, we've been having larger and larger house sizes for many years prior to the rollout of BuildSmart. It's a little hard to pick apart just the BuildSmart impact because our, at the, around the same time as we were working on the BuildSmart Energy Code, we were also working on the planning side to, through our site plan review process to limit home sizes. And so, um, so that process is happening simultaneously, and that's also had an effect to sort of help reduce the rate of, the, of accelerating larger and larger houses that we were seeing in Boulder County. Great, thank you. Um, but we still, we still see quite a few uh, big houses. Um, uh, I would say that we, we see a lot of houses that are in the, the five to 6,000 square foot range right now. 
Um, but it, and, and it does get harder for the larger homes to hit that net zero score. Uh, or, so or, what about homes that are 8,000, 10,000, 12,000? We still have those. We, we have fewer and fewer of those because of the restrictions on the, uh, in the planning side of things. Uh, but we still have them. And when they come through, they have to hit a, a her score of zero. Those homes are not eligible for the other pathways. They have to uh, use a performance pathway. Uh, and that and that means that they have to they have to use a her score. Although technically, uh, and we don't see a lot of this, but but the uh, the reality is that as, as part of our code itself, we have allowed um, alternative pathways. So, for instance, um, somebody theoretically could get um, a passive house certification, uh, living building challenge, or elite platinum, and use that as uh, a way to satisfy our energy codes. Although the reality is that we don't we don't see that that often the her score is by far the, the preferred pathway. So you have options and opportunities for people if they want to build larger. That, right. That, it, you know, it, it, again, you know, the planning side has some some pretty thick restrictions on house size, but the building code uh, they can uh, we can handle with our building code any size house they get a throw at us. Okay. Well, and George Newman has a question I think for you too. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. So on your. Um, <clears throat> On your focus on the net zero homes use, using a HERS rating score, you're utilizing uh, your building code, but are you also looking at either on-site or off-site uh, renewables for the offsets? Or how, how Correct. You, so are you seeing, is it a combination? Or? Yeah, so, so it, there is a combination of things here. So when, when the renewables are on-site, then uh, that's the easiest situation um, from an administrative point of view because the on-site renewables can simply be put into the HERS model and contribute to that HERS score. Um, when, the, when the renewables are, are off-site, and we do have uh, sometimes that that is what happens, um, then from an administration point of view, it gets a little bit more complicated because those off-site energy sources are not allowed to contribute to the official HERS score. So what we end up with is we end up with uh, a HERS score that is the official one that gets submitted to the ResNet registry, but with a second HERS score that's verified by the same energy rater that gives us what the HERS score would be if that off-site renewable was in fact on-site. So, so uh, we, have, we end up with sort of two different numbers. Okay, and then uh, you talked earlier about uh, you don't include pools or hot tubs or snow melt into the system. You look at that uh, as a separate uh, way yeah. to, to mitigate those. So do you, have, do you limit your sizes of your pools or your snow melt, or how do you mitigate that? So, so there's, there's a couple different pieces to that. Uh, one is that we, we do have a, an allowance, for instance, for hot tubs. If they put in a very efficient hot tub, uh, and but by that we mean by something that meets the California Energy Commission's uh, certification, uh, which typically are smaller hot tubs. If they put in an efficient hot tub, then we just let that, that, that's sufficient. But if they put in anything else, if they put in a pool, a heated pool, or a snow melt system, then what we require is we require direct offset of all the energy that goes into that device. And that's a separate calculation, uh, but one that, that happens simultaneously. So, for instance, if, if you have a, a house with a, a pool and, and a pool outside, um, we, and they put a big TV system on the property to, uh, to try and meet um, the energy requirements of our code, the energy that's needed from that TV system to offset the pool is subtracted out from that HERS score. So, so that they, they'll need some of that PV rate to heat the pool, and then they'll need additional PV to meet the, the HERS requirement for the house. So, and Ron, you're probably familiar with our rent program up here in Pickens County. Uh, I am. So, um, if for for your county, if someone is does not completely mitigate through renewables, do they have a, a, a fee, and how is that assessed? We, we, yeah, we don't have a, a program like that in the county. Uh, and if we did, I think it would make uh, a number of things uh, simpler for us because we do run into a situation, uh, in fact, more and more, where they, um, they are putting in a large house with a large PV system, and they may be at the, at the limits of what the utility will allow, but yet still struggling to meet our, our requirements. 
And so if they had an additional place where they could purchase uh, um, into a program like what you have, that would actually give a, a good relief valve. Uh, we don't currently have that. I wish we did. Thank you. One, one thing I, I do want to make sure to mention is, um, in addition to the, the actual net zero HERS score, one of the things that I think is pretty important that we include is that we also have a requirement for the larger homes that the HERS score, before you allow for accounting the PV system, has a, a minimum value um, of 50. So, so we can make sure that people are building houses that have a good uh, thermal envelope uh, and then we're adding the renewable energies on top of that, and people aren't uh, just uh, building a house that's substandard but throwing a lot of money at the TV system to compensate. So I'd, I'd further the conversation of their solar gardens. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, could you explain a little bit, Ron, about what resources are available for people to buy into, and then maybe a little bit about your, um, you know, the whole solar garden pro program, as sure. and I'm going to throw a lot in here, and then also the uh, contracts or agreements that are required if someone is using off-site energy. Yeah, so if, if somebody is using uh, off-site energy, uh, um, specifically solar gardens, and we also uh, further uh, restrict it to a solar garden that's located in Boulder County or in a directly adjacent county, um, so, and they have, it has to actually be a product that they have ownership of, so it, it has to be something where, where there's, there's actually uh, um, uh, some, some sort of uh, ownership stake in the array itself. Uh, which most solar gardens do do meet, then we allow that to we allow the energy that's produced by that solar garden to be considered part of what's offsetting uh, the house. Um, and then what we do is in it so the, we get copies of the uh, contract that the homeowner has with the solar garden provider, and then we use that as the basis for another contract that's between Boulder County and the homeowner that requires them to uh, maintain that contract directly with the solar garden provider, um, and, that get, and that gets tied uh, to the deed so that it goes with the house. So it means that we can't have somebody who simply subscribes to a solar garden and then uh, a year later cancels it. Uh, and we want to make sure that at least we have this in place uh, for a period of 20 years, is what, is what, because that's the length of most of the solar garden contracts. What happens if they fail to continue that contract? The house is it, built. They, so that would be that would then be uh, considered. Uh, they would then be re required to find some other way to supply that that amount of energy. Uh, and if they were unable to, that would essentially be uh, a zoning violation. So they'd have to remove their outdoor heated swimming pool. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, re the resolution, I guess, would be depending upon the situation. They could simply lower the energy consumption of the house at that time. Uh, that would be one way. Uh, yeah. So if they had a swimming pool that's pushing it up, that that would that would work. Um, yeah. We haven't had any of those cases yet. That I'm, so, um, <laughs> just planning ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Steve. Steve has a question for you, Ron. Sure. If uh, you have an older home that is doing a remodel project. Do you have requirements that they bring it up to the current energy code? So, so it depends on the uh, on the remodel and whether it's a, an addition or not. So, so we actually have a fairly uh, a fairly um, we have a lot of different pathways through that code. Existing construction is by far the the most complicated to deal with because there's so many different initial conditions and there's so many different kinds of projects that the homeowners might be undertaking. So we have a whole matrix depending upon how much, how much let's say if there's adding uh, to the house, depending upon how much area they're adding, then we have a couple of different pathways to that code. And we have a separate chart uh, for existing homes. So depending upon what they're doing, they may uh, tr they'll trigger different HERS requirements that are less stringent than our new homes, uh, new homes requirements. 
And then if they're not adding square footage, again, we also do require energy upgrades, but we have sort of a, a menu of options that they can choose from, and that gives them the greatest amount of flexibility in terms of, of meeting the energy code. Because that, that was one of the things the earlier versions of Built Smart uh, got a fair bit of pushback on, was we were trying to have you know, very clear prescriptive solutions for different kinds of projects, but they didn't really align very well with the scope of work that the homeowners were really uh, wanting to, to engage in. And so we tried to, uh, to make it a, a, a friendlier process with a lot more options, and that, that seems to have uh, and solved a lot of the problems we were having with the first versions. Okay. And one more question. Do you have any sort of program <laughs> with financial incentives to encourage people to do energy upgrades on older homes? So um, not directly through uh, the Boulder County Land Use Group. Uh, however, we, uh, we work really closely with the Boulder County Energy Smart Program, and they, they really manage that, that side of the, uh, the industry. And so we, especially for existing uh, construction remodels and such, we push them into that program to get, to get further information uh, and to also have somebody who acts as a bit of a concierge to help them understand when they get an energy audit, how to take that and turn it into actionable items. So, so they work with that group for both uh, trying, to, trying to create that plan and then also to try and capture whatever incentives might be available. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Postman has questions for you um, now. Yeah, Ron, just wanted to ask regarding your 20-year term, you know, that's a contract for a PV term. What happens after this? Does the obligation doesn't go away? I assume. Well, we really uh, we really don't have anything uh, that we can point to that that deals with that directly, and it is a little bit of a, of a of a weakness. Um, and in fact, it's one of the things that I've often been curious about because historically we've never distinguished, for instance, people who put a PV system on their roof, those that own that PV system outright, versus those that may be leasing that system. Uh, we've treated those the same, even though from a legal perspective they are a little bit different. Um, and you know, we, we're sort of working from the, the, the assumption that most people, when it hits the end of the 20 year, they're not going to just take that thing off their roof uh, because they don't like the looks of it. Uh, but there really isn't a, a strong way we have to ensure that 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 that's being maintained. Now, on the flip side, many of the things that they're trying to offset. Uh, over that 20-year period also have, have a lifespan. Um, and so I think that there is some underlying hope that, for instance, if you are um, heating a pool uh, and as, as, you know, 20 years from now, perhaps the, the equipment that you're using to heat that pool will also be more efficient, so it might have a different uh, energy profile at that point. But we really don't have anything that goes beyond that 20-year that guarantee. I just wanted to say it seems that my my observations is that there's a certain amount of entropy with, uh, you know, you do a, you do an upgrade to your home, and over over years, of course, it's going to deteriorate. It'll become leakier. Systems don't always work as optimally. Um, is is there a review period or a, a periodic check in on uh, you know, energy efficiency, things like that, as part of your program? Uh, there really is not. Uh, except if they want to come in over that period or after that period and get further permits. Then those, then we, we have another opportunity to, 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 to deal with it at that time. So, for instance, we have seen uh, a number of homes at this point where they got um, an energy uh, her score at, the, at during initial construction, and then they've come back since then with some uh, remodeling project, and they're able to pick up where they left off in terms of that HERS model and and keep moving forward. Uh, but but that's all we really have to, to tie into that. God, thank you. Yeah, George. So, so Ron, uh, how do you how do you um, how do you rate the success of the program? And uh, maybe follow up with a couple other uh, questions. Um, how how do you see the the homeowners responding to it in terms of uh, them seeing long term uh, cost savings as well as environmental concerns? And and, and what is what has been your um, your feedback from your uh, your uh, contractors? Um, it's it's been it's been quite positive. I'd say I'd say when we first rolled it out, it was there was definitely a learning curve, uh, and in fact we we partnered uh, with an, uh, some local organizations, most uh, most notably 
uh, the Colorado Green Building Guild, and we, we engaged in a pretty aggressive uh, series of, of, of outreach measures to try and really help everybody in the industry, not just the, the contractors, but also making sure we were, we were talking with the material suppliers, uh, the real estate professionals, the design community, uh, just trying to get that everybody involved with the industry to, to understand what these things are, what they mean, and how to do it. Um, and I would say that that was really quite, quite critical, especially at the beginning, because there was this, uh, this understandable apprehension of the unknown uh, when, we, when we first rolled this out. But this, since then, I would say it, it's become uh, quite common practice. I think most of the builders who uh, were in Boulder County when, when this was in its early stages have really benefited because they have become energy experts. Uh, and they've, they've really been able to expand their own or repertoire in terms of what kinds of projects uh, they can take on and, and be knowledgeable about. So, um, you know, it, it's also true for the, the initial cost. So when we first rolled this out, you know, building a really tight house, uh, what took more effort was harder, took more work, and uh, was a little bit more expensive. At this point, it's become commonplace. Uh, and so, so it really isn't thought about as, as being some, some sort of uh, challenge at that point. Um, there still are some costs associated, but it, it's, not, it's no longer this feeling of being overwhelmed by it. Um, and I would, say, I, I would say it's been quite successful. And, and in fact, this is, this is one of the things that's happened since we rolled out BuildSmart is, is we've been working with uh, a lot of other folks around the country talking about our experiences. And some of that, I think, uh, was instrumental in getting the ERI pathway adopted in the 2015 uh, I codes, um, because we were able to, you know, get up to, and, and talk about what our experiences were and how it how it is working. Uh, and I think that that was it was uh, successful to the point where, where lots of other jurisdictions are now are now looking at this. Great, thank you. All right, Ron, we're on the 2015 code now, um, and I know that both you and Brian probably look very closely at what's coming down the pike in the 2018. Uh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say the 18 didn't go upwards. It, it actually leveled out. Oh, it leveled out. 21 may go up. It, I okay. haven't seen the preliminaries, but the, okay. the 18 actually went down okay. or actually leveled out. Well, that answered my question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, Sydney, anything else while we have Ron here or with us? Hopefully he'll stay on the phone while we continue our discussion. Do you want to sure. ask the audience if they have questions? Yeah. Okay. Because right. we, we right. have... Uh, okay. You know, All right. Well, um, does anyone else have questions for Ron? It sounded like you, you said at first there was certain... You know, it took, you've been doing it for 10 years. You've been doing this for 10 years now. So, uh, how many years did it actually take for people to begin to feel comfortable with it? Um, I would say it was probably the first, the first two or three years were probably uh, the most challenging from that perspective. Um, but again, you know, it, it was, it was um, as, you know, because we started it with the largest of our housing stock, it, it was sort of eased into the market a little bit. So, so while there were many builders hearing about it and learning about it, it's, it's only been fairly recently that, that almost most of our new homes are getting hers rating, um, so it, it definitely, it definitely, you know, so easing it into it. I think, I think, had some some benefit. Although at this point, there's so many people out there who who understand how to do hers ratings uh, that I think it is a little bit easier. Um, that's the that's the other thing that I, I have heard some communities who have um, looked at this and had some challenge when they didn't have uh, a, a group of of uh, hers raters. Ready, ready to take on this additional responsibility. Uh, my last question would be: are, are there any regrets? What are your regrets? Would you, what would you have done differently? If you can share that with us, you know, what would you do differently now? Uh, what, which is really part of what the advice would be for us. Um, well, you know, the thing, the thing that made it, the thing that I was most pleased to have happen was um, having the the adoption of the ERI pathway in the code because those first couple of years, our energy code, we wrote whole cloth ourselves. And it was, it was fairly lengthy, and it, it looked and felt really different than the rest of the building code. And that difference was, was really a challenge for folks 
who were unfamiliar. So if we had a builder come up from, from another jurisdiction and they look, opened up our code book and the whole thing felt so really quite different. So, so getting our code to match the sort of formatting layout and style of the building code actually was, was really useful. And then and having, you know, having the ERF pathway in now with the published code uh, just makes that whole process much, much easier. Oh, great. Thank you. Steve? Do you have any provision for uh, having this apply to multi-family dwellings? For instance, uh, some other countries like in Amsterdam, they require um, maybe it's apartment buildings or something be net zero buildings. Um, and that might not apply for your you know, unincorporated county areas and maybe only have single family homes. But uh, for instance, for duplexes or quads or something, do you have, have a provision to require this also? We don't, um, but primarily the reason we don't is because we don't have new multifamily going in uh, in unincorporated Boulder County. Um, but I think that if, if we did, uh, it wouldn't be that challenging to modify this to, to uh, accompany them as well. Um, there are some, some differences that you have to accommodate, um, especially with dealing with air sealing around firewalls and stuff like that. Um, but but it, it certainly is, is doable. Okay, and in the city of Boulder, do they have a, a comparable requirement? It is, uh, it's, a, it's definitely a little bit different. They, they did have sort of a tiered system for requiring her scores. Uh, and in fact, their most recent version that they're looking at uh, actually lines up co uh, very closely with what, with what we have now. So they're, they're in the process of looking at their uh, adoption of the 2018 code and uh, it, it will have a, a lot of things that are quite similar to what, to what Boulder County has. Okay, Cindy, staff, any more questions for Ron? Or Yeah. No, Ron, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay on the line if you like, but we're going to probably just talk with the board a little bit about where they want to go next um, and direct us relative to our next steps what we've heard so far is that you would like us to do further outreach before we take action on any of the rent provisions. Um, but as I said earlier, we are looking to bring the energy addendum forward to you, which is the addendum to the 2015 code that Brian has brought before you for the last couple of years with the matrix and he can go into the details on that with you when we come back on December the 5th and um, we'll get you that information ahead of time but um, with the public outreach we were thinking that um, the board wanted us to go out to the public have discussions and come back again to the board and the PNZ have further discussions and then you would direct us to whatever code amendments you would like us to. Well, yeah, I just want to make a little question. It's first reading on December the 5th. So is there going to need to be, you know, I don't want to, we don't want to rush into this. I know it's taken us a while, but is that going to be appropriate to do first reading on the 5th? Or are there going to be some issues you might want to bring back to us at another work session? Just trying to look at where we're going and how quickly we might be going there. Um, if you remember the matrix portion, it was we just it. dealing with, um, a few compliance pathway uh, issues with houses over 5750 right. just making sure that if they're going to be that large they would also they would have to maintain that continuous exterior house wrap they'd have to up just those windows. basic fundamental a few basic issues. fundamental things and then a few things addressing um uh, AFUE on appliances and some things that just start moving towards better complying buildings because even if we go down the net zero pathway the first focus is the structures themselves and getting those into a better uh, performance uh, on their own before you start doing offsets. So that's all that those provisions are, and there's only uh, probably, if you counted them, 30 provisions on that whole matrix. Right. And so um, we've kind of vetted those a few different times, so we feel pretty comfortable to bring those again before the board. Okay. If the board sees them and still sees hesitation, we can definitely put it out. We also put a full month between first reading and second reading to go out to the public and do outreach between readings so that that public notice isn't an extended. They can period. actually see what we're talking about and then as we move it forward. I'm just asking because I won't sure. be here on the phone. Oh, okay. That's the only, uh, well, 
that was the first available date before the end of the year. We were still looking at it, but we don't have to hit that date. The only goal was to try to have something move forward before the 2021 adoption of the next code cycle. <laughs> And I just want to go back to what Cindy said when for her opening comments, um, so the public is very clear of that the issues, of course, that we're going to be looking at and further with further public input and discussion um, is the transfer development program, um, the TDR program. House size definitely would be part of future discussions. Um, and, and I want the public to know that we're in looking at what we're doing. We're taking into consideration serious consideration, the lifespan of our landfill. We have issues with construction demolition, um, filling up our landfill, and where are we going to go then? Where are we going to take our trash in this community, in this valley? Um, that's a huge impact to everybody in this community. So that will be part of our future discussions, as will the impacts to our county roads, since we don't have this significant dedicated road fund. And as we all know, there are issues, growing issues with our the condition of our roads and that's a public safety issue in many cases so those those things will be discussed further with input from the public and discussions um, we do appreciate the letters we just got two i just got two so far this morning um, they were very succinct i appreciate that just a paragraph or two so it's easy for me to read on the go and um, keep in mind as we move forward and they were pretty much about where's the public becoming involved in this and we want to make sure that the public has that opportunity I want to be very clear on that. Greg? Um, yeah, uh, it just occurred to me, last thing is, I don't know if we discussed this so much, but I'd love if Ron could weigh in at some point, maybe down the road with you all. When, when you do your public outreach, I think the public is going to want to understand what's to be gained from all this. Mm -hmm. I think that could always be reiterated. You know, what, what, is it, what are we trying to do, and what have been the results after 10 years? Boulder has really, you know, blazed a trail here. And we're going to learn from their mistakes as well as their successes. And hopefully we can point to um, a goal of, of achieving a certain energy you know, uh, efficiency. Right. And so that's going to be a big part of it. And I'm looking forward to hearing that myself. Right. Yeah, yes. Please jump in. So this is Ellen. Ron, I think we discussed this briefly, but has there been a way to measure any reduction in greenhouse gas emissions resulting from this program? Good question. Um, so we, we really haven't uh, been able to, to pull that apart because we don't have uh, utility data for the houses that we that are being occupied. Um, all we can do is sort of project that those numbers based upon the, the her scores. Um, so we, so we know, you know, looking at, there's been a number of studies done by, uh, by NREL trying to understand her scores and to, ver and to field verify that, in fact, the homes that have a low her score are, in fact, more energy efficient. And we can use those assumptions uh, to, spec to, to work backwards to figure out how we've done. Uh, but but it, it's hard to do it any more directly than that. Right. Ron, my understanding is that you're doing sort of the same process that we're doing where we update our greenhouse gas inventory about every three years and then when we talked earlier you were talking about your i don't know what you call the department but sort of the climate action part of boulder county that division and that then they make those estimates based on um the provision the code provisions in Correct. terms of greenhouse Correct. gas emission savings. And that's kind of, I'm not an expert in it, but my understanding that's sort of the industry standard at this time. And we've been working with CORE. We do have our greenhouse gas inventory um, numbers as well as an update that's coming. And um, we're working with CORE to understand what the bang for the buck is given some of these provisions so that the board will have a little bit better well <clears throat> it's not totally scientific but uh, a little bit better gauging of what actions you would take that would have the biggest difference in the greenhouse gas emissions so, and, it, and it's yeah. nice we do we do track some of the energy uses and i think we need to bring that into some part of this process the other thing too talking about Equipment that, you know, put solar panels on my roof and three years later I go, oh, I don't want to maintain them anymore and I'll never know if I turn them off. We need to have a way to follow that so people comply. Just the same thing with wildfire codes. You have to crop, you know, the crowns of your trees and those kind of things. And it doesn't mean you do it one time. 
Um, the analogy would be our septic systems. We now have people have to verify that, you know, they, they treat them, they pump them, that, so we don't have a septic system that's great on day one and failing five years down the road. So I think we need to have some way of monitoring that in the future. What we're doing is, is just a facade. Put in a solar system and three years later unplug it and, you know, we, we need to have some way to track that, you know, or why are we doing this. Yeah, and, and I would add, I would add this, you know, this, this deal. You know, when you think about what the operational energy is, that that net zero, uh, yeah, that's a modeled number, meaning that on average, with the average behavior of an average occupant, you get you get an average of net zero. However, any given household uh, might deviate quite a bit from that based upon operational habits. Uh, so, <laughs> so a house with a, with a, a few teenagers in it. I was going to say, if you have teenagers in your house, forget <laughs> yeah. it. So, yeah. so all of a sudden, those numbers look really different. So, so we make them mm -hmm. put in really energy efficient windows. Uh, we cannot require that they close them in the winter time. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Wishful thinking in some cases. Any other further questions? Input. Again, we want to keep the public involved in the future. This is a work session. We don't do public comment at work sessions. That does not mean that in the future we might not schedule a work session where we bring the public in for public comment and just solely focus on that as part of our meeting. I don't think any of us would have a problem with that, but today we had a limited time frame, so we wanted to try and work this in with all of our budget issues we're going through now. So, Paul, you're, I'm looking at you, and we're not doing public comment, and you need to be on a mic to speak because the grassroots won't pick it up. Sign language. <laughs> now this means all done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, how many units do they have in Boulder County? How, how, how many units? How many residential um, units Units do you have in Boulder County? Unincorporated? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question and I don't, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Sorry. A lot more than we do. Ron, what, what's, what's, your, what's the long-term goal uh, if you look out 10, 15 years from now? I know that uh, California recently uh, instituted uh, all homes must be, all new homes must be net zero by, was it 2025 or 2030? Um, do you have any long-term goals like that? We, we do. Um, ho however, the, the, the piece of it that I think where it gets a little bit complicated is um, we, you know, even though a lot of Boulder County has become unaffordable, we, we still do want to try and keep, keep as much affordability as we can. And so um, it's, it's from my perspective, there's sort, of, there's sort of a natural spot within the HERS rating that you can't get below without renewables. Um, so, so right around a HERS 40 is about as low as you can get uh, without adding renewable energy. And so we want to try to make sure at a minimum we get every new home to, to that level uh, as soon as we can. Um, and then beyond that, it's simply the financing question about, about adding, adding renewable energy to there. Um, so I, I think, I think the, the target is like 2020, uh, 20, 20, I think it's 2024, but uh, please, uh, I, I'm not, I don't have that off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Uh, but we, we are trying to push as fast as we can, as fast as the market will bear, to get down to uh, net zero for all new construction, both, both residential and commercial. Yeah, and and, and um, how many new jobs are you seeing this being created in, in the construction energy industry? Uh, well, I, I know that the, you know, the rating community has, has been growing like gangbusters. Uh, I would be hard pressed to put a specific number on how many how many jobs that is, uh, but but I can say that we you know we do have a, a rich community of, of raiders and, and even folks who are training new raiders uh, up in the community and and we have you know just a, a much higher level of expertise of energy professionals that are working with with homeowners uh, especially on the sort of the the larger custom homes where the, uh, the finding ways to meet the code gets more complicated. Uh, you end up needing a, a higher level of, of professional to to help to help achieve it. So often we see uh, architects who are specializing in this field, or uh, uh, mechanical engineers that are that are um, really focusing on this, as well as the the home energy raters. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always said that it's not only is uh, is this important from an environmental a point of view in terms of a benefit, but but it's also a job create a generation. It's it's good for the economy as well. So I have a question. You brought up the issue of affordability of housing in your community, which, of course, we see here. Um, and that one of the things I've seen in here is some numbers on the 
just just brief explanation of your net zero program. Um, and it, it definitely, if you built an energy efficient house, your your utility bills will come down, and then that's kind of the long term bonus that you get. But you know, it's expensive to build a house, a home. In Picking County and the city of Aspen and Sonoma, it's expensive up here. And a lot of it is because of the process you have to go through to get permitting and approval to build a home. So I think we need to be very careful in that. If we want to incentivize houses 15, 57, 5 or less, or smaller, you know, the 2,500, 3,000 square foot homes, you know, we need to make sure we're not making the process itself so expensive that people just can't build it all. So we need to be looking at that because that's that's a hard hit to people. And I was going to throw out there the full disclosure <laughs> that that's kind of burdening me in this on this net zero discussion is currently what's on the table is 100% offset of your exterior energy and part of your interior once you get over 5750. Now we're looking at 100% offset of the interior plus 100% offset of the exterior. So keep that in mind as you deliberate heading towards net zero. This what we had on the table was an incremental step in that direction. Now, if we're going full net zero, it may have more of a of a public. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Recourse. If we want people to build smaller homes and live in this community, we don't want to, you know, make it so costly that they can't live in a simple house, even though they do meet a certain level of energy efficiencies. Um, we need, we, you know, that's a tough one because we we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by saying we want you to be able to live here and be part of the community, but you can't afford it. So, Steve. So we do have the Basalt Vista project as an example of an affordable housing project granted with subsidies to take it to the net zero level, but um, it is possible to build smaller square footage housing if, it, if the whole program is properly designed and can get funding for it to um, make it affordable for anybody to, no matter what, how small their house is compared to the big ones to be net zero. I also think we need to take into consideration because of our mountain environment um, that some lots are not as always perfectly situated for you know those net, those renewables or just building site you know where you're located on the property um, as they've been known in the past to be called crappy lots we still have a lot of those left and those might be great places for people to build smaller homes but they may not be, you know, inclined or, you know, the property themselves. So we need to keep that in mind, too, as we move forward. What are we asking of people? All right. Anything further from the board? We have three minutes. <laughs> well, we want to thank you, Ron, again, in our three minutes. Thank you very much for participating. And hopefully this will not be the last time or the first time that we speak with you. Um, we hope to keep you involved in this process as we move forward. My pleasure. Happy to help. Thank you. Cindy? Just real briefly, I think that um, from a scheduling perspective, we're looking at January, February, and March being more of the staff outreach. April, coming back to the board with that information that we've uh, gleaned from the public. And then in May and June, looking more towards the board's direction for specific code amendments. So. So, so people who want to be involved in this process, how, what's the best way for them to do so? Well, there's all kinds of ways, but um, if you want more of a one-on-one -on -one with your ideas and your concepts and um, going over some of the things that we've already addressed, um, feel free to call Brian for any of the real <laughs> nitty-gritty details, and you're welcome to call any of us for some of the bigger picture concepts. And then um, we, we will be setting up meetings with um, the various neighborhood areas as well as just general meetings about energy consumption, about zoning as it relates to um, our infrastructure in the community. So, Okay. Anything else from the board? Yeah. Seeing none? Just one. Thank you. Oh, I was just going to say one thing is that uh, at a conference, I think about uh, a year or so ago, I, I was in a room where the question was asked about, uh, you know, what it would be like for the local architectural design community and building community to go to net zero. And I noticed that there was certainly maybe a little hesitation from the wiser, older architects in the room that had been doing it their way for decades. But there was a young generation of architects in the audience who were 
seem to be very, very excited about this challenge because I think they understand the gravity of it and they also understand the, what it represents as a possibility. So, so I think that if we reach out to all these, um, everyone in the community, we're going to find some enthusiasm for this and uh, we're also going to find some gravitas and I think the mix will be just right for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you all thank for coming. You. We appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. All right, we're going to continue our meeting because we have more to accomplish today. Right, more to do. We have a lot more to do, as always. So, John, we are on future agendas. Yeah, just have. Uh, Sorry, let me get my mic on, Patty. I uh, just have a few then, wait, items. Can we, let's just, you want to wait a minute? Yeah, so people can gravitate out of the room. Okay. They're moving. I don't have that many items. So. Oh, I do have a page full. You do. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> okay, guys, we are moving forward. So, future agendas. Yeah, just uh, a couple reminders and one scheduling item. Um, <laughs> first, we are still trying to reschedule um, the Mountain Valley site visit. Some of you said you didn't need to go. Some of you have said you do want to go. Um, we are proposing now December 11th at 9 a.m. We've got Guys, a... Do you mind closing that Close door? Close that door, please. Thank you. Oh, December 11th? Yeah, we have a meeting that day that starts at 1030. And so we could schedule the site visit at 9 to, to meet here and head over there. Um, that makes for a very, because we go till 6 It's a long day. Yeah. We'll be outside. We'll be in a car. And if there's a, another option that you guys would like to throw out, we just have not been able to find a date that you want to go. I think, George, you weren't going to go. Is that correct? Okay. Are we in a hurry before the first of the year? I, I think the, the homeowners would well, like Well, it won't be coming back there, to us until after the first of yeah. the year. So I would say let's wait till we get Kelly on board. <laughs> okay. And just tell them we'd like to have the full board before we move forward. Because our schedules between now and the holiday are a little crazy. And then just a couple of reminders for you. Um, we do have the, the holiday party coming up on Saturday the 8th um, from 5.30 to 9.30. Hopefully you've had a chance to RSVP for that. If not... It's Rachel's last party, guys. It's Rachel's last party, yeah. Well, until we give her a party. Yep. And speaking of that, we do we have a scheduled a staff retirement party for Tom Oak and Fran Soroka and Mitzi Lettingham, which will be Monday, December tenth, at the Limelight like from four, to, four six. to six. Yeah, and we'll be able to make that. Sorry. Then, no, I'm going to be working down Valley, but I'll try and be lined back up here and see who's okay. hanging on late. Um, and then because Rachel's not here, we are trying to. Charlotte and I are trying to put something together after the first of the year right. um, for Rachel at the Limelight like we did for Michael Owsley. Yep. So we'll keep you guys all in the loop on that. So That's, like, that's all I have for you on future agendas. we have next, agendas. the Wednesday the 12th, we are meeting where for our site visit? Wednesday the 12th, we're meeting in Basalt at 5 o'clock. We're going to go tour construction site in the dark. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So... We'll get the logistics for that. That's going to be the tour of the Basalt Vista So we're going to um, have headlamps because we're going to be up there in the dark. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is Scott. He'll have something big okay. planned. Yeah. All right. I want to make sure we're safe. Yeah. There's not going to be a lot to see. They're going to just be the, the driveway. <laughs> yeah. It's not like any buildings. For some anything. reason, they it, want us there, so. It, it's we'll the infrastructure. Drone for us, and we'll just watch it. On, you know, we could do that if you prefer. Disturb yeah. those cows. Um, it's an opportunity to get together and walk the site with the school district, who is our partner in this, who you guys really have met not with. talked to yet. And so okay. it is an opportunity Let's to just hope to they're do going that. to be there. They have a meeting that night, I think, yeah, don't they? they do. Okay, anything else? Nope. I have a correction, and I've already talked oh. to Charlotte, but so everyone else knows. On the 5th, I will not be here, so I'm taking care of this, Greg. 
for you. Um, it says at 12 o'clock, we are joint meeting is in the library community room. That is not true. We are staying in this building. Oh, okay. It shouldn't be on there. It should be because we don't. We're not going to go over there and come back. See, on the fifth or the on the fifth. Right. No, excuse me, on the fourth. Fourth, thank you. Tuesday the fourth. Okay. It says it's in the library meeting room. It's not there. It's in. A, it's here. Stays here. And then on the nineteenth, um, John. This is just a, moving things around if we can. Um, we have the TDR update. We usually do those last in our land use because it's just a review. Yeah. So we should put that last. And then I don't have any idea what um, res uh, number 11 is. Does anybody know what that means? A resolution, uh, a minor amendment to resolution as a amendment to the Board of County Commissioners. I don't know what that is. It's an amendment to it. the 11th. Yeah. Can you give it a some, get us some more? Yeah. I just don't know what that is. Does anybody else have anything? So since we have a little time, um, can we just do our open discussion now? We certainly can. Um, so the, the big news, really two things to share with you guys at CCI. Um, there were some exciting awards uh, given. Yes. Uh, Nan Sundin received um, the Human Services Director of the Year. Really? Award. That's yeah. great. I and didn't know that. And that was completely nominated and selected by her peers. Did we know about is, that ahead of time? No. Oh, really my not, gosh. Which is really she, she was there. Out, yes, okay. she was there um, because we did have a little bit of heads up that Rachel Richards won a Lifetime Dedication Award um, from CCI. And and she was so, surprised. And she was very surprised. We uh, That's cool. also got Paul down there, and uh, Paul managed to make it all the way up to the podium when she did without her noticing him. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was good. Cool. Yeah, so that it was a uh, it was cool. a it was a good day for Picking County uh, out there. Yeah. You know, I um, at some point would like to do a proclamation for Rachel and bring up so the award she's got, like when she got the one from Club Twenty, which was huge. You know, because she she works in some very interesting groups, and um, to see the respect that they've shown for her, the growing respect they've shown for her over the years, is something we need to acknowledge. Okay. Yeah. I don't know when we'll be able to do it. We might have to call her back in after the fact, but if we have to do that, we'll do that. Yeah. And other than that, I do not have uh, open discussion. Does anybody things. else have any open discussion? You know, at some point, um, it, uh, it's because next week is December already, we need to uh, revisit our, um, our, what do we call our fund, our um, Oh, your discretionary, discretionary fund. Discretionary oh, fund. Yeah. You know, where the dollars have been spent to date and what's left available to uh, to distribute. Yes. When we will, I, I don't know what you're going to spend between now and the end of the year still, but uh, yeah, yeah, we will do that, that towards back. the last meeting, George. Yeah. yeah. It's already Africa. appropriated, so you guys can oh, give direction it? in a work session yeah. to okay. uh, distribute those. So usually we'll do that the last one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. I'd forgotten about that, George. Steve, did you have something? Yes. Mr. Um, Carnegie Hall over here. Oh yeah, and nice. singing commissioner is what he's. We well, forgot to, to mention the pictures that. of Carnegie Hall with them there were pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, yesterday, Greg and I attended a meeting down in Glenwood, of just a small group of people. But um, the guest person attending was Adam Fox, who is uh, from the organization Colorado Consumers. For health initiative. health initiative initiative and he is extremely knowledgeable about all the different legislative fixes that have been proposed in the Colorado legislature they've been working on on different things for years so he gave us a real good rundown on on the different possibilities in the legislature this year and things that he thinks that we should be uh, working on getting legislation passed and the one the one item that he said is the number one thing that we should work on is the reinsurance bill which passed the house last year and then failed in the in the Senate 
but now with the uh, Senate shifting parties, uh, that should should be a possibility to pass that. And he, his take on it is that that would be the number one thing that we could do that would lower our insurance costs here more than anything else. And we asked him about the single geographic rating thing, which he said is just a one-time thing. Our costs would still end up going up, but um, the effective thing to do is the reinsurance bill. And he also went through a whole litany of the other bills that probably will be coming forward this year. And so uh, we, we, we now, Greg and I are both on the email contact list with their organization, and I think we'll have close communication with you know, people in Garfield County, uh, as well as other counties. There was a woman from Montrose there, and people from Mesa County were at Who the meeting. Who put this meeting together? Because I didn't hear anything about it. I don't think George did. Did you, George? Well, it, it's, uh, there's a little ad hoc group that, uh, at first was being organized by the Garfield County Democratic Party. So before the election, they were keeping it just a closed thing for um, just Democrats, including Paul Estep, who was running for Garfield County Commissioner. Now that the election is over, I, I put in the request that they open it up to everybody, including Commissioner Tom Jankowski, who was Paul Stepp's opponent in the election. And they all agreed that that was a good idea because health care costs to, to solve that whole issue has to be a bipartisan effort to make it happen. And, and we don't want to have it be exclusive to just Democrats to work on it. And so I think that this is really sort of the beginning of a local effort to really deal with uh, health care costs. And it's kind of tagging on really to the work that <coughs> Tom Jankowski and the Garfield commissioners have put a lot of work in the past into trying to you know, reduce our health, health right. insurance costs here. Well, I, I think you should, if, uh, John, if it's okay, I think you should get somehow get those emails to john since he's our health guy mm -hmm. and and just so he's in that loop yeah just and, to keep up and so this is this is a informal group that's been pulled just together, totally so. informal they talked this about guy's having a, name. a consumer group of some sort right and so maybe if we can get that information then we can bring it back for the whole board as part of the policy platform mm -hmm. that that right. you guys put together and we'll probably revisit that um I'm guessing in February, give give Kelly a little bit of chance to, you know, catch up on what's going on and revisit that policy platform. We can incorporate some of these ideas into that and have the whole board discuss it. And, and I do have one quick, um, I don't know if anybody else has received a call from Dave Hale. He's with the Upper Snowmass Caucus about Watson Divide. They want their, the caucus is supporting paving Watson Divide. Um, but it's not in our budget plan, and it's a probably a million plus plus project. Mm -hmm. um, the, and I talked with GR, and we don't have a process now for people to come in with road projects that are not either in the budget or are on our road project list, but somewhere down the line. So I mentioned it to John Peacock that we need to kind of look at a way to handle these. So I've been in touch with Dave Hale. I'm going to put John Peacock in touch with him. He's already spoken with GR, and you know, GR said, you know, we hear this all the time. You know, we'd have to find out if the people on this side of Watson Divide if they want it paved too. Um, and then we have to look at how we'd ever fit this in our road budget because it's not it's not a cheap we've talked about it how many times George over the years well that in that in upper uh, upper snowmass Creek mm -hmm. yeah so I just want to give you a heads up if you hear from anybody because I got another contact from another person from the caucus so I don't know who's talking to who so um, if you hear anything just refer it to to John Peacock because I'm bringing him into the loop on it so that's all I have for open discussion. Greg? Um, I, on, uh, was it Tuesday night, two nights ago? <laughs> that Tuesday night, I was in Grand Junction and testified before the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission, which is holding public hearings um, uh, re regarding uh, testing and, and monitoring hydrocarbon emissions from wells. And apparently there's been an argument for a 
two different standards from the eastern slope versus the western slope. Western slope producers and some of the counties, producing counties, don't really want as oversight or a state standard regulation for air quality control from gas well emissions. Um, and so I testified in favor of the state standard, <coughs> and, and uh, it all went very well. I'd say overwhelmingly the people from as far as Durango, Crest Butte, um, uh, Mesa County, Garfield, everybody was there pretty much was in favor of sticking with the state standard rather than re going with a relaxed version. Um, but what was most striking to me is none of the commissioners came to the hearing. We were really uh, testifying. We all showed up to testify to a staffer who'd come to take, you know, Commissioners take from notes. the Oil and Gas Commission? Um, uh, yeah, the, the Oil and Gas Commission. And, and uh, that they weren't there was a little disturbing. And, I, and people apologized to me afterwards and to the, some of the other, only a couple other elected officials were there, but the county attorney from Crested Butte was there and somebody from Durango. Uh, and I, I was just thinking, boy, you know, if you hold a public meeting and then you don't show, uh, it really doesn't bode well. I'm, I'm a little bit miffed, and I'm trying to decide if I need to write a letter you know, well, what, expressing my concern. Question. Did you go down there and testify as a member of the public or representing the Board of County Commissioners? Because I don't think we've talked about, I know I think where we'd all be on it, but have we had a discussion on where we stand as a board? On the air the quality state, issues? You know, I know um, Greg went down for the auto emissions one, but on the right. oil and gas one, did we... In the past, we have taken a position on that. I just, yeah. I just want to make sure when right. one of us testifies, that we know we're on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because I want to be on the same page so it doesn't come back and. Keep and, it. and I'm sorry, Pat. There were some emails uh, that went back and forth. I don't think with the the whole board, but trying to figure out who could be at okay. that to represent the passport. Yeah, through position. CC4CA was organizing an okay. just to make sure effort to I, get people right. there. Through the mic is all standing right behind you, so yeah. I think that's important. Uh, same here. Yeah. We don't want you I was, I was a little nervous it. going down there, but honestly, I was surprised. The, uh, the mayor pro tem of Grand Junction was very positive, and, and uh, I think he's, he's the only, he said he was the only one on their city council who believes in climate change or <laughs> that there's a problem. Mesa but, uh, County, but there's huh? progress, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a break now, yes? So we will be back, grassroots. We'll be back at 3.30, ready to roll. Thank you. <coughs>
What is this? Hey John, doesn't, do they have a heat issue in that little booth? Because I noticed uh, Amy was... It's hot Amy. in there. Yeah, yeah. It, there's not a separate... So you guys have the control here, and I think the equipment is... The heat a down like already. That, a room full of equipment like that ought to have a... All right, we're ready. We are live back. Today is Thursday, November the 29th. This is a Board of County Commissioners work session. We are at our last item on our agenda. It is the Colorado River District Cloud Seeding Healthy Rivers and Streams. So please introduce yourselves for the public. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Lisa McDonald. I am with the Healthy Rivers and Streams program. I'm joined by DK Kanzer with the Colorado River District. Uh, DK is the Deputy Chief Engineer there. Um, the item in front of you today is a cloud seeding proposal that was presented to the Healthy Rivers and Stream Board at its November 8th meeting. Um, the board moved to recommend a one-year funding um, plan for $25,000, um, provided the city and the ski company also um, contribute fund towards the project. Um, there's a more detailed uh, agenda or memo from DK in your packet, and um, I think I will just turn it over to him and let him give you the uh, presentation. Okay, great. It's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. Um, with me today is some of our partners. Before I get started, I'll point them out. Rich Berkeley with the Ski Co., Dave Hornbacher, April Long, I think you know. Uh, these folks and John Ely is sort of a partner as one of the board members of the Colorado River District as I'm sure you're well aware and, and we have the press here too. He's, he's heard some of these uh, presentations before and encouraged me to do this um, so I'm happy to be here and talk a little bit about what um, I've recently gotten involved in which is a cloud seeding program um, in the central Colorado mountains and I'm going to go through I've got a lot of slides. Uh, my style is if you've got questions, just jump in. Um, it is sort of, a, in my mind, a solicited proposal, but it's also something that uh, has gotten a lot of press and a lot of interest lately um, with uh, the issues in the Colorado River Basin, and I'll um, talk about that. Um, so moving relatively quickly, um, the outline is what you might expect. I'm going to give a quick overview of the science. Um, what's going on uh, in Colorado and beyond, um, some of the common questions and answers and common misconceptions, um, some of the research and development that's going on, and there is quite a bit, and then get to a uh, funding request slash proposal and a little bit more on why, what, where, and how that might occur uh, should you decide to um, participate. So cloud seeding in Colorado. Um, why should we do it and um, how are we doing it? I mean, right now, again, some of these are self-evident, but the prolonged drought, and I put drought in quotes here to indicate that uh, many folks um, that watch the river uh, over the eight, last 18 years, it's no, really no longer a drought. It's a, it's a new normal. It's a new situation where water supply issues um, are becoming acute, and that was felt here in uh, your backyard and it's continuing to be felt here locally. Um, so what can we do about it? We can reduce demands. We can try to increase supplies, and this is on the increasing supplies. This is part of a, a larger context, larger set of initiatives, uh, basin-wide. And so colloquially we call it augmentation, and this is part of drought contingency planning. And again, if you haven't heard, this is uh, got the uh, the catchy acronym of DCP, I may slip into that. That DCP conversation is going seven basin states wide and nationwide. There's going to be a lot more headlines um, regarding uh, federal legislation and how to do uh, this drought contingency planning. And again, uh, augmentation and cloud seeding is part of that. So we want to adapt to climate change and we also want to try to capitalize on winter recreational opportunities at the same time. So that's all Fine and good. So how does it work? Um, this little cartoon, I think, really tells the whole story um, in the simplest way possible. We have a ground-based generator, and we actually have three here in the valley, um, but it, right now those generators are not pointed into your backyard, and we'll get to that. But essentially, um, these generators 
vaporize um, minute quantities of silver, and that silver goes up into the cloud. It becomes dust-sized particles. Um, it's, um, and we'll get into it again, the right size and the right shape in order to uh, encourage the growth of ice crystals that wouldn't otherwise form. Clouds are inherently um, inefficient, and this uh, introduction of nuclei help that efficiency. If you look at it a little bit in full color, um, the same sort of process, but I'll go through it a little bit slower here and a little bit more uh, detail. So the, there's a propane flame that um, vaporizes that silver iodide. It moves up through convection and through orographic means. In other words, it goes up into the cloud naturally uh, where it encounters super cool liquid water. What is that? That's basically the water that's not, that's present in the cloud. It's not in every cloud. We monitor for it. Uh, it represents a window of opportunity to, um, again, increase the efficiency and turn that uh, water into snow when the conditions are right. And you can see the window there is between negative 5 degrees Celsius and negative 15 degrees. Um, again, we have the monitoring equipment to see that. In many cases, uh, understand the winds, the temperature, pressures, and those sort of things. And only uh, when those conditions are met, do we turn on the generators? So, uh, without belaboring that, basically the the um, ice crystals form, they grow, and they fall as snow um, on the uh, windward side. So, these methods are shown here. Um, elsewhere, aircraft are employed, and they have flares. They use dry ice, and they. Um, have proved to be the most effective way of delivering the media into the clouds. In Colorado, we're just starting to look at that. We, we're not talking about that today, but I wanted to make sure you understand the distinction. Um, we are looking at uh, the right side of your of the picture there. Um, the the leftmost uh, that green canister is the the picture of the um, ground based manual generator. Um, those are the ones we have uh, nearby. We have about 25 of those, I'll show you. Uh, to the right, those are the more um, sophisticated ways to remotely operate at even higher elevation. That's really where we're moving towards. Um, and with your help, we could deploy a few more of those. But as we look here locally, and the one on the left is actually uh, located near Woody Creek, um, and these are just demonstration photos. These are the manually controlled generators and how they work. Again, you can see they're somewhat simple. You have your fuel supply. You have your solution. Uh, it gets vaporized. It moves up uh, in invisible uh, particles. And then um, go up when the conditions are right. I'm just going to say the obvious. These, these are demonstration photos. We're not seeding in these type of situations. Um, we seed when the conditions are right. The, the more sophisticated ones, uh, the one on the left was recently deployed. That's near Camp Hale. Uh, that unit is about uh, a $35,000 piece of hardware, uh, computer-controlled, solar, energy, batteries, uh, the works in order to control it uh, from afar. Uh, you know, I could turn it on and off here from this computer. Uh, likewise, the one to the right is in on Grand Mesa, where there's another uh, sophisticated and pretty dense network of um, generators. So the one in Camp Hill is in Lake County? This is in Eagle County, it's in Eagle. Upper Eagle County, yes. Um, and that's brand new. That's owned and operated by the Colorado River District through our, our vendor. And I'll get into some more details and talk some more about that. But before I do, just um, let you know that it's not just Colorado. This is a pretty broad-based effort. Um, there are eight states with active programs, um, and the U.S. is not the only one. There's 40 countries around the world. Uh, within Colorado, Vail has been very active since 1976. As you can see, um, the federal uh, agencies, in particular uh, Bureau of Reclamation, was very active through the 90s. Since that time, the states have really taken charge, and two states in particular, Wyoming, Idaho, in terms of cold weather uh, seeding, have really uh, move forward and updated the state of the science with two significant studies which do positively affirm the uh, effectiveness of cloud seeding. And I'll talk about that too. Um, and so the, the seven permitted, excuse me, programs in Colorado 
You can see them there. We're really talking about the Vail, Central Mountains, uh, and those are overlapping, and I'll show you a map of that. But essentially, we are spending uh, through a multi-year uh, agreement with the lower basin states, and that includes Arizona, um, California, Nevada. Those folks are contributing money through the state of Colorado and um, helping to pay really half of the freight uh, or more. If you look down there, we're spending about a million dollars in Colorado through the seven permitted um, programs in the Colorado River Basin. And so um, we are, um, these numbers uh, are a little bit hard to parse out, but essentially it's a 50-50 match between local CWCB and lower basin um, interests. Uh, again, as you pull back and you look at the western U.S., the blue areas and the, those states within those or that encompass those, those are the most active areas. And you can see the Sierra, Nevada, uh, and California, obviously a huge target, a lot of um, seeding going on there, where, and as well in Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, um, and in Idaho in, in the different basin. But really... The California, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, we are kind of all operating together under uh, an association and a partnership to effectuate um, increased water supply. So as we drill down into Colorado, um, just so you know how this thing works, you know, you can't do this without a permit. The permit is issued under the Department of Natural Resources, and that's been delegated to the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, so I'm going to say CWCB quite a few times. Since 87, CWCB has um, really been uh, ramping up their efforts, as you'll see, um, not only distributing money, but doing the permitting, regulating, and encouraging smart uh, deployment of cloud seeding. Um, and that includes the granting, as, as it shows there, since 04, they've been doling out these monies and growing the program. Um, the since 07, when what we call the interim surplus guidelines that, that govern how the Colorado River operates, that's when a lot of the interest has um, began and has grown exponentially, I would say, since then. So uh, some redundancy here. I just want to drive home the point. We're really trying to bring it up to uh, the newer industry standard for the equipment, which are those remotes. Um, we want to educate folks and be very strategic in how we do this. And you can see... Uh, since 07, really, and, and probably since o, since 12, um, a lot of money has been spent. Well, we do have about 10 high-elevation remotes throughout western Colorado. Again, two in our program just uh, became active this year, and another eight to the south. Um, and so um, without getting too far down here, there are also some studies I want to uh, bring your attention to, and one is that NCAR study. It's the National Center for Atmospheric Research. They've done, and I've brought some documents for you to look at if you have time and interest, but essentially we're using the latest science meteorological information to determine where to put these things, and we want to move uh, some sites, eliminate some sites, and actually increase some sites. And your uh, area here uh, is one of the areas that we've targeted, or I should say NCAR has targeted as a high potential to expand into. Um, Excuse me, Dave. Of course. One, uh, on go back on this one. Something the DRI plume. Could you describe yes. that? Yes. Yes. So DRI is the Desert Research Institute, and they're a um, set of experts based in University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm sorry, in Reno. Um, they have done plume modeling studies, which essentially says, well, where, if you did have a uh, generator, where would those particles go? And we did that for the Blue River, uh, Upper Blue, I should say, above Dillon, um, and the Southern San Juans. And we would like to do some additional plume modeling for your area to, again, verify um, uh, our assumptions and what we call our conceptual model. We, we understand how this works, um, but we want to refine that and optimize it through studies and um, partnerships with um, institutes like the Desert Research Institute, which is a nonprofit um, institute and academic but quasi um, practical um, entity. So, um, trying to move somewhat quickly to let you get out of here, I want to show you this map that um, indicates you know, this is highly, um, there's a lot going on in Colorado. So, every one of these um, 
triangles, especially the green ones, um, and there's over 100 now in western Colorado from the southern San Juans all the way up to Grand County, um, are, are actively engaged in cloud seeding. And so this surprises a lot of people um, if, if you haven't seen this and put it into context. And the other thing you're seeing there are the purple and the blue areas. Those are the um, sort of areas where um, you have the highest median snow water equivalent. Those are the, really our target areas, and I'll talk a lot about target areas going forward. The yellow are some of the areas that we would like to put Man, I'm sorry, the remote, potential remote generators, if you can see that up there on the, on the key. Um, and so we're really targeting that as part of our um, moving forward through the program. And I want to just point out the River District has only been mon um, managing this program. This is, we're going into our third season. We sort of adopted it from um, others and it started to grow and it just made sense for us as a regional water purveyor planning entity, policy entity, to um, take this on. We were asked to do so, and we, we did that. Um, okay, before you move from that slide, course. George has a question, and yeah, so, so do I. So all of these uh, sites, <clears throat> they're currently uh, doing cloud seeding. That's what I was going to yes. ask. And how they all, how they being funded? So there's a, a series of mechanisms and funding, and I'll get into ours, but in general, um, most of these are water um, entities, so if you look over here, I don't know if this pointer is going to work, probably not, but um, in the Grand Mesa area, as, in, as an example, City of Grand Junction is that entity. They're doing most of the funding there for their watershed, their water supply. In the south, in the San Juans, it's the Dolores Water Conservancy District that's managing and funding. Um, and when I mentioned earlier, it's about half local funds and half state and um, these um, lower basin funds. So lower basin kicks in about 500,000 a year, gives it to the CWCB. They give out the grants to these entities that are uh, operating these. And if you see the dark black lines, those represent separate um, permit areas. So each one of those is permitted separately, administered and regulated separately, and funded separately. So for us, um, near the Vale, uh, right in the middle of the northern, that's really in... Um, I'm going to have a better map of this, I'll show you, but you can kind of see um, there's a kind of a gap, and I'll show you uh, Pitkin County is only partly in right now, but for the Central Mountain program that we administer, um, we have not only western um, slope entities like the River District putting money in, but we also have Front Range Water Council members putting in money. And and then how, how have you quantified the results? So I'm going to get into that. Quantifying the results is tricky. There's two studies that I'm going to talk about. One's in Wyoming, one's in Idaho, which does the, did a statistical significant test over 10 years. Again, the Wyoming study is the most robust study we have, and I've got references, too, and some of that's in here. It was in our packet, too. Yes. The, wait, wait. So all, all the references are there. I want to... Um, show you some of those results um, in, a, in a very um, brief manner, but essentially they do paired watersheds and they try to look those that have seeding and those that don't have seeding and compare. Obviously there's a lot of other uh, conditions that go on. It's very hard to, to nail down, but the, the state of the science is that it improves um, on, a, on a per storm basis between five and 15%. Snow, f snowfall, effective snowfall. There was another one that was a one to five percent. So and so then when you start talking about well, what does that do to the water supply, that's when you're um, because of the efficiency of snow melt and the way the watersheds operate. It's not just a five to fifteen percent increase in water. It's more like a one to five percent increase in water. So I want to, yeah. and again I'll, I'll jump into that and try to repeat some of that so that it tries to fit together. Was there another? Yeah, looking at this. How much more do you have to saturate it with these generators? I mean, how many generators do you need out there? And on the health effect, what's the accumulative effect if you added another 100 or more generators that you're spewing silver nitrate into the atmosphere? What's the accumulative health risk effect of I'll, that? I'll talk about that a little bit. But essentially, uh, the, the, neg um, the cumulative and acute effects are negligible based on the studies that I'll show you. And I'm not uh, an environmental toxicologist, so forgive me, 
But the studies I've read and the studies that we're citing, and, and also the regulators cite, is that it's, it's negligible. These are inert um, dust-sized particles that don't get into the, the ecosystem. And what we're talking about is not adding hundreds more. We're talking about adding uh, two to five uh, strategically located remotes to hit areas that are outside of those uh, black lines, but inside the blue areas. And again, I want to show you another That's map. That's my question. How many more do we need to get? Yeah, between six percent, one to six percent, and at, at a cost that's pretty significant. So those, those are concerns. But before we may move from this, Steve had a question, so I don't want you to flip yet. We got time. Yeah, okay. Dave. Cool. All the yellow ones on this map are all downwind from the prevailing winds of Picking County. So if we put money into it, it looks to me like it's benefiting the Eagle <laughs> River and Upper Colorado River drainages and not the Roaring Fork River. So so what I want to do from the new sites. Sure. So is anything proposed more for western yep. Picking and County I'm gonna, I'm that would actually drop more precipitation in this part of the valley? Definitely. Commissioner Childs. Um, so this map is to show you all the activities that are going on. What, I, what I, Another map will show you what we're proposing and it comes at the end. I apologize. It's okay. But um, Essentially, the areas that are outside the black is what I was starting to say are those areas that we would like to move into. Um, there's and there's some studies that indicate a high potential for um, Southern Pickens County, if you want to call it that, and parts of Grand County. Those are the areas that we would like to move into. The the, the all these proposed ones are not what we're asking funding for. The ones that we're asking funding for are actually not on this map. Okay. This. That would so this is what exists already. This is what exists or well, the was other proposed. Ones are proposed. So they're not. They don't. Some exist. some no, are proposed um, for other entities, because this is the state. You oh, can see okay. the CWCB map. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll try to remember to come back to that. But I want to highlight um, this report, and maybe now's the time. I don't know if you want to multitask and look at no, this. No, don't know. Um, but this is leave this it out is, for us for after. Yep. This is a key document. It's a compendium. And it's shown here, um, summary of current programs and opportunities. And so the opportunities I'm going to talk about are, are identified in here, uh, the NCAR study, which we'll come back to. But it's got the fact sheets and maps and the Wyoming study that we talked about and talks about technical approaches, equipment, prices, and specs. So this is really our, our guiding document. And, um, again, the reason why I think it makes sense for Pickens County to participate um, so, so really what um, I'm managing is this Central Colorado Mountain River Basin Program. It's got the catchy acronym CCMRB. <laughs> um, and it's, it's been going in this form since 20, 2012. It's a coalition of folks that do include the Front Range Water Council, the municipal water providers in the East Slope, um, and um, the River District. Um, local other conservancy districts as well as the lower basin states that's what this is about and so we've been we've been at it here only since 2016 um, but we uh, we do have uh, the vendors and the operators who have a lot more experience than I do and unfortunately the vendor could not be here today with us today he was uh, Eric Germstadt and um, Western Weather Consultants they're the folks that met with the Healthy Rivers Board and did, did the presentation, but I'm sort of pinch hitting for him. But I'm the fiscal manager that, and the project manager. But just to reiterate, you know, Vail Beaver Creek has been doing this. They're, they're sold on it. That's within our permit area. There's actually sort of two programs in one. They're very focused on their area. And so we share, and I'll show you some maps, the generators that, depending on the prevailing winds, and Director Child, you mentioned this, um, you know, we turn them on for different purposes at different times. So um, I'll show you that in a, in a hopefully in a better graphical sense. Uh, Winter Park, Keystone, Breckenridge are also embedded in our program. They're contributing uh, their own funds in a, in a like amount. And in fact, they're they're putting more money into this than than our program combined. But it's it's um, a very good partnership and um, overlapping interests. So when you look at um, the Central Colorado program, you know, our target area, no surprise, is above 8,500 feet where most of the snow falls. 
um, in the Upper Colorado River Basin, Pitkin, Eagle, Summit, Grand. Those are our, the main counties that we operate in. We have had public meetings in all those counties. Um, you know, and Pitkin is a little bit unique, um, and we want to, um, should we go forward, we will have public meetings here, and I'll talk about that some more. Key objective, no surprise, increased snowfall, especially in the early season for those ski areas. That's what they're, they're doing right now. They've had a lot of seating hours already expended in the Vale, uh, Keystone, Breckenridge, Winter Park areas. Um, and then for us as water managers, we're looking at the entire winter season and the snow accumulation and runoff. So I mentioned 25 cloud seating generators. We have two remotes now from November to March. It should say November to April. I'm not sure I missed that again. I need to hey, DK, it. Could, could you let us know uh, what is the cost? Is it measured in acre feet, cost per acre foot? Um, and, and this is kind of like the, um, the question we had. Um, how do you figure that out? You know, what is the yield? What's the effectiveness? These are all based on the Wyoming study, and that Wyoming study varies, but um, the numbers I'm um, familiar and comfortable with are at 40 to $50 an acre foot. In terms of net water, it's extremely affordable, and the reason that the lower basin is so interested, when you do this across the large landscape, a small percentage yields a lot of water. And so our targets, you know, um, and this is just me, we don't have a, a firm number, but it's in the order, six figures of increased volume of acre feet per year, you know, on the order of 100,000 acre feet. Our um, deficit in our program, um, again, take it with a grain of salt, the, the vendor comes up with the numbers, you know, it's in the order of 60,000 acre feet of increased um, water that we're able to generate. Um, those are based on studies and, and some direct measurements, but it's really hard, as I mentioned, to nail that down. And we understand there's a lot of um, skepticism in that. But the, the, the point is, it's a low risk, high reward scenario uh, from a water management point of view and even from a recreational point of view. Um, when you talk to um, those managers at Vail, Winter Park, Keystone and Breckenridge. Um, so when you when you look in, and I'm trying to zoom in here, this map is a little hard to see. The yellow lines are highways to kind of orient you. Um, that black um, uh, outline shows sort of three polygons or three areas, and then you see near the Minturn line, that's the the uh, Vail program, that's that darker um, polygon, and you see some other areas within that. These are all targeted by the uh, generators. Again, depending on what the winds are coming from the west, we turn them on to hit some of the target areas. If they're coming from the north, we hit some of the others to really accumulate snow in the areas. And so the green are the existing manuals and the yellows are potential re um, remotes. And those are the ones that are expensive. Those are the ones that are on our wish list um, and not yet in place. So how many of those are on United States Forest Service property? Very few, if any. Most of these are on private lands. Uh, most of these are operated by uh, ranchers and folks that are out um, operating um, their enterprise. So the meteorologist will monitor the conditions. They'll call up these folks and they'll go out. They'll spark the unit and fire it for the prescribed number of hours based on the conditions that are changing. So, for instance, last night... Um, I got an email and we can provide this information, but they tell you when the generators go on, when they go off, and when which ones. And so it's um, this map, this map might show a little better um, how we operate these things. And um, so there is no pointer that works, but there is, John, how do they use a Does the pointer cursor on work that? on that one? It doesn't seem to be showing up, yeah. but. I, I can kind of describe it, um, and it, it's very similar. You can see that the counties. Is it? The, yeah, I should know how to do this. Thank you. We're not Try seeing it. Oh, nice. There you go. Oh, there we Thank go. Thank you so much. Um, so we're down uh, here. This this is the polygon, uh, the Aspen target area. We're calling it. This is not yet permitted. This lighter green, everything in the darker green is uh, permitted and active. The different color generators you can kind of see up here, 
um, these, the V's are Vales, trying to target their area here in Eagle County. This is Summit County, Grant County, again, Pitkin County. Um, the blues are shared and the yellows are shared. Depends on the primary um, ownership, so to speak, and better, better put, sponsorship. So the yellow are shared um, for the bigger area, but when the conditions are right, they turn, them, turn on both of these to really load up the, the Vale area. For us down here, these are um, active. One, two, three, four. Um, Rudai is up in here on the county line, as you probably know, um, trying to increase water supplies up in this uh, part of the frying pan. These generators are not turned on when the winds are from the north because this is not permitted. When the winds are from the west, we're turning them on to hit this permitted area. And that, that permitted area, is that Twin Lakes, other side of the pass? The, the, this the is continental the continental divide? divide here. So the target area is, is on the, the windward or west side of the continental divide. The, the reason that the Front Range Water Council folks are interested in this program is not for their water supplies directly. It's to augment and to shore up the issues at Lake Powell. And I'm assuming that that conversation will not have to go too deep in that, but, you know, reservoir levels are such that um, any curtailment due to Colorado River shortages could impact those uses, the, the transbasin diverters, which are junior. So the Front Range Water Council, Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, all the way up to, you know, Fort Collins, they rely on transbasin diversions. If the call came up the river due to a shortage at Lake Powell and Mead, they would be one of the first to be turned off. So they are contributing to this to act as a insurance policy. And so that's a key thing to, to keep in mind. What we're talking about is a little bit different. On the west side of the divide, we're really looking to, and that's what we call system water, increase system water to uh, allow us to have a full supply over here, utilize that water, um, there are some depletions with that, but the, because of return flows, those return flows accrue to Lake Powell, and they can essentially be used more than once. Any drop of water that goes over the hills, you know, is fully consumptive and lost to the basin forever. So um, without belaboring that, there, there's really overlapping objectives here, and the, the, the purpose of this slide is to really show you the level of activity, and this particular set of polygons is what I personally manage and we, uh, through the NCAR study, have shown a high potential that's being missed in this area. And that's why we have this. But this one is sort of roughly put in here. This N is, would be a new remote that could be brought into being. It could be located elsewhere in the county. This is not um, fully vetted. It's just for example to help us um, augment the snowpack here. And here is, you know, Aspen Mountain. Highlands and snowmass are all within this uh, polygon. So you're a, pointing to the ski hills. Yeah. I, have, ski I have a question. So the two green ones that you just mentioned, right in the just above the Aspen snowmass ski areas, um, are not in a permitted area, but there's generators there, so you can turn them on. So hopefully they blow into the permitted area. That's right. That's a really amazing ability to control Mother Nature. <laughs> So you would think that the, the generators would have to be located themselves in a permitted area. So but apparently not. So you not. can see the same thing up here. Yeah. These are um, outside the. It doesn't make any sense. Target area. And so the reason that, of course, we have public meetings is to put everybody on notice of the activities, mm -hmm. but the way that they regulate it is, with, is within the target area. So. The, the, so the monitors can, I mean, the generators can be located anywhere as long as they're blowing towards the that's right. regulated area. Yep. So it depends on the wind, prevailing wind. Yeah, and it, yeah. so that's... And they turn them off. If the wind changes, they shut it off. Well, if you get the guy who's on the ranch to go to shut the one off, but... That's yeah. what they do, yeah. Yeah, I can't see that happening at 3 o'clock in the morning when he's in his barn. They do it. They that's do it. They yeah. do it. Especially Steve? those ranchers that are up at all hours. So you're talking about the permitted area. Who does the permitting? For so that's, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Department of Natural Resources is the regulating en entity. They delegate that 
uh, to the CWCB. So the Colorado Water Conservation Board does this. The permit we have is a five-year permit. It was just renewed in 17 and goes to 2021. Yours, if we decide to move forward, we can pick uh, and choose the, the length. I think it's up to five years. doesn't have to be five years. Um, and that would be granted to, um, in our case, it goes straight to the vendor. The vendor does all the liability, all the compliance, all the reporting. But uh, south of us, the Upper Gunnison Water Conservancy District, they monitor, I'm sorry, they are the permitting, I'll try one more time, they are the sponsor that holds the permit. So you can, uh, based on your application, um, you know, for instance, the county could be the permitting, permitting entity. We're proposing for this new area that the same vendor that operates the CCMRB, the Central Mountain Program, would be that uh, permit holder that uh, together with um, our staff does the reporting, it's annual reporting, and provide that information to the regulators and they're um, uh, ensuring that we're within compliance of the um, requirements and I've got some information on George, that. George, go ahead. So uh, in, in terms of permitting, uh, this would be uh, permitted by the county or the city? The, the permit, CWCB. I'm sorry, is the CWCB and they delegate um, the operations and maintenance to the vendor. And we, you have some choices. What I'm going to recommend is that we go with the same vendor, which is Western Weather Consultants of Durango. What about land use approvals is what we're going right, to right. I'm just more curious in terms of um, C CWCB can, can approve a permit area, but they can't override our land use codes. They need to come before the, the city or the county. Uh, How does that process work, John? Depends on the site. You need to be on mic. Sorry. I think it's uh, it would be dependent upon the site that's selected for use of um, one of these generators, and uh, DK is indicating that most of the sites are on private land, so it would have to be a use that's consistent with the underlying zoning or something that can be permitted through the county. I don't think there's anything that's proposed in a urban type setting. So I guess I guess the question is uh, because I, I know um, in, in the packet it says uh, no known in immediate long term environmental harm has been shown. Well, long term is, is sort of a, a nebulous term. We didn't know about lung cancer for 40 years uh, right from on. cigarette smoking, right? So. So long-term effects, we really don't know. So even though you may have a private landowner who would allow the uh, the uh, the apparatus to be on there, the the uh, cloud seeding covers a much greater area over public areas. So so what? what where is the public's input into this process? So I'll get into it a little bit more, but it's essentially we have legal notices that are published. We have public meetings that are held. We have a the regulatory agency takes notes, takes comments, and then writes a record of decision. And so that's occurred. It occurred in, um, again, September of 2017. And so that's all uh, archived on the CWCB site. I can get you those documents. Uh, typically, as you might guess, there hasn't been a whole lot of folks showing up but the ones that do we had several news articles that talked about it and the again the state of the science the state of the uh, activity but those those are real concerns we understand the public uh, needs to know um, and that's really I think part of the reason I'm here today is to let you know that these things are going on as well as to enlist your participation and if and when we say yes we want to try this out that's when we make an application and, the, and again, I've got a slide on this, but you apply, you get uh, CWCB and the um, Colorado Attorney General's Office to uh, convene these meetings. They're recorded. They are published in the newspapers in all the surrounding counties. And so the affected lands and, and populace are notified. But I understand, you know, it's tough to get the message out. And so we put it on our website. The CWCB puts it on their website. And those are the... The, the outreach that we have, but it's, it's still a surprise to many folks and maybe to you that mm -hmm. these activities are going on 
and um, it's um, it, it's that's the the process. Yeah. So, so Greg, is, we're just real quick though. Yeah. Those two that you said are not in a permanent site. The these, ones that you were, yeah, those are there actually generators there? These are generators. This these four are. But I'm areas. Talking, the ones in Pitkin County, but. They didn't go through any kind of Pickett County land use, and they're on private lands, I'm assuming? That's correct. It's a state permitting process. Yep, that's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have to go and look at the county attorney through some kind of local land use. That's that's what we were just commenting on. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I don't have a we need to look into that because we don't want to be missing our code if somebody comes back and says, how come you allowed that to go through without, if, if it needed to go through our, our land use code process? Sure. We, we just want to make sure to, we comply with all the local yeah, regulations. Yeah, that's a key um, thing. So, Greg, sorry, you can. Greg has. Um, that was my question because I was under the impression that it was a state permitting process, it and it's a state thing. So you can hold the CWCB can hold a public hearing in Pitkin County on on cloud seeding. They can call and hold a meeting whenever, wherever. Yep. Duly noticed. The permit is issued by the state, but that doesn't right. mean there might be cases that it has to also go through Pitkin County land use yeah, process. I, I, we don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. And just to go back to the 2017 process, so it was noticed in this county. The meeting was held in um, Eagle County in the town of Eagle. Um, it was also one, I think there was two. One was in Silverthorne, excuse me, and one was in Eagle. Um, and those were noticed in all the surrounding counties. I think there's 12. In 2017? Uh, 2000 falls. Honey, you think if we'd received notice, we would have been participating in this? I don't know. I mean, lots of things happen, and we're the last to know, or we don't know ever. <laughs> There's a lot but going on. But that's of concern to me, that if something like this is – because especially since you said Picking County is unique, and you're right, we are. <laughs> I'm well aware. Yeah. Greg, you can – I think I think um, certainly we need to understand that, um, because I, I hadn't – I was not under the impression that uh, there was a land use code uh, issue there. I think that's – county attorneys can have to – advise us on that um, my understanding of this and having observed it is that is that reading up on this studying it we do have 44 years 43 years of empirical evidence from our neighbors to the west and to the north <clears throat> and and around us that say that this is a program that doesn't have a significant impact these are trace elements of of silver, which is a naturally occurring substance, you can't really tell it from the ambient silver that's in the in the ground. Um, and they've been doing it for 45, 43 or forty four years now in Vale, and they're claiming significant increase in their snowpack and their snowfall. I would it's like measurable. to see the empirical evidence that you look. You'll at. get it. Uh, you can like speak with it. the the managers from Vale or the managers. No, I would from like Grand to Junction. see it in writing empirical evidence that they have sure. these documents. Okay. And have I mean, that. I think that's interesting when the other right. numbers are one can to five percent. Oh, yeah, but finish. I just want to see what you're getting in your empirical evidence. What I'm saying is, I, can, I think that they can demonstrate that we've seen it for 43, 44 years already. And I know we've had evidence in the past that we weren't sure it worked. It's not something you can be exactly sure what you're going to get, when you're going to get. But what I understand is the silver iodide appears in trace quantities. It's not something <coughs> you can find easily in the environment. It's not a toxic substance in any quantity that's going to do environmental harm. Um, and I think that's been demonstrated in many, many other locations. So I think what the question is for me is, uh, this is appealing because it's perhaps it is the only way we could increase the quantity of moisture in our snowpack and in our watershed to some degree, a measurable degree. It's the only way we can increase water in our watershed. And as our weather patterns are changing, we're getting maybe more intense storms, but far fewer apart. Um, if a storm comes through and we can pull five percent more moisture out of this out of the cloud. Maybe that'll help us get through the next six weeks of no snow, of no storms. You know, so our, we have to look at the way our weather's shifting, and we have to look at ways that we can adapt to it. Um, I don't see uh, a significant impact on carbon emissions. The amount a generator burns in the course of an entire season is about the equivalent of a, um, you know, most houses that run on propane use more propane than this one of these things would. It's, it'd probably be the equivalent of one of these burners that the restaurants down on the on the mall use. 
So, so it's not a significant carbon impact. It's not a significant great quantity of silver iodide into the atmosphere, um, but it is a significant impact. Um, the last thing I was going to say is just about the cost. If it's 40 or $50 per acre foot, compare that to the, um, the $35 million Aurora just spent to buy 1,400 acre feet from a, an old gold mine, an effluent from a gold mine somewhere outside of Alma. They just paid $25,000 per acre foot to increase their water. So uh, I, I have a feeling that I can't, you can't say we should do it because all of our neighbors surrounding us are doing it, but it certainly makes me wonder, well, how are we and what are we, do, do we have a responsibility to try to get as much water on the ground and in our watershed as we, as we can if this is uh, low risk, high potential gain? That's, that's where I am with it, and that's where I've seen by, by reading well, this. I stuff. just have to clarify. I have a great deal of experience in toxic waste, heavy metals, um, and cumulative effects. And when you're talking about silver iodine, silver in the, in the ground, it's very different than putting dust particles into the air. There's a whole different health factor, health risk there. So we need to be very careful, and I think this community needs to participate. We have a very healthy, environmentally concerned community, and we owe it to them to ask them how they feel about cloud seeding before we make a decision to move forward. I think that's critical. I think that's where the public meetings come in, right? Well, I want to do it sooner than later. I want to do it before we commit any funding. Steve, please. Um, <laughs> the name Western Weather Consultants is very familiar to me because when my dad was county commissioner, that was the company that Sorry, came to Picking to County that. asking to do cloud seeding. Back as you know, during the 76, 77 years, pre precipitated the desire to look at these kind of things. The fact that they're still operating and doing it says something to me that there's we have a lot of years of evidence from from one one company being active in Western Colorado doing cloud seeding. Um, I too would be concerned about airborne particles of silver iodide would be different than silver particles in, in the ground and lead particles in the ground are, are a different different ball game but um, when you look at the level of the water in the reservoirs around the state Dillon Reservoir is, is relatively pretty full Blue Mesa Reservoir is basically empty right now there are quite a few of the sites in the upstream from the Blue Mesa Reservoir and I, I'd really like to see kind of a study of how effective it's been in different areas. It, it looks like it could have been very effective, the ones that Vail and the other parties have for their area of the mountains has probably been very effective at increasing snowfall. Yeah, and Maybe not so much in the Gunnison area looking at the water level in Blue Mesa Reservoir. Right, and and obviously the there's a lot of empirical threads of evidence, but, you know, cloud seeding only works when there's clouds, obviously. I don't want to be insulting, but <laughs> last year we, and I'll have a slide again, if I can fly through these things, um, that shows we had about half of the normal storms that are seedable, especially as you go south of here. The interesting thing was uh, to the north, in the areas you just mentioned, they had a lot more um, seedable storms. And last year, the storm track, as you recall, was from the north. Um, right. And so they're well situated. Every year is a little different. Um, mm -hmm. the, the additional thing for us in cloud seeding, that has to be in that temperature range. And as you go south, that temperature range and that window closes. And so the Gunnison um, Basin in particular um, was not only a few seedable storms, but there were warm southerly storms when they did come and so they were moist but not seedable so that's part of what you're you're hearing and seeing also in the Gunnison Basin that reservoir uh, feeds directly some of the largest irrigation districts or the largest irrigation district in Western Slope so they used every drop plus um, to get them through a, what was a ridiculously dry and hot summer so it's about 30 percent of the clouds approximately 30% are seedable. 
A seedable right. award. I, seedable. That seedable is a word. I, I didn't say 30%. It's in my information. 30% <laughs> okay. of storms. 30% you know, of storms. On, on, on average, when they're coming with the right conditions. Okay. I mean, I... It was, it, it, we, we, I read my packet. Of nicely done. <laughs> um, and so maybe I should just go quickly through some of yeah, this other ahead. stuff. We've already touched on the list. A lot of this I don't want to be too repetitive, but we're trying to um, not only improve the science, leverage the funding, and increase Colorado's sort of uh, stake in the game, the Colorado River. Um, I told you how I'm sort of uh, de facto the project manager, and uh, these are the subconsultants. And another word on Western Weather, that, that family that you're familiar with, the, the Germstadt family, Larry Germstadt, he's, he's sort of one of the pioneers. He has now handed that off to his sons and his daughter and so they're still active they're based in durango and they're the ones that have been doing the work in bill uh in particular so they do have quite a bit of uh, experience as you point out and the other folks the desert research institute um, are very active and uh, consult with us as well when we have studies um, to to help us understand this um, these other sponsors you you heard about so i don't need to belabor that um, so this is what I was kind of talking about, um, what's happened to date last year. Again, we tried to seed, this is our goal and the amount of money we have. We had about $210,000, you know, $15,000. Um, we were only able to seed about a little more than half of that. And so that was some of the issues. Um, this does not include the, all the stats for, for Vail. This is just those areas outside of... Uh, Vail and, and Winter Park that are doing their early season stuff, which, of course, was affected by warm and dry conditions last fall. So here's when we get to the, the real, um, where the rubber hits the road, you know, does it work? These are the studies that really guide um, some of the key studies I talked about. The Wyoming Weather Modification Pilot Project, um, 5 to 15 percent increased um, snow. Um, th this is all based on statistical, physical, uh, trace chemical, and modeling evidence. Um, that's all ground-based stuff. They, Wyoming, um, now has, uh, is moving into uh, air-deployed cloud seeding, and some of that could, um, right now is proposed to come into Jackson County, just so you know, the North Platte. Those areas, ha the, the, this, the results of the, that particular study said this is an area of high potential, and so uh, Wyoming is moving forward with that for um, not only the Colorado, but again, the, the Platte River system. Um, and Idaho, as I mentioned, they um, are also heavily invested in um, not only ground-based remotes, and the, the remotes I showed you are actually um, developed by them, and we had to talk them into this, but we purchased um, several from them, and we're, we have deployed two of those and are using those this year for the first time. And that showed visual proof of seeding where they could map the plumes and see an increase in um, storm. And you can see some of the other ones, Australia uh, and the Sierra. These are all studies um, and the, the references there too um, that show, again, that similar uh, increase in snow, um, really that 5 to 15 percent envelope. Um, this particular study um, just draw your attention to that, that visual. This is from the Idaho Snowy study. It has a lot of folks, NCAR, Wyoming, um, a lot of the, the experts in the field. Again, like any climate um, issue, you can get a lot of divergent opinions, but this really, I think, represents a convergent opinion that it works. The NCAR study that I talked about is, brings us right to home. And if you zero in here to southern Pitkin County, there's an area outside of the black line that shows this potential, as well as some other areas you'll see up here. And this is another area we want to go to to um, increase our ability to impact um, and take advantage of these high potentials. This is where the seeding potential, that 30%, is probably greater than 30% in these areas in terms of um, hours and storms that can be seeded so you know where it's red 60 percent of the time and that's really where we want to um, take advantage of that um, you know some of the other common misconceptions you know what's that going to do to the downwind leeward side 
this slide, you know, um, sort of defeases that argument. That where, where this moisture comes from, of course, is from the ocean. We're really at the, um, how to say it, um, all of our uh, storms that originate, they come from the ocean. The ocean, El Nino and Enso, those are the, the um, way that the um, currents are set up based on the temperatures, um, really dictate the amount of moisture available and why uh, increasing the efficiency of these clouds by 5 to 15 percent, it does not have an appreciable um, downwind leeward impact. So here's where um, I think uh, we probably want to spend some more time or going forward for your folks and beef this up. I know we're going to be running out of time, but, um, you know, you can choose any study. We understand, but the bulk of the studies that we've looked at uh, show no envir environmentally harmful effects arising from these aerosols, which are basically small dust-sized particles. Um, and this is um, taken from this study. I can get you this study. Um, and we can kind of drill down. And if you do want to have an additional um, public uh, hearing slash educational outreach, you know, we can get the right people. I'm not the right person. I'm not going to try to pretend that I'm an environmental toxicology expert. But this is what um, this is from DRI, Desert Research Institute, talking about, you know, what is the silver iodide and why do we use it? Um, and what, what it's currently being used, you know, today for everyday activities, you know, antiseptic, um, obviously that's something that um, people put in their bodies as or in, in and around their households already. Um, and so the key is, you know, uh, the, the size and the shape really lends itself to um, the, the size and shape of uh, water molecules and ice particles, and that's why we use silver iodide for cloud seeding. The, the crystalline structure is key, and again, whether you want to sort of um, go deeper, but the, there's very little um, environmental impact, and it is an ideal agent. Why is it safe? Because it's not an ion. It is a neutral um, molecule. It does not dissociate. It sticks together and does not uh, interact with um, environmental um, agents around it. And this is from a pg and &E study. Um, and you can see that um, if it was not bound, you would have a positive charge. It would interact. But because it's neutral, it's, it's not an issue. And that's why it's key. So it's not bioavailable. It doesn't bond with other um, uh, molecules or bioaccumulate as some um, uh, materials do in the environment. So not only are we trying to be kind to the environment, we're trying to be kind and careful about things like avalanches and floods. Um, and believe it or not, we are close to the um, uh, suspension criteria. So what this means is in December, if we're at or above 175 percent of normal in basins, we do not seed. We do not want to be in the case, you know, and this is early. And you can see as you go through the year, um, that percent of normal decreases. But it's, it's relatively conservative, I would say. And we also deal with uh, highway safety in places like Berthoud Pass, Red Mountain Pass. Um, uh, highway department folks um, are very concerned about that, as you can imagine. So when the Colorado Avalanche Information Center has warnings out, we do not seed and the, the vendors are very careful about that. Um, so what's next as we come to the end of the presentation? Um, and I've already talked about this, but to reinforce this concept is, you know, we want to address those high seeding potential areas that we're not necessarily taking advantage of. We want to optimize those, remove those that are not in the right places through these studies. We want to increase outreach and education. We, we're here, you loud and clear. We want folks to understand what's going on. I was contacted not only by um, the newspapers, but by Aspen Public Radio. Um, I was on the radio. Of course, you know, you get less than five minutes of fame. But, um, you know, we can do additional outreach and bring the experts in to talk about this. Um, as, we inc as we increase investments, we want to increase um, the technology and increase monitoring and assessment. Um, 
So if we want to talk a little bit more about what we could do here um, to do in, in your packet shows a three year look ahead. It'd be about, we have a goal of about 50,000 a year. We've, we're asking for 25 from the county, 25 from the city, um, and some um, cash and in-kind services from the Ski Co. And we have a letter of support from Ski Co. that maybe um, we can pass out, or maybe it's in your packet. Already. So we just exceeded 50,000. 25 from the city, yes. 25 from the county. <laughs> We're we did speaking. exceed it. That's yeah. right. That's good. So, so um, but we don't have these. We don't have your um, okay. uh, commitment yet. Yeah. So that is the goal. It's good to exceed your goal, of course. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'll just go through. No, that's okay. Quickly. I cut you off. Um, so the the process is to um, seek a permit through an application process. If that goes forward with your support, and we have the meetings. And we have the re favorable record of decision by the regulatory entities, and there's no land use issues uh, being compliant with all um, issues. Theoretically, in the best of all conditions, we would obtain a permit sometime in February. We would be able to take, uh, take advantage of the tail end of the season, operate and maintain for the first year. Um, in conjunction, what, what I'm recommending is it's in conjunction with the existing program. You would have a separate permit. But administratively and fiscally, it would be folded together. The reports would be separate. You would have a separate report for your area versus the CCMRB. But again, administratively, they would uh, work together. And when I looked into the Healthy Rivers goals and objectives, to me anyway, and I think the Healthy Rivers Board thought it was consistent with those, and I don't need to read your um, statement, but, but to me, it, it, it meets these strategic goals. Um, and this is kind of where one of the partners of the city could, could talk about this. I got this from Margaret. Um, and the integrated water supply plan does have cloud seeding in it. And, again, I don't know if you want to say anything, David, about... So we're, we're at our time. Okay. So I know that we've been here. Oh, we've had a long day. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just see if the board has George and then Greg, please. Oh, I got a couple please. questions just from the Healthy Community uh, Committee Fund. They they uh, approved a one year twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollar, and so would you anticipate that if this program continues on, you you end up having to take right off the top a line item for cloud Every seeding? Year. Every year for the next five, if if that's what the commissioners decide to do, they have a, a board project line item that has a hundred thousand in it every year. So this would come out of that line item. It's not a grant. It would be a joint project with the city and in the river district. Right. Yeah. And then I heard you say that the ski company was going to do some, some cash and in kind. What does some cash mean? You need to come up, Rich. Come up to the microphone. And I have so one other question. As long as you're up here, Rich. Along with that, um, the ski company, as we know, uh, experimented with this in the early '70s and again in the in the early '90s. Uh, there was a big span in between when they didn't and since then so why but why yeah rich berkeley aspen skiing company uh to address your uh question we were unable to prove effectiveness at that time with our studies and um if you guys would like i do have the study and i'm happy to circulate it around and greg we were talking earlier and that was hal hartman um on the contrary we have uh vale resorts who is adamant that this is absolutely effective and has been doing it since the same time that we started originally, and several other very large companies are involved. So we, we just don't know. We could not prove it one way or the other. So we couldn't prove it it worked, and we could not prove that it didn't work. And in terms of the, your, the ski company's uh, contributions? Undefined. And so for most of these meetings for the past 14 months, I've maintained that there isn't really a discernible business reason to do this. With 5 to 7% increase in 30% of your storms, you know, a 10-inch storm going to 10 and a half inches is nice, and we certainly support that, but not um, material to our operation. A 300-inch season going to 315 inches, hugely beneficial for the river shed, but not necessarily a change for the, the ski area. That would be a great year either way. Um, but that said, um, they have certainly worn me down, and I have an unspecified <laughs> uh, commitment. We certainly had committed manpower and a site if it was effective, site or sites, and um, 
going through the permitting process through our special use permit with the Forest Service if necessary as well. Um, but we will probably contribute in some way as well if there was if this goes forward either through equipment, purchase of equipment, monitoring, or caching guide. Because you said that, you know, if you go from a 10-inch storm to a 10-and-a-half-inch storm, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But uh, because you are and we are becoming so much more rel uh, 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 re uh, needing snowmaking, and you're looking at and you're expanding snowmaking, um, you've got to have water for that. Absolutely. So along with just in terms of uh, uh, addressing your get our guests in terms of quality of skiing, probably the bigger uh, picture is having adequate water to continue to operate and expand snowmaking. Uh, we certainly, that would be an advantage, um, but on a holistic basis, even bigger than that, we're members of the community. We want to see healthy rivers, and we absolutely support as much water in the river as possible. Um, Greg and I are kayakers, and we, we know water very well. So we, would, we absolutely support anything that increases water in the rivers. Yeah. All right, thanks. Greg? Oh, um, uh, let's see. I think you covered it. So, ski company might put in some cash sometime in the future. You know, it, the ski company. Where my legal team would be very upset if I just gave us a carte blanche. Well, we don't really know how much and everything like that. So, I've been very vague, um, but we're certainly uh, willing to participate if this does move forward. Right. Are and, you guys blasting on Aspen Mountain right now? It's so warm that unfortunately we're already in a, a wet slab protocol. Correct. I'm going. That sounded like dynamite. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to say, would you would the ski company support a multi-year program? I know Healthy Rivers endorsed a one-year program. I think that's just to test the water. I I would love to see a program if we go forward with this go for three to five years. I'd say I'd propose a five-year program, but I'd also like to see the public meetings. Certainly, the public needs to be involved because there's a lot of a lot of myths. There's a lot of uncertainty about this that I think we could dispel. Um, but I also would love to see some citizen science. I think this is an opportunity to learn more. I know the Global Change Institute has metering devices. Perhaps there are other ways with the Science Center and others that we could inform our population about what's happening. That could, this could be a bonus for everyone. Um, I'm intrigued by the possibility that we could have more powder. You know, there are certain storms. Maybe you get a little bump, and you could say, hey, we managed to get an extra half inch of snow spread across our watershed. How many acre feet is that? It's it's a significant amount of water at a, low, at a low cost. I think regarding the environmental concerns, I remember hearing this when it first came in the 70s. I was in high school, and I think George Stranahan brought it forward and explained the trace quantities. And I think it's in parts per trillion, and it's, it's not something you can measure easily um, compared to the amount of effluent that comes out of a, an airplane or a car on the road. Um, it's, it's not even remotely it's it's power many powers of 10 uh, less significant so so I think that certainly we should be concerned and paying attention to all this but we should also take a look at the scale and the and the the, the trace quantities of what's being discussed here um, I, I look forward to seeing more of a public discussion I think we it, we have a responsibility to bring this forward and see what the community thinks uh, and I, um, we, we do have the advantage of on our public health board, we have a very significant member who has dealt a lot with environmental toxicology, human health issues. So I think Dr. Kurt would be a good person. He is, this is right up his field of many, many years of study and surveys and you name it, he's done it. Um, I think that would be critical to sway me. I spent too many years of my life fighting um, heavy metals and um, I don't want it to come back, you know, and, and you're talking trace amounts, but when you have a cumulative effects, it's one thing to infect the envi it affect the environment. It's another thing to impact human health. It's a very different animal, literally. If I so. could add on to that, the, uh, we're probably already the beneficiaries of, of cloud seeding in some ways. I'm, I'm thinking that if there are cloud seeders to the south of us and to the west of us and to the All north around of us, us, they're virtually everywhere but here. It's not as if our snow is much different than what's occurring elsewhere around us. So I think that um, if there was evidence that it was a problem, people would have discovered it now because they haven't. Have they studied human health effects from it? We don't know that. 
I, I believe they have, but we can. That's something we can find out in our future presentations. Well, and and what you just said though is really well taken because if it's all around us, why do we need it? <laughs> well, it's not really benefiting us. That's the problem. It's not landing in our watershed. It's then not we designed. shouldn't be worried about the effects of it all around us if it's not landing in our watershed. So it's just something we need to consider while investing money. And um, I think the permitting process knowing how government permitting processes can be and the public process, we need to know exactly where these generators would be located to know if it's going to impact our land use code. So I think we have a lot more discussion. I think this was a great, this was really valuable information. Um, it just creates a lot of questions that I think we need to have answered. Steve, please. So uh, I remember that there was a discussion about the texture of the snow created by cloud seeding during the discussions back in earlier <laughs> decades. Uh, it's probably no different than the, what man-made snow would be from the snowmaking efforts. It's probably a nicer kind of a texture to the snow that falls or something. But I think that should be taken into consideration. If um, Yeah, I had not I heard that for cloud seeding, but it's certainly man-made versus natural is very different. No, yeah, it's going to say that. And we believe, we, add, we have an additive snow max that we think changes the consistency of the snow as well. A nucleator yeah. just like silver and iodide. I would like to have as, I mean, I wouldn't mind personally right at this time knowing what we know to do a three to five year kind of a, a test, but I would want to have some, some things that are looked at. One would be testing the water in the summer to see if there's any traces of silver iodide or anything in, in the water during the summer. Uh, to see if there's any health effects, and I think we should consult with Dr. Tom Kurt about mm -hmm. from our Board of Health, who's a expert on uh, toxicology kind of sure. things. I think he probably knows knows a lot about He's this. Brilliant. So maybe our Board of Health should weigh in on the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think doing more research and having this be part of a research project would be important not just to try to increase water right now but also to learn more about the process and the effects of it and potential benefits and downfalls from it yeah i, I would just respond uh, very briefly that the river district does cooperate with usgs we have a water quality quantity um, monitoring network that's relatively robust we would we could and i think would agree to uh, bump that up in terms of um, samples should you want to um, embark in that sort of thing we already have them up and down the valley taking samples so it wouldn't be that difficult to add and in fact uh, at least at the mouth of the river we're already doing metals uh, and trace elements i know that's a long way from here um, but we could come up country here and and um, boost our monitoring for aquatic um, quality are you specifically looking at silver iodide in that test? Metals. Metals. So, yeah, we need to be looking at what we're putting into the air. You yeah. know, it's another thing. You know, how much can you mess with Mother Nature before she comes back and bites you in the butt? So I think we need to be very careful. I think we need to be concerned, and we are concerned in Pickett County, about the quality and quantity of water in our rivers. Um, my son makes his living off the water, off the rivers, so it's dear, near and dear to my heart. But... I also want my grandchildren to be safe living here. I think I think a, a, a great way to continue this conversation would be to do a comparison of of the the quantities of effluent from various sources, whether it's houses, propane, buses, cars, aircraft, and compare it to what the what we're actually talking about doing here, because I think there's a, a Certainly, as I said before, it's, it's a matter of powers of many, many powers of 10. Um, yeah, I understand that position, Greg, but to me that has nothing to do with what we're going to be putting into the air. We already know those things are bad in there, in our water, they're in our air, they're in our soil. Um, we wish we could stop all of those things. This is something we might not necessarily have to do. George, please. So, um, you know, I, I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that um, Cloud seeding is, is fairly prevalent throughout the West. Um, we have some questions and concerns. Uh, we would like to have the public uh, be able to be informed and weigh in uh, before, uh, before at least I'm willing to 
uh, cut a check to participate. Um, so I think this would be a, a good learning uh, opportunity uh, for us and for the public and um, looking at the best available science to answer some of these questions and concerns and then make a decision uh, but I'm not ready uh, today to do that I agree I agree with you George um, I think uh, again I said this is valuable discussion that we've had and thank you and you, you did a great job um, and um, in our unique county but um, I do think that there's more here. questions <laughs> and we also need to look at funding partners you know if it's 50,000 should the city and county be splitting it half or are there other partners we might be able to bring in and and, and on that I'll respond briefly that um, I have reached out to to others uh, there's still others to reach out to but Twin Lakes um, um, Company, I forget the full name. Um, Canal which Canal is from Company. Reservoir, whatever Canal Company. Thank you. We, we deal with them a lot. You deal with them a lot. They would be willing to financially participate. I think it's uh, politically um, tricky, and I would obviously seek your um, direction before we go too much further. Um, but I think you know there's a partnership there. Should you like to pursue that, um, I also like the idea of, of working with um, not only the Board of Health but maybe the Global change folks and maybe do a, a um, presentation and again bring some of the experts from DRI or from you know wherever you think um, you know I, I don't want to be seen as biasing it if there's folks you want to bring in and we can help do that uh, either in advance of uh, any action um, and then you know move forward together um, I, I think um, the potential for a partnership is is good but we we at the River District, I don't want to speak for the board, but, um, you know, would not want to move forward without local support. Um, so it's not, um, it, as I said, it's sort of a solicited partnership concept that we'd like to grow and um, improve upon what we're doing and make sure folks are, are on board, not be seen Thanks. as... Yeah, and I would, uh, thank you for that synopsis, too. I, I would also include, uh, whether you ha I don't know if you've done this, if, if, if uh, City of Aspen has heard this presentation or Town of Snowmass Village has heard it in terms of the two municipalities, um, they obviously should be involved. Yep. David's here. I'd love to hear if he could share with us. David, has, why don't you come forward, and then we're going to have to... We're just, I don't think City Council has been part of this direct conversation but correct me if i'm wrong please uh, so i'm dave hornbacher director of utilities for the city of aspen and no we've not had a direct conversation with city council what you're suggesting here as far as more public input involvement and partnerships i think is is a, a great way to go because i think we've seen both the county and the city you know, actually participate in, in new or inventive or other ways to really help our environment here. Um, as I was thinking about it coming up to this meeting, you know, I look back on just this year that we've had where our community and our valley and our streams and our forests were so affected by, you know, the severe drought that we had here. And in looking at this, you know, we also saw the stage one and two you know, for fire, you know, we saw a stage two for water and, um, you know, we saw that horrible fire in Elgebel. And, you know, when I reflect upon those things, it's, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us to explore, you know, the potential of some of these different ways that might lessen those types of effects in the future. But you're talking about a very pragmatic, involved way to go. I think that's wonderful. And I certainly agree with you, George, that it'd be, um, be very helpful to have a similar presentation as we move forward with city council and certainly with other uh, entities in this valley. So um, uh, you'll certainly see me there and certainly see that type of support to get the input. Thank you. Thank so you thank you for your, you know, your consideration. Obviously, your great feedback here. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Do we have any other questions here from the board? Again, our thanks. Um, Lisa, thanks for bringing it forward to us. Okay, we're going to call it. Any other discussion by the board? John? We're good. Grassroots, thank you. We're out. All right. Great. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry.